Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back for second, the second day of the Friendship and Politics Conference here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Welcome back. Uh, we had a really fantastic first day. I know that you can't hear me? Is this on? Yeah. Uh, there, by the way, that gives me a good, uh, a good segue. Um, there are hearing aids uh, available that have the mic'd version coming right into your ear out at the front desk outside. And if you uh, find it hard to hear, um, we do have those free of charge. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, uh, one is that if you have a chance over at the Student Center, uh, the Campus Center, there's a student art exhibit uh, on friendship uh, and politics that is hanging in the Student Center, the Campus Center, and uh, you're welcome to visit that. Related to that, at 4.30 uh, today, after the conclusion of the conference, we have a wine and cheese reception at the Hessel Museum, um, which is a bit of a walk, about 10 minutes across campus. It's a beautiful walk on a beautiful day. And in addition to being able to see some of the exhibit on, um, on Native American art that's going on, we have, uh, we're gonna have a featured exhibit there where we've collected or brought in some of Nick Dunn has come has brought in some of the um, some of the really interesting uh, books from Hannah Arendt's personal library, which is here at Bard College, with some of her notations, uh, some of it around friendship and other related themes. And we'll be doing a presentation on her library and her collection at the museum at five o'clock. And there's a shuttle going from here at four thirty or four fifteen, five minutes before that you can take if you don't want to take the walk across campus. So um, those are really exciting uh, events I encourage you to do. Also, remember there is an auction for the uh, really wonderful uh, print by Julia Chesko uh, with a quote from Hannah Arendt on it. And now I'd like to get us going by introducing um, a Hannah, uh, one of our Hannah Arendt fellows, a student at Bar, Jonathan Asiedu, um, who is a senior written arts major and he's gonna read a poem that he wrote himself on friendship. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan. Um, I'm gonna read a poem called Two Quarters. <clears throat> Clawing through mommy's bags in her closet locked with words saying don't touch Inside I can feel soiled napkins, rough edges of rings and earrings. I smell the mint from the gum wrappers sprinkled in the bags. I'm looking for 25 cents, a dime, some nickels, as long as Daniel brings a quarter, we could share a little Debbie's brownie waiting for the 17 bus to our homes. Friendship and uncapped hunger drizzled with the notion of not to trust no one, means me and David sharing this sweet brown cake under this bus stop is no different than a hyena and a lion feasting on the same carcass. Because I'm not supposed to be friends with John. In fact, Elijah and I both know this, so we call ourselves brothers. Brothers not like Cain and Abel, more like Cain and Cain. Hamilton and Burr, more like Hamilton and Hamilton. Demetrius, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to kill you eventually, blindly, because how can we be friends when we're like blind rats running in the darkness of pipelines leading nowhere? Abraham, do you know a rat eventually will eat one another if it can't find food? You're probably the only friend I have on this bloody generational war field. So please, on this bench, eating this dumb, delicious brownie, whether it be 50 cents, a dollar, whatever, just know, Ebenezer, I may not always be there, and we might stop talking forever, but now, and just for now, let's enjoy this 50 cent carcass, a truce, a white flag we wave together in our hearts, watching the pigeons across the street pecking 
at Breadcrumbs. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so now it's uh, my pleasure and honor to introduce the president of Bard College, Leon Botstein. Um, he needs no introduction, I think, in this room. But uh, uh, in addition to being the, the conductor of the uh, orchestra, um, orchestra now, um, and a professor at Bard who teaches every semester, um, he's, uh, he's someone who runs this place with humanity and heart. Uh, he's a friend to me. He once said that he's friends with no one who works for him to me uh, a long time ago. Um, but he's someone who many of us like to consider uh, our friend and advisor and certainly someone I feel very proud to work for um, who has always been supportive of the center and uh, always had incredibly thoughtful and prov profound remarks to, to open our conferences. Um, so it's a thrill for me and a real pleasure and honor to have Leon here. So please welcome Leon Botstein. First, I want to welcome all of you here. I would have, um, I'm Grateful to the Dean of the College, Deirdre Dalbert, who welcomed you yesterday. But the irony is that um, uh, I was due to return from uh, Palestine last night. Uh, this week was to be the commencement of our uh, dual degree programs in on the West Bank. Uh, we train teachers for the Palestinian Authority, and we have an honors college, uh, liberal arts honors college, the only one of, out of 5,000 universities and colleges in the United States, we're the only one to have an official dual degree program with a Palestinian university. Um, but as you can obviously understand, uh, everything was canceled and uh, we had many colleagues there whom we brought back to the States um, after this weekend, past weekend. Um, so I got scheduled for this morning to give a second welcome. It's like those Jewish holidays that have two days for no real theological reason, just the fear of missing the right day if you're not in Jerusalem. So I, um, so there's a second welcome. Um, and uh, first I want to thank Roger, where is he? Right. And all the staff of the Hannah Arendt Center and all my faculty and staff colleagues here at the college that make this conference possible. So a round of applause to them. And to all the speakers, some of whom traveled quite some distance, and um, most of all uh, to the audience. Uh, in my line of work, which is classical music, uh, we get used to diminishing audiences and their aging. Uh, I hope that doesn't actually happen in the conduct of philosophy and political thought, but it's not the size of the audience, but the quality that counts. I'm very pleased to see that there are students here, both secondary school and college students. So um, I want everyone to feel entirely welcome. Um, uh, so this is the 15th conference, if I'm right, Roger, and uh, that is itself a fantastic uh, accomplishment. Um, I'm here, oddly enough, um, in part because um, uh, I owe Hannah Arendt the job I have, and uh, I met her exactly um, 60 years ago, in the fall of 1963. So. Um, uh, and uh, she had a very strong influence on me as a teacher, and uh, so uh, and uh, she did maneuver the politics of choosing a president in such a way that um, no one knew that she was maneuvering, uh, which was very good for me. Um, so uh, I am not an Arendt scholar, and I'm not a philosopher, so I'll be appropriately brief. Um, 
Ever since Roger set this subject up, I have been uh, mulling over the question of the relationship of friendship and politics, particularly in relationship to Hannah Arendt's life and work. Um, and I'm not quite sure about that relationship. I rather uh, think that friendship, as she understood it, as I understand it, that she understood it, um, is in conflict with politics, is actually um, uh, at odds with politics. And um, that uh, she treasured it, but the reasons she treasured it, to me at least, are, are unusual, instructive but unusual. Um, so I apologize if I've contradicted anybody or um, I, I really rather not, but, um, and I'm happy to be wrong. Uh, so I'm gonna start with just two very brief texts from her correspondence with Kurt Blumenfeld, who was almost 20 years her senior, 18 years her senior, and was the leading uh, German Zionist leader before 1933 and also during the 30s and 40s finally ended up in Israel. Um, and they were very close friends, very close friends. And the correspondence between them is a significant and unusual document all its own. Um, he has a short appearance in history because it was he and Albert Einstein that went to visit the foreign minister of Germany, Walter Rathenau, who was a Jew, um, to convince him to resign, to get out of public office in order not to put the Jews of Germany in greater danger. He refused after a long night conversation and um, he was assassinated shortly thereafter. Um, that's a, uh, itself a fascinating episode. Um, but in um, the correspondence between Hannah Arendt and Kurt Blumenfeld begins at the end of the war in the summer of 1945. And um, uh, in a very interesting letter, the third letter they exchange, uh, Hannah Arendt writes, um, I share, I understand your fear of seeing old friends again. So these are two individuals who are very close, uh, hadn't seen each other from 1933, essentially, the early 30s, mid-30s, till 45, more than 10 years. And um, then she goes on um, to say in a later letter that the reason that friends um, are more important to Court and to herself is because they have no furniture, they have no place, they belong nowhere. They are wanderers without a fixed presence in the world. And therefore, they, um, they depend excessively on friendship. That's the only way they can survive. There is no physical, she uses the German word, which is, means um, uh, furniture, literally. And um, later, you know, um, some years later in the 50s, she writes him and says, you know, um, I don't care what people whom I don't know think, and most people are foreign to me, that I only really trust people, and I can only believe in the reality of their character after 10 years of knowing them. That no one can be considered a friend who is fewer than 10 years in duration. And as she sort of writes about it, she has a sense that for a displaced person, a person without a country, a person without a kind of nativist connection to a community, friendship, individual friendship, is just a vital way of staying alive. And um, what's interesting is that uh, the test of friendship, what really friendship is about, um, has to do with this fear of no communication um, for such a long time. We all have it. Somebody we knew a long time ago, and then we meet them again, and we're uncertain what we'll find. We would like to just to see what we remember. 
That's how all those stories about um, couples getting together that dated in high school, married, it's a kind of fictional, uh, it's always funny, it's uh, people who live in a kind of a delusion uh, of, of reality. Um, but um, one of the friends that is l not often discussed that Hannah Arendt had before she emigrated to France was the Germanist Benno von Wiese. Now, he was a very close friend of, of Hannah's, and they were in a kind of literary intellectual circle, and he turned on a dime and became a Nazi. Absolutely enthusiastic party member for no reason, no compulsion, no self-advantage, ideologically so. And then he attempted to make contact with her later. And um, her reaction to that, of course, was not entirely friendly, but less critical than one would have thought. She didn't sustain any relationship with him. And the gap, the politics that intervened between 33 and 45, that separate, let's say, Benno von Wiese and Hannah Arendt, uh, applies also famously to Heidegger. The difference in the Heidegger case, obviously, is a sexuality, is eros which is not about friendship, that's something different. She writes Jaspers very famously in the 50s, and she says, you know, the trouble with Heidegger is he has no character. He has absolutely no character. And what she means by that is that he has no conscience, no, no moral thinking, but he's full of passion and depth. Fascinating distinction she makes between the erotic connection but the question of friendship and how it survives politics um, was explored by one of our colleagues who is, I'm pleased to say, still alive, David Kettler, in a study of first letters. So this is a study of emigres um, who fled Germany, some of them, most of them Jewish, but not all, and their close friends who remained in Germany. And so, Contact ended in 1933, and in 1945, both sides of these friendships began to think, what do I do now, right? How do I start up? How do, do you pick up the same thread? How do you deal with this? And, um, you know, her mentor, uh, Karl Jaspers, famously in 1946, wrote a book, a little book called The Question of German Guilt, in which he describes various kinds of guilt, culpable legal guilt, moral guilt, and then he plays with the idea of metaphysical guilt. And he's trying to deal with the people who are onlookers, people who we didn't join the Nazi party, they didn't become ideologues, but you know they took over jobs that were left by Jews, they sort of stood by, they benefited, uh, they, they kept their distance. Um, and um, the question is, uh, and they have various excuses for why they did. No, and he tries to demolish these excuses. His, his idea is some kind of inner um, purification, uh, that the last form of guilt is moral guilt, and then there's something called metaphysical guilt, in which people sort of come to terms accurately with their own behavior and their culpability, and they have no excuses. They don't actually um, apologize, they don't try to wiggle out the way Benno von Wiese tried to, and Heidegger. And uh, they actually try to confront um, their past, a very, obviously very difficult thing to do. And is it possible after the war for Germans in these various categories to come to terms so that the kind of collective guilt argument disappears as individuals find a way to uh, acknowledge their relationship to the political world um, in a period where they might and should have acted otherwise. Um, he's very acute about how many opportunities there were to stop um, the uh, horror of the Nazi regime. And um, so these first letters, this attempt to reconnect with people where politics has intervened, uh, there are three cases in the music side that I know well. One is Bruno Walter, the conductor, where Hans Fissner, who was an, a hugely enthusiastic Nazi and a composer, wrote Walter and said, hi, hi, you know, how are you? And um, no mention in the letter 
of anything that happened, as if nothing had happened. And his motivation was the food shortage in Germany, which they suffered in 45, right? And Walter thought about how is he going to respond. Um, the uh, trio of German Protestant musicians, the Bushes, Adolf, Hermann, and Fritz Busch, who emigrated voluntarily not to cooperate with the regime, the same thing. Um, people writing of them and, um, uh, and trying to make friends. And uh, until the very end of his life, Fritz Busch just didn't, didn't return to Germany. Erich Kleiber, uh, an Austrian, uh, came earlier, had a better reconciliation. But his relationship with his close friends <clears throat> from 1933, particularly in the Viennese music establishment, was um, not reparable. And uh, the, um, I think for her, what friendship meant is um, the sort of um, capacity to really develop an absolute unbreakable uh, solidarity with the human being as such. In other words, someone where it wasn't obligation, it wasn't marriage, it wasn't family, but it was a connection to a human being that was absolute, and therefore friendship becomes the basis of generalizing a relationship to people you don't know that respects their humanity without bounds. And um, so um, treating um, human beings with the sanctity of their existence, you don't have to love them, well, that's not the point. And you don't have to like them out of some kind of moral duty, but you recognize in some way the fundamental essence of the um, solidarity between yourself and every other living human being, no matter how different they may seem. Um, but it seems to me that friendship in her life flourished in the absence of real political participation and political membership. It was a human um, uh, contraption that was developed that allowed people to survive and its rarity uh, was extraordinary, and her suspicion of people, she had many acquaintances, but the trust that ultimately is the basis of friendship and this solidarity. Um, and I think there were reconciliations after this 14, 15 year period, uh, no, 13 year period. And, uh, but fewer than one would have imagined. And um, in our contemporary American politics, the polarization we talk about, right, uh, is not, it doesn't violate friendship because we were never friends with them. Uh, they with us. That doesn't diminish the need to find a way to deal with it. But um, the inability to converse uh, is, um, is ex exceptional. And as we face the carnage in the Middle East, uh, one thinks how, and Hannah Arendt in her entire Zionist career uh, was obsessed with this question of how uh, the Jewish settlement uh, and finally uh, the incipient um, uh, state of Israel uh, in 48, how it was going to actually resolve in a way different from what we're seeing today, um, a, um, a bridge, political bridge, or some kind of reconciliation. How do we sit down and uh, create friendships across really fundamental political divides? Um, and uh, the dishonesty in the way Americans talk about friendship, all people, you're my friend, most of when we say that, it's meaningless. I was always shocked when Leonard Bernstein was at uh, his height of popularity in Vienna, his um, kissing and hugging Karl Böhm, an absolutely vicious ideological Nazi, um, and uh, as if nothing had ever happened. 
And uh, it wasn't that he was ignorant of that, but that wasn't friendship. That was careerism. And that's forgivable, totally. <laughs> Don't call it something that it isn't. So it's a complex subject, and she, I think, um, I saw there's a paper that was given on her relation to Ellison, who taught at Bard as well, and that's partly how they knew each other, um, <clears throat> that uh, there, are, um, there are levels of friendship she maintained uh, and developed late in life. Uh, but um, whether the, um, there is a connection between real friendship and politics, I'm not sure. I'm told that Scalia and Justice Ginsburg were friends. Uh, I never thought much of Justice Scalia, but my impression of Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been diminished by that. Uh, th they liked music, that's no excuse. Uh, and so I think that, um, that it's a complex issue, but one thing I do did learn uh, from her is that friendship um, without Eros, but friendship is fundamentally the highest achievement of what we as humans can do. And that's reflected by Jasper's notion of absolute solidarity with the human. So there's no more significant subject that bridges uh, the public and private sphere. So now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Wyatt Mason, and uh, we will proceed. Thank you very much. thank Leon again, and it's just such a pleasure. <laughs> a pleasure to teach in a place where you feel like um, the life of the mind rises to the top, and uh, it really is uh, joy and rare, um, so thank you. And, and the question of, and I think what Leon said about the solidarity, the, the, the ironclad solidarity of friendship, which you can't have too often, it's, it's rare, and yet it's there is also the kind of political solidarity that Arendt was interested in, and, and that's the, 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 the tie-in of the conference, and I think you brought that out beautifully. Um, let me just uh, now move on and introduce our next uh, speakers. Uh, for the, next, uh, the next panel this morning is called Talking to Strangers. And it features Wyatt Mason and Daniel Mason, and no, they are not related. Uh, they are strangers, but not total strangers. They know each other. Uh, the session will unfold in three parts. There's a bit of drama here. Uh, Wyatt will speak first for about 25 minutes, Daniel second for about 25 minutes, and the two will then have a conversation afterwards with Q&A to follow. Wyatt has been a senior fellow at the Arendt Center since 2010. He's a writer in residence at Bard and is also a journalist chiefly for the New York Times Magazine where he's a contributing writer. He's also one of my dear friends and I'm thrilled that he's been part of the Hannah Arendt Center in its conception and thought since its beginning in 2006. And I thank him for that. Daniel Mason is a best-selling novelist whose work has been published in 28 languages, and in 2021 was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He is also a psychiatrist, who for many years has worked on the inpatient psychiatric unit of Stanford Hospital in Palo Alto. His latest novel, just published by Random House, is Northwoods. I'm thrilled to welcome, and please join me in welcoming, Wyatt and Daniel. Good morning, everyone.
Uh, so I want to thank Leon um, for his devotion to and genius for making Bard the exceptional place to teach and to learn that it has become uh, here and around the world. And I also want to thank Roger for his uh, intellectual goodwill, which he's exhibited during the quarter century that he and I have been friends. Uh, Roger is the most agreeable person with whom I have ever disagreed. Uh, we often disagree, but we often agree. Uh, the depth and seriousness of his contribution to the intellectual life of the college is only matched by the generosity and sincerity of his contributions to the emotional lives of his friends. Yesterday, in welcoming us to the conference, the dean of the college, Deirdre Dalbert, used the word fellowship to describe the community fostered by the center. It's a wonderful word. It enters English in uh, 1225, coming from Middle Scandinavian, nice cross-pollination. And at that time, it acquires in English its first definition, companionship, company, friendly association. It has retained that, uh, that fundamental meaning during the uh, 800 years uh, of its life so far. Uh, mark your calendars, 2025. We'll celebrate the, uh, celebrate the, the 800th anniversary of fellowship. Um, a few years later, 160 years later, it took on its second, second um, definition, primary definition. Uh, initially, it was secular, um, but in 1384, Christian fellowship uh, arose. And interestingly enough, that date, 1384, is at the precise moment when the Wycliffe Bible comes into English, which is the first translation of the entire Bible um, from uh, the Vulgate, the Latin, into English. So Christian fellowship arrives then with uh, the Bible in English. So it's no accident. Um, we know this, a book can provide occasion for fellowship. And attendees who've happened to participate in the RN Center's virtual reading group know that there's a, a way that we gather around a book. Just as people of particular faith everywhere are united by texts that direct and focus their worship. Roger spoke in his introductory remarks yesterday about Arendt's gifts for friendship and told several stories about her ability to brook criticism with her friends and that intellectual life for her was one in which disagreement or criticism was not a priori, a contamination of friendship's pure waters. So I'm going to begin uh, my presentation today with a world that is populated by two individuals, albeit in different sort of relationship. I met the bishop on the road, and much said he and I, those breasts are flat and fallen now, those veins must soon run dry, live in a heavenly mansion, not in some foul sty. Fair and foul are near of kin, fair needs foul, I cried. My friends are gone, no there's a truth, nor grave, nor bed denied, learned in bodily lowliness and the heart's pride. A woman can be proud and stiff when on love intent, but love has pitched its mansion in the place of excrement, for nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. Many of us will recognize this poem that I've recited, which I've had in my head in various forms, which is to say with various mistakes uh, for about 30 years. It is uh, Crazy Jane Talks with the Bishop, which is by William Butler Yeats. Irish poet. It was published in 1932 initially in a collection called um, Words uh, for Music, perhaps, uh, one of 25 poems in that little collection. There's seven, eight Crazy Jane poems, crazy so-called, crazy is an ironic designa designation. As we learn through these poems, Jane is the very furthest thing, thing from crazy. She is the voice of sanity in an insane world. It's a very complicated poem, and if I were teaching it, note the conditional mood, if I were teaching it, which I'm not going to do, um, I would proceed by certain ways. I would notice, say, for you, our benefit, particularly mine, to start, that it is a poem in three stanzas of six lines each, totaling 13, 16, 18, 18 different lines. Um, I would point out that this poem has an interesting rhyme scheme, which is non-standard, and has at the second, fourth, and sixth lines uh, rhymes. Um, the rhymes are different in each stanza, although the first stanza and the second stanza sound as though they might be the same, they are not. Uh, second, fourth, sixth lines, I, dry, sty, cried, denied, pride, and then intent, excrement, and rent. What this rhyme scheme does, note that the first word in the poem is I, 
Um, that I is carried through the I, the I, the dry, the sty, the cry, the denied, the pride, I moving through the poem as a sound. Those sounds in the second, fourth, and sixth sil uh, lines at the end of the lines, they produce a set of expectations in the listener or reader that we are going to be delivered to the final sound of the stanza in each case, delivering us, even though the sounds are different, in the end to that final syllable, rent. Past tense of the verb, to rend. Crazy Jane, so-called, is speaking truth to power here. The bishop is critical of her in the first uh, stanza, in which he is telling her to live in a heavenly mansion, not a foul sty. That foul sty is, best as I can tell, after 30 years of indecision, the human body. Um, it is said that uh, by Shane McRae, a contemporary American poet, that a poem is always smarter than the writer and the reader. And ideally, a good poem, a very good poem, a great poem is one which we don't solve. And so I'm not trying to solve it. However, Jane responds to the bishop's accusation that she lives in filth because she has a body that seeks pleasure is to offer three appeals, the Aristotelian three appeals of um, the ethical appeal, the rational appeal, and the emotional appeal. She's wide open as we should be in life, as we can be, as it's very hard to be, to be vulnerable, but she tries to communicate with him. The canny uh, conference goer will notice that in the third line we have the word friends. My friends are gone, but that's a truth, nor grave, nor bed denied. In the final stanza we have, for nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. Jane is making the suggestion that the individual, if they are to be free, unique um, in that soul, um, can't be whole unless there is a disastrous thing that happens to us in life, which is somehow going to rend us apart. Um, one could play the game of looking for friends in literature. There is uh, a little book called Moby Dick, which does not start Call Me Ishmael, but rather starts with 14 pages in the first edition of extracts that Melville is putting before us from other works of literature where the word whale is mentioned. Um, very like a whale, if we've read Hamlet, is in one of them. But we can't do that here. There's other business that I must conduct. So. Even so, I feel it incumbent upon me um, to read from one thing that I found, which uh, I read for the conference, which I had not read, and is Cicero on friendship. Um, and so just listen to it, won't you? The offices of friendship are so numerous and of such different kinds that many little disgusts may arise in the exercise of them which a person of true good sense will either overlook or endure. That is to say, we who have friends know that they annoy us at times, but we move past it if we are interested in maintaining friendships. But there is one particular duty which may frequently occur and which he will at all hazards of offense discharge as it is never to be superseded consistently with the truth and fidelity he owes to the connection. I mean the duty of admonishing and even reproving his friend, an office which whenever it is affectionately exercised should be kindly received. When truth proves the bane of friendship, we may have reason indeed to be sorry for the unnatural consequence. But we should have cause to be more sorry if we suffered a friend by culpable indulgence to expose his character to just reproach. Shall we live with a friend upon some cautious terms? We must submit to live with a tyrant. Desperate indeed must be that man's moral disorders who shuts his ears to the voice of truth when delivered by a sincere and affectionate monitor. Upon these delicate occasions, we should be particularly careful to deliver our advice or reproof without the least appearance of acrimony or insult. As nothing, therefore, is more suitable to the genius and spirit of true friendship, than to give and receive advice. To give it, I mean, with freedom, but without rudeness, and to receive it not only without reluctance, but with patience. So nothing is more injurious to the connection than flattery, 
compliment or adulation. I multiply these equivalent terms, these synonymous ideas, in order to mark with stronger emphasis the detestable and dangerous character of those pretended friends who, strangers to the dictates of truth, consistently hold the language which they are sure will be most acceptable. Friendship is not friendship in which we exercise such care that we cannot access the truth of our noticing of our friend. We now depart from the province of my so-called uh, intellectual bona fides, my use of texts and all of that, and we uh, lower ourselves into the basin of my lived life. I hadn't thought about the boy I will call K in so many years until before I was preparing this talk, I was purging my bookcases in my office, procrastinatively, and doing the flip-flip uh, to make sure there was nothing in the book before I gave it away. I came upon this now redacted photo. The boy on the right is K. The boy I once was is on the left. I can't reverse engineer why, but I had very few friends growing up. I went to school and camps and so forth. I, wasn't, I was with children, but I didn't spend a tremendous amount of time with particular children. In retros retrospect, I am sure that in part, it has something to do with the fact that I found children very strange. This is not to say that I was correct or incorrect about the strangeness, only that I found them so. I, however, recall playdates with K. I rec recall being brought uh, to their house, which was on the east side. I lived on the west, interesting border between the two. And having had the idea that I would hide in a large box and that my parents would carry the box in and like, very like, Marilyn Monroe popping out of a cake, I would emerge, mixing my metaphor like Venus emerging from the sea on her shell. How surprised they would be. How disappointed I was to learn that no one was surprised at all. They knew I was in the box. I was so focused on the idea of the gift, that is to say, the gift of me, that it hadn't occurred to me that my stratagem would be transparent. We were friends for several years until fifth grade. And then his parents, um, decided to move uh, K to a different school, in large measure because K's brother, who I will call X, um, was not happy at the school at which he, had, uh, we, uh, the school we attended, and so moved uh, K and X to the other school. In the fall of their first year in sixth grade, I called K, or I called the home, and asked to speak with K to find out how things were going. I spoke to K's mother. K's mother was, a psychologist. Kay's father was a psychoanalyst. Kay's mother said, it's nice to hear your voice, Wyatt, but I'm afraid you can't talk to Kay. And I said, why? And she said, I and Kay's father feel that it would be better for their adjustment to the new school if they make new friends. Yin and yang, softness and hardness. The gift I wished to give was returned. The softness which I wished to share hardened. A gulf in time yawns wide. In that interim, and I don't want to make this too reductive, but uh, definitely the uh, attempt at making friends was fraught for me. I was not good at it. Um, the vulnerability that I had exhibited early um, I couldn't not exhibit, it seemed, and it didn't serve me, it seemed, in social life. And I clothed myself, um, and Niobe Way talked a little bit about the way, brilliantly about the way, informatively about the way, that young children, young boys, will offer tenderness and openness, and then at a certain point clo close down out of the accusation that their tenderness might be um, unmanly. I clothed myself during the course of my young adulthood by getting jacked. I got extremely strong. 
as my friend, um, as my friend whose son is now a, a uh, almost professional soccer player says, um, swole is the goal. Um, it's, it's easy to make fun of now, but I do recognize in retrospect that I was attempting to clothe myself in a protective device that would make me seem more manly and therefore stronger and therefore less vulnerable, even though it's quite certain that were I brought to the moment where I would have had to use that muscle to protect myself, I would have been crushed by almost anyone because I had no skills that would exhibit my strength. I had a fellowship in 2003 at the Center for Scholars and Writers, the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library. And this was an early moment in my life where my intellectual life was being rewarded. On the second day, um, I was told that on the first day, um, a Princeton art historian who also had a fellowship had noticed me and said she was afraid of me. She said, quote, I thought you were a convict. The horrifying prejudices and assumptions about this, obvious as they are, aside, I will say that I was hurt by that because it hadn't occurred to me that I wasn't still inside the sweet little boy with gorgeous hair on the left here. Rather, I had somehow forgotten the clothes I was wearing that I had made myself. A gulf in time yawns wide again. Friendship became something after that that I uh, cultivated, that I wished to understand. However, it was at odds with my profession at the time, was, which was the writing of literary criticism, which I still do. Um, I found it involving and very beautiful to have the chance to exchange um, an understanding of the world from one person into my understanding of the world to investigate that in a text which would have a certain degree of complexity that was smarter than the writer and absolutely smarter than the reader. That struggle, however, when I was starting out, and it was a financial struggle in part, uh, was very solitary. I would work for months on these little pieces because I needed to complete them. I needed to understand these texts, but I also needed to get paid so that I could pay the rent. And it was an isolating experience. I learned through time that through the literary criticism I was writing, there were some people who thought that they could profit by my industry by offering me the opportunity to do other kinds of writing work. So it came to be that it was offered to me that I could write something called a profile. And I began writing for the New York Times Magazine in 2006 and have done so for nearly the last 20 years with the same editor there. And for them I have written profiles. When I was asked to write a profile, I did not know what that would entail, and I was given some examples, and a person occurred to me as somebody I would like to profile, and I did that. And I began at that time talking to strangers. The process of going to speak to somebody whom one does not know, and about whom one is uh, ch charged to write, and a long form, 5,000 words, a half hour essay, say, initially entailed a process of terror in which I had no idea how I was going to fairly represent this individual whom I did not know but whose work I did. I write about, started writing about poets, went on to write about novelists, then wrote about people who make TV, and then wrote about people who make paintings, and then wrote about people who act, and the main thing still that I write about are people that write. When I wrote about the first person I wrote about, I spoke to that person over the course of four months, probably 16 times, recorded 30 or 40 hours of our conversations, and also did something, a word I didn't know at the time, which is called secondaries, where you speak to the person's friends. And the friends will tell you things, and I spoke to 14 people in that first case and gathered another 27 hours of tape a preposterous amount, nearly 70 hours of conversations. Friends will tell you things they shouldn't tell you about their friends, it turns out. It's like, oh, well, you can't possibly tell the story of X without knowing about Y. One of the things that's very interesting about the work I do that I find is there's this weird thing called off the record. 
And in most of my conversations now, which are much more limited, I don't do 70 hours of conversations because I'm old and to do 70 hours of conversation that I would have to process would be physically and metaphysically impossible. So I have conversations with people typically over three days. Those three days of conversation yield perhaps 16 hours of tape, ideally. The three days is a beautiful format because the first day everyone's stiff and very uncomfortable, especially me. The second day, it's like, hey, uh, it's nice to see you again. Third day, it's different. It's sort of like a story in three acts, a drama. Um, much of the conversations that I now have with people are off the record. The tape is rolling, and then someone is telling a story, and they want to complete the story, but they say, oh, I, I should tell you this, but it's off the record. And I say, but of course. And yet the tape is rolling, and yet there's an assumption that I will be an honest person and not betray them. I can't really do that even if I wanted to, which I would never want to do because we have things called fact checkers. And the fact checker will call the person with whom one has spoken and say, I understand that dot, dot, dot. We don't quote back what I write to a fact checker, but they'll say, I understand that you were dot, dot, dot. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 no. That's off the record. That hasn't happened because I don't do that because I preserve that space in which there can be frankness. Because to license someone to be frank with a stranger through the matter of off the record grants me and them license to say things subsequently which are frank, truthful. In 2017, 2016, in the run-up to the election that led to the uh, entry into our emotional and metaphysical lives, Donald Trump, uh, I traveled to France and I wrote about a writer named Emmanuel Carrère. And I'm gonna to read to you a little bit of it. Late last October, as American electoral pan pandemonium was approaching, so this was published in March, and so this is a document of our having met in um, uh, late October. Late last October, as American electoral pandemonium was approaching its climax, I was in a living room in Paris where the 59-year-old French writer and filmmaker Emmanuel Carrère was talking about shame. To write disagreeable things about the self, dishonorable things, Carrère told me, reclining like an analysand on a black leather couch. This doesn't present me with any problems. I have very little shame. There are many things I've done or thought that I consider bad. But I don't feel shame over them because I think that everyone feels they've done bad things. I think it does a reader good to see, oh, he's the same way, him too. What's difficult, Carrere continued, sitting up, is that when one writes about oneself, one is obligated to write about other people. And there, as much as one has the right to write absolutely whatever one wants about the self, and once again, for me, that's not very difficult, to write about others is an enormous problem. The sincerity that you can exhibit with yourself, you have no right to inflict on anybody else. Carrère, who has the silhouette of someone half his age, but whose face is so deeply grooved that its lines seem carved there, wasn't speaking abstractly. In the past 17 years, he has become famous in France for writing about other people, a murderer, a Russian fascist, his mother, her father, the women in his romantic life, in each case, finding new formal solutions to the problem of writing about the self and others. But Carrere is not without his misgivings about the results. There's an intervening part of about 5,000 words in which I talk about his work, in which we talk a little bit further. Note that I'm privileging his voice over mine, as I should. And it goes on, I've lived a mostly privileged life, Carrere told me. For the most part, I'm lucky. I never had any real money problems. Professionally, I knew some success fairly quickly. I'm in good health. At the same time, the thing I've carried in my life that's a little heavy is a tendency to depression. Occasionally, there are years that aren't exposed to it. Then it comes back. The best remedy to it is work, and when work isn't there, and when my sense is that work is not possible, there's a great fragility as a result. 
Carrere was very much in that fragile state when we spoke. His writerly purgatory was also a domestic one. Of late, he has said he has had the impression that he has no idea where he's living. He has not been living at home. He and his wife have recently sold their apartment and bought a new one that isn't yet habitable and that left him occupying an absent friend's place, one in which there wasn't the least trace of life, anyone's life. No books, no pictures, no chosen anything, no nothing, and that had, therefore, a sinister air of vacancy. The vaguely creepy ambience of that objectively pleasant apartment into which Carrère welcomed me, large windows facing a leafy courtyard, two floors, was further amplified by the presence of a huge leather couch at its center, a couch that seemed somehow forlorn, abandoned, a huge dog of a couch waiting miserably for its owner to return. The reason I belabor this point of feeling is to try to get across the atmosphere of spending time with Carrère that day and the next. Others are a black box, Carrère had told me, and yet that black box does sometimes give off a black light, I am writing, in certain moments, though it can't be seen, can be felt. Carrère, who is nothing if not exquisitely polite, and who tries at every turn to express himself with precision and care and frankness and good cheer, did his best to be a good host, offering tea, offering himself as much as he could, but in retrospect, that first day of conversation was heartbreaking. During those first hours when he presented as the very cheerful guy, he was in fact suffering terribly. After two hours of talk in that strangely grim, cheerful apartment, talk that centered on the various kinds of art Carrère admires, in sculpture, Michelangelo's Pietà, uh, the uh, Rondanini Pietà, the less known one. It is a thing that's utterly stupefying because of it, the abandon, uh, Carrère says, as if the body of Christ were falling. You sense the weight, it's staggering, and music, Dylan, Leonard Cohen are important to him. We had lunch and we talked about painted portraits. As there was a Rembrandt show on and as Carrere said he loved Rembrandt, it's a bit tired to say this, he wrote, but he said, but if there's a painting where you have the impression that you're seeing the soul of a person painted, it's really Rembrandt. We decided to go to the show after lunch. Carrere asked me if it would be okay if we went there on his scooter and he gave me a helmet and off we went. It was a pretty sunny day in Paris. And as we putted forward through the busy streets, Carrère drove carefully, perhaps a little too carefully, in that there was a tremendous amount of unexpected braking. And I found as I clutched the bar at the back of the bike with both hands that my hugely helmeted head kept colliding with the rear of Carrère's helmet. I tried very hard not to let my helmet collide with his, and whether through a deficit of core strength or passengerial inexperience, it kept happening, bonk. Put, 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 bonk, bonk, put, 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 bonk. And the thought I had was, this would be a lot easier if we were close friends. <laughs> Brothers, and it were natural to rest against him. And of course, I didn't do this because it would, and it would have been awkward for an American reporter to embrace his just met subject on the back of a scooter as we bumbled along down a Paris boulevard. But the feeling that seized me, and it was oddly powerful, was that I should, that it wouldn't be weird to hold on to this stranger, that everything would be a lot better if I did, if I just reached out and held on. It is interesting to me that when I meet people who I tell my job and I mention that I write for the Times Magazine and write about writers and they learn that I wrote a profile of career. They say, oh, you mean the piece with the thing about the motorcycle and the helmets? <laughs> Weird fact. A couple of years later, I get an email from Career saying, you should read my, new book, uh, there's a little something in it for you. Um, the first half of the book is about his doing yoga and meditation and his attempt to center himself, but it's about his depression and it ends up talking about um, three months that he spent in a psychiatric hospital 
being treated for and learning that he had bipolar two. Um, at the very center of the book, there is a section in which he writes about my visit to him. And he writes about the profile I wrote of him. And so I get to see reflected the experience I had through his experience of the experience he had as we, et cetera, rinse and repeat. Um, I will not read that to you. I will only read that he ends it with, um, Wyatt Mason describes the sound made by the front of his helmet hitting the back of mine each time I break, the effort he puts into preventing the front of his helmet from hitting the back of mine, and that's where he writes this amazing thing that even more than all the rest inspires in me such profound sympathy. This would be a lot easier, etc. if I just reached out and held on. I am trying to do this in my work. As I conclude, I want to return to Dean Dalbert's term fellowship, and I, I here wish to use it in its devout form, spiritual communication, religious communion, close spiritual union. What I strive for in my work is a state of attention that can bridge distance. It approaches the spiritual at its best in the root sense of the term in Latin, spiritus, breath. Genesis 1, God's breath hovers over the waters. Genesis 2, God breathes life into Adam. Breath is life. Whence does it derive? What is an interviewing practice based on, if not the exchange of breath, the breath required to speak, the breath required to listen? I call this fellowship, and it's a very good training for friendship. Speaking of breath and of listening and of friendship, we now have the chance to hear Daniel Mason read his remarkable story, A Case Study, which was published in the spring issue of the Paris Review. Please welcome Daniel Mason. Thank you so much, Wyatt. That's yours. Um, and thank you, Tina and Roger and President Botstein and everyone for coming. You'll excuse my tea here. I will. Right, so giving tea, as we just heard, is an act of friendship, so I'll bring it to the stage. I've been traveling for three weeks now and um, have come to the end, but I think I need a bit of the, the tea um, to sustain my voice. So I'm just going to read from a story now with, with little introduction. I think its reason, um, the reason for its selection for this conversation will become more apparent as the story moves on um, and as our conversation proceeds. It's called a case study. He was 24 when he first saw the psychologist. In his second year of medical school, in the midst of a darkness that had descended without warning and left him reeling and unmoored. It was the first time he had been to therapy. He could not conceive of how it would help him and had resisted the idea for months. Relief would come, he reasoned. It always had, but it didn't come. And from beyond the devouring darkness came an awe at the velocity of his own unraveling and the sense that when he looked inside himself, he found only a void. He had been given the psychologist's name by his aunt, who had been to see him during her own crisis years before. The psychologist had a private practice in a residential neighborhood, and on the first day, the man had walked there through the park with its quiet groves of cypress and pine. He had seen enough portrayals of therapy in movies that the office, with its empty waiting room and muted abstract artwork, seemed almost a stage set, just as the psychologist, spectacled, wearing a gray tie and a beige wool jacket, seemed so much like an actor playing a psychologist that the younger man half expected him to acknowledge that they might, for a moment, step out of character. There was a couch and two leather chairs in which they sat facing each other beneath a tall white shelf of books and journals. He had no idea what he was supposed to say, but in school he had seen patients interviewed, and so when the psychologist asked him what had brought him there, he tried his best to put his story in an order that made sense. The psychologist, a large man, pale, his accent English, his name so common as to seem almost pseudonymous, listened, took notes, and at last said gently that they were drawing near the end. And then he summarized with brevity and clarity 
what he'd heard his patient say. He offered no advice and no interpretation, just the summary. And yet it was somehow immensely comforting for the younger man to hear in so few words what had taken nearly an hour to express. He exited through a second door so as not to cross the waiting room. Walking back across the park, along the fog-laced paths, he felt as if he had both left something in the office and taken something with him. This puzzled him. The world was the same. There had been, of course, no change to the complex series of events that he believed had brought the darkness on. The only difference between the moments of his coming and his going was that an hour earlier there had been an emptiness that only he could touch, and now another person knew that it was there. The second meeting occurred at the same time one week later on a Friday afternoon when lectures were over. It began exactly as the first had. He sat alone in the waiting room looking at a slate gray painting or just down into his hands. When the psychologist emerged, they entered the office together and took their seats in the same chairs as before. He noticed a box of Kleenex on the side table and a desk by the single window that looked out into the trees. He thought it strange that he had not noticed them the first time. He realized that it was his turn to speak, and so he did. While on his prior visit, he had spoken logically, clearly, this time he felt surprisingly inarticulate, and he was relieved toward the end when the psychologist said gently that he noticed that today seemed harder. That was all he said. And the younger man continued until the psychologist, looking beyond him to a clock that was set up on the desk, said they were out of time. For the next few months, he came weekly to the sessions and then briefly twice weekly, and then weekly again. It was autumn when he started, and when the rain came, he still walked there, through the damp and silent corridor of trees. He was still sad, often very sad, but he'd become aware that despite the low gray sky of winter, he no longer felt like he was standing before a precipice. His days had ceased to be punctuated by assaults of fear and worry, and he was once again able to study without distraction. He didn't understand why he felt better, but the visits comforted him, and he liked the older man's cryptic presence, just as he liked the walk through the city forest, the crows and wood wrens he began to notice in the trees. Though he had known the psychologist only a few months, didn't know him at all, really, he was struck by how often he thought of him or imagined his voice. He didn't tell any of his friends where he was going. It wasn't shame exactly, so much as the sense that to admit it might invite either inquiry or compassion. But increasingly in conversations, he listened when others spoke of their own therapists, who seemed, with their advice and exhortations and sharing of personal experiences, so different from his own. There was a part of him that envied his friends and the simple practical solutions they were being offered. But another part perceived a purity to the structure of his sessions, and to the spectral quality of the older man. When he mentioned to the psychologist that he knew nothing about him, the psychologist answered that his patient had never asked. But you wouldn't tell me, thought the younger man, and at the same time understood that he didn't want to know, feared knowing. He felt a shiver, as if the membrane between them was too thin and might be breached. Ferns declared themselves in the pathways of the park and tulips and geraniums emerged in the window boxes of the city apartments. When summer came, he traveled on an airplane to see his family. In the sessions leading up to his departure, he told the psychologist that he was feeling better. You've cured me, he joked. And the psychologist had smiled. But he wondered, he asked, if he might continue coming. There was a part of him that found there in that office something that was missing elsewhere. The psychologist answered that he could come for as long as he wished, for as long as, together, they decided it was helpful. The younger man was relieved to hear this, though he was unsettled by the word together, which suggested that the psychologists could cut things off. Despite the fees he paid, he couldn't escape the feeling that he was accruing a debt he could never completely settle. Because of the layout of the office, he had never seen another patient, but he heard murmurs through the wall when he came early and footsteps and distant closing doors. And once in the trash can by the chair, he'd seen a pair of crumpled tissues. He had never cried in any of his sessions. He imagined the other patients to be more compelling, more worthy of sympathy. And he struggled to understand what the psychologist might see in him. 
He left and returned, and they began again. His third year started, his clinical year, and one night at a party, he met a graduate student who became his girlfriend. Soon it was no longer possible to hide his weekly absences, but she didn't seem to mind when he told her he was in treatment, didn't ask him why. They both were very busy. He loved his clinical rotations. Eventually, it came time for him to rotate onto the psychiatry service, and though he planned to be a surgeon, he found an unexpected affinity for his psychiatric patients who in their unbridled misery seemed so different from himself. His girlfriend moved in with him. In the spring of his fourth year, he was accepted to a surgery residency in a far off state. Part of him wished that he could stay in the city with its ocean and its trails of pine and cypress and the office by the park. He told his psychologist this, and the psychologist uncharacteristically didn't ask him to say more about it but just replied that he understood what the younger man had said. Their last session was the day before his departure. For months, he had wondered about the meeting. He felt as though the psychiatrist had uncovered a secret about him and was waiting until this day to tell him. But in fact, the final session wasn't very different from the others. In the park, there was a grounds crew trimming branches from the cypresses, and perhaps this disrupted the solemnity of his pilgrimage, the sense of ceremony he had hoped for. The psychologist shared no secrets. As always, he was mostly quiet and mostly encouraged the younger man to speak. When it was over, the younger man stood first and the psychologist followed. Well, he said, thank you. Then he paused. He felt the need to say something that fit the gravity of the moment. So I just shake your hand, he asked. If you like, said the psychologist but he waited for the patient to reach out first. The psychologist's hand was soft, his skin like a loose-fitting glove, and instantly the patient sensed that he was in the presence of someone much older, much frailer than he had imagined. But there was no opportunity to discuss it then because his time was up. Months passed, then years. He finished his residency in the far-off state and began a fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery while his girlfriend was hired as an assistant professor at a university an hour down the coast. They married, had a son, and then two years later, a daughter. And when the man's fellowship was over, they moved to the city where his wife held her position. He trained further, specializing in pediatric cases. When he finished, he joined the university practice, and after two years, when his loans were paid off, they bought a home in the nearby suburbs. He loved his work, the clarity of it, how he could vanish into the room and pass seven, eight hours without a moment's awareness of his own existence. He loved that others admired him, even feared him, that during surgery everyone was quiet when he didn't wish to speak. Both he and his wife woke early and worked hard, and though they had their disagreements and worries, they were mostly happy, aware of their good fortune and the sense that it was deserved. There were times with the pressures of his practice or of parenthood that he felt the absence of his old sessions, but the thought of beginning anew with someone else was inconceivable. In a way, he had never stopped speaking to his former psychologist. The graft, he joked to himself, had taken, and he wished that he could share this line. Sometimes he thought of writing to thank the psychologist or to tell him about his wife, his son, his daughter, and his practice, and about how, with his own patients and their parents, he found himself trying to embody the psychologist's quiet, inviting way. But he didn't write. Though the psychologist had never prohibited it, the younger man assumed certain boundaries extended even beyond the end of therapy. Other times he wondered about the psychologist who had seemed so much older in their final session. Illness would come, he knew, if it hadn't already, and the thought that they might never speak again filled him with sadness. And then, one early afternoon, he was in clinic when his cell phone rang, and he looked down to see the psychologist's name. He was with a patient, and so he didn't answer, though the truth was, had he wanted to, it would have been easy to excuse himself and step away. When he finished the exam, he went into his office to listen to the message. The voice was utterly familiar, and true to form, the psychologist had said little beyond a greeting, a phone number, and an invitation to call him back. But another patient was waiting, and then another. 
As the day progressed, he found his mind circling. His first thought, his fantasy, the psychologist would have called it, was that just as he hadn't forgotten the sessions, the psychologist hadn't forgotten him. And one day, now, 12 years later, he had discovered something, some key to the secret of who he was. Immediately, he knew this was ridiculous. He never would have thought to call a cardiac patient no longer in his care. His second thought was that some kind of waiting period, some quarantine had elapsed, and now the man was calling with an overture of friendship, that such a relationship was no longer prohibited. But this also seemed a fantasy, as did his final thought, the one he feared, that the old man was sick and was reaching out for help or to say goodbye. When he called, at the end of the day, the psychologist answered after a single ring. He thanked his former patient for returning the call and asked how he was doing. And though his tone was genuine, the younger man understood by the psychologist's gentle formality that he was to answer briefly, which he did, mentioning his wife, his children, and his practice. The psychologist said he was happy to hear this, and he sounded truly happy, though he didn't ask his patient anything more. He was calling with a question, he said, after a moment. He didn't know whether the younger man was aware, but over the course of his career, he had written, in addition to some technical works, two books of poetry, and three collections of case studies based on his patients' lives. He was currently in the process of preparing a fourth, he said, and had written up a case study about the younger man. He was calling to ask whether he might include it in the book. It was anonymized, of course, he said. Only you will know yourself. And in any event, he would share the chapter before publishing it, so as to obtain consent. You are not obliged, he said. If you prefer not to allow this, there are other patients I can choose. The man was standing in his office as he listened. There was a window that looked out onto the entrance of the hospital where patients were arriving, struggling to emerge from their cars and settle into walkers and wheelchairs, or waiting with their tanks of oxygen, fragile, tired people who frightened him with their fragility. Now, watching the patients, their families, the staff who helped them from car to chair and chair to car, he had the additional sense that these sick people were good people, pure people, selfless people, and that he, in the comfort of his office, in his health, was not. A version of this thought, that he had taken more from the world that he had given, had long preceded his becoming a doctor. Indeed, it was something he had discussed with the psychologist, who in reply asked if he felt some kind of balance sheet between the two of them as well. Actually, it was only later after the call that he was able to fully stitch together this thought. In the moment, he said yes, and the psychologist asked him for his address so that he might send the case study in the consent form. The man returned home late that night, and during dinner he was quiet. He was surprised at how affected he was by the conversation. He felt embarrassed that he hadn't asked the psychologist how he was, though in the past, in the early days, when he had done so, the psychologist hadn't really answered. He couldn't escape the feeling that he had been ungracious, gracious, and he slept po un poorly that night, and he didn't tell his wife about the call. For the next few evenings, he checked the mail as soon as he got home, and after four days, when nothing had arrived, he asked his wife if she had seen the, a letter he was expecting from a colleague. She hadn't, and as he didn't want her to go curious, he didn't ask again. The thought that she might ask to read it worried him. The psychologist had promised him anonymity, but this was to the world, not to his wife. At the same time, it was unclear what he was hiding. His sins were few, and the desires he had shared seemed dully commonplace, at least in retrospect. It wasn't the exposure of his inner life that frightened him just then, but rather the possibility that she would learn, no, that he would learn at last, what the psychologist had always thought. When he returned home one evening to find the neatly addressed envelope in the mailbox, he didn't open it immediately. Not then, standing at the end of the driveway, and not later that night. He went to bed having decided to look in the morning so that it would not affect his sleep. But he was in a hurry the next morning, or so he told himself, and he took it in his briefcase to work where he didn't touch it. But then it was clear to him that his reaction was more than just procrastination. He felt as if the letter, he kept thinking of the case study, 
as a letter from the psychologist, could smuggle something volatile past the barricades, an ember wrapped in leaves and moss. He couldn't deny a feeling of betrayal, a sense that the true terms of their contract had not been stated honestly, that all along the older man had possessed an intent of which his patient had not been informed. Yet he had known when he started therapy that the psychologist was a writer. His aunt had mentioned it in passing, and so perhaps said the psychologist, though it was hard to be sure, his memory of the beginning was so obscured. He must at some point have considered this possibility, perhaps even hoped for it. He himself had written two case studies, the first in medical school and the second as a resident, both accounts of rare, lurid syndromes, a case of argyria, silver poisoning, and an unusual infection of the heart. Was this part of his discomfort? That he would find himself suddenly on the other side of medicine, the side of the dusky blue-gray woman in the attic with the rattlesnake tattoos that barely hit up his shot-up veins? When the patient with the snake tattoos was ready to be discharged, he'd signed his consent without complaint, in fact, with gratitude. There had been a debt. So he opened the envelope and found a brief formal letter, the consent form, and the study, 10 pages, numbered, double-sided. But he could not bring himself to read it, not yet. He felt strangely angry, even defiant, and when he signed and mailed the consent form in a second envelope the psychologist had provided, he also mailed the chapter back. He did not receive a letter in return, nor did he expect to. When the book was published a year later, he bought a copy but left it in his office, where it vanished beneath, behind a stack of journals. He'd read it soon enough, he told himself. And he imagined writing to the psychologist, sometimes a long, grateful letter full of appreciation for his insight, sometimes another just as long, protesting what the man had gotten wrong. But he didn't read it. And as time passed, and the next... But and he didn't read it, and time passed, and the next he heard of the psychologist was two years later in an obituary in the Times, where his poetry was praised and his four books of case studies were mentioned as classics of the genre. He read about the old man's childhood in London during the bombing and his lifelong partner, a well-known playwright who he'd married in the year before his death. There was a photo of him when he was younger, his face thin and thoughtful, Reading the article brimming with the details of life, he felt astonished that such a person had cared for him, had carried him in his mind. He had another thought then. His fantasies of correspondence had implied the possibility that whatever the psychologist had thought of him could be amended. With the psychologist's death, the case study would be forever. When he moved offices a year later, he did not bring his copy of the book. He prospered. His practice grew. He became regionally known for his skill, his willingness to take on the most difficult cases. Doctors came from overseas to watch him and his team of eight, huddled around an open chest no larger than his palm. Each August, he vacationed with his family off an island, on an island off the coast, where his son learned to sail, and his daughter, now as tall and beautiful as her mother, played tennis for hours at a time. Around them were people who had arrived at similar points in life and had come to recognize one another from the island's beachside paths and summer music festival, and from the symphony in the city that they returned to in the fall. During these months, they shared meals with their summer neighbors, some of whom were psychiatrists or therapists, and now and then, wandering through their homes, he would catch sight out of the corner of his eye, a copy of the psychologist's book. The first time had been a year or so after the psychologist's death, he was at a dinner party on his way to use the bathroom. The book was sitting on a nightstand, and he stopped to pick it up, only to find that he was shaking. Returning outside to the warm summer evening, he struggled to rejoin the conversation. He gathered from the bedside paraphernalia that it was the wife who had been reading it. As night fell, he couldn't take his eyes off her, as if somehow her manner, her words, might betray what it contained. He saw it often after that. In contrast to the sober gray hardback, the paperback had a distinctive yellow cover. And whenever he glimpsed it, he felt his breath quickening. Each time the feeling was the same, the fear was the same, that part of him was now in the possession of another person who knew more about him than he knew about himself. 
Many times he told himself that the solution to his discomfort was just to read the book. But with each passing year, the stakes grew higher. And so he waited until he found himself avoiding certain houses, just as when a child, as a child, he'd avoided walking past a shelf that held a book whose illustrations frightened him. It was absurd, he thought, but he could not escape the sense that he was being followed by a threatening presence. And he came to suspect that the truer person, the real person, the person in colors, lived in those pages and would endure long after he was gone. And so something settled upon his happiness and the clarity of his life. He stopped going to the Summer Island. His wife was a full professor and had her own circle, and he sensed a change, as if, finding him uncertain, her attachments were shifting somewhere else. Noticing this, and that he was powerless to stop it, he felt the void inside him widen. Anger rushed to fill it, anger towards the dead man who'd left him in this situation. Hadn't he known his patient? Couldn't he have foreseen this complication? The psychologist, to use the language of surgery, had failed to close the wound completely. Yet, and this seemed only to confuse his anger rather than placate it, he knew that the older man had acted impeccably, ethically, had made no demands, had asked for his permission, which, of course, the patient had granted. His son went to college, and then his daughter. And then one winter, when she was visiting and working on a term paper, he entered her room to say goodnight and saw upon her desk the yellow book. He said nothing. She looked up at him. Would he read her paper? She'd done poorly on the last one and was worried about the class. Of course, he told her, before he could think of another answer. She smiled at him. It was due tomorrow. Maybe you could read it in the morning? She'd finish it later that night. Sorry, it's so last minute, Dad, she said. He paused. Did she like the book, he asked her. Like it? She shrugged. Well, honestly, not really. She felt that no matter what the author wrote about each patient, he was writing about himself. She wanted more of them and less of him, she said. He kissed her forehead and went upstairs, undressed, and got into bed. Light from a street lamp cast the shivering of leaves upon his ceiling, and he watched the sweep of beams from passing cars, and he thought of his daughter riding in her distant corner of the house. His wife lay silent beside him, sleeping. When he couldn't bear it any longer, he went to the window and looked out at the light falling from his daughter's room onto the driveway until that light went out. Then he went and got his phone where the email from her was waiting and he threw a jacket over his shoulders and went down into the night. He read the essay on the street at the end of his driveway, the little rectangle casting a column through the mist. He read it once and then a second time more closely. Briefly, she had summarized the patients. David, who had lost his mother as a child. Kavita, who had sought treatment during her recovery from cancer. Michael, who had loved his sister's husband Ellen and Maria, George and Brian, Mark and Claire. And none were him, not even remotely. And certain now that his daughter had left a patient out, he went back into the house and upstairs to her room. There the book was sitting as she'd left it, and he picked it up and quietly closed the door and went back down to the kitchen and began to read. David, Kavita, Michael, Ellen, and faster now, Maria, George, and Brian, Mark, and Claire. Nothing. Nothing. No one familiar. And again he looked through the stories, feeling at once relief, embarrassment over all his worries, and then increasingly a different reckoning. For what had happened? Was he simply unrecognizable to himself? Or had the psychologist, true to his promise, hidden him in layers of anonymity? Or was it even simpler? Had the older man, editing his final manuscript, decided to leave him out? Dawn was breaking outside. His wife, an early riser, would soon be down for breakfast. But he stayed in his chair at the little table, 
and once again began to read the book, seeking in its pages a person who was no longer there. Thank you. Daniel, thank you so much for that reading, that story that I find so moving. Um, you and I, you're, you're one of these horrible people who has varied capacities uh, in different realms. Uh, you are a brilliant essayist. You're a marvelous and compelling and moving novelist. You're also a master of short story form where I met you first with stories that you published in Harper's. Um, and you've worked as a psychiatrist, and so you have this whole other realm of expertise, experience, and, and work. Um, it occurs to me that you and I both are working at, uh, at sort of a, a border where, to some degree, there's a porousness, the porousness of certain borders such as these, where words are used to attempt to reach someone, um, and where there's a certain reticence which has to involve itself in the practice. And so I wonder if you could speak a tiny bit about your sense of, in the two realms in which you work, in which in fiction you penetrate deeply into other minds, as you do in this story, a story in which there, there are no names, except the names of the patients, ironically, who are in the book, which are of course not names of the patients who were in the office. but. Um, is there any complication that your psychiatric work has presented to your, what I see as your central work, because I don't know you as a psychiatrist, how has the one informed the other, I suppose, just to start? Sure, sure. Um, so this story, in a way, is, is an essay um, that I wrote uh, after an interview that I had had um, in which the, the interviewer had asked me, um, about why I didn't want to write about my patients, because I've never written about my patients before. Um, and there's this long um, and really very helpful tradition of people writing about their patients, um, but at the same time, a similarly long um, and helpful tradition of people exploring the complicated ethics of writing about one's patients. And, and um, Freud, quite early on, sort of mentions this in the case study of Dora, in which he mentions that, um, whereas he's been accused before about hiding so much information about his patients um, that the clinical case is no longer useful to be, to, to be studied um, or taught. Um, if he includes too much, he's going to be accused of um, betraying um, privacy that has been shared with him. And so, um, so a lot of people have thought about this. But I, I had not written about patients at that point. I always felt uncomfortable about it. And... Um, and yet I didn't really know why. Um, and because, I mean, it's kind of you to say that you've appreciated the rare essay I've written, but um, I really have trouble with nonfiction as a form, especially if we're exploring something so as nebulous as this. Uh, and so I, w I decided in order to think about it, I would write this, write a story um, exploring two people, neither of whom really does anything wrong. All of the appropriate sort of ethical steps as has been defined by our profession here are taken um, and yet the complexity of writing about one's patient you know, clearly has a major impact on the life of, of the protagonist of the story. Um, all of which to say that I've found that the, the, the two fields um, in some ways are quite complementary in, in the sense that I think as a fiction writer, one is you know, ultimately um, maybe primarily concerned with the character's internal world in terms of what fiction can offer. Um, and one sort of peers into that and tries to understand it as much as possible, that is very similar um, to, to psychiatry. Um, and yet at the same time, um, fiction requires a kind of mystery, a kind of boundary in a way, and maybe we'll explore this further, um, that I think is a different kind of boundary that um, psychiatry pre presents or demands. What strikes me about that is, you know, I frankness um, and the reticence, uh, those two qualities, which 
are in some way, they inform each other, but they're, they are at odds. And Diogenes um, the Cynic, um, one of his beautiful phrases from fragments that we have of his output, and it's only fragmentary, says, uh, frankness is the most beautiful thing in human dealings. And that beauty is based, I think, in its rarity. And in the quote from Cicero that I gave, you know, the, the idea that what is central to being able to actually acquire, maintain, foster um, friendship is this will to, it's not openness, you know? It is, but the functional, practical aspect of the openness is being able to tell your friend what you see in them. And in this story, you perform this idea of a fear that the person who is known in some way through a border will be seen. And so I wonder if there are feelings that you have had as a psychiatrist, if it is not too you know, impossible for you to answer, in which you have felt kind of this natural feeling to incline towards, because there's some, as I con conceive it, there's some advisory role in which you enter deeply into somebody's life who is not allowed into yours. And so is there a tension for you internally as to the, the degree to which friendship is, is there any impulse towards it where you have to stay yourself or you recognize that staying? Mm -hmm. Sure. And of course, as you're talking, like the, the comparison to your work as a profile, like, you know, are sort of increasingly present in my mind. Um, and you know, I can't, I, I don't want to answer for you. But, um, but, um, but I think that there, there, there are great similarities. And so a, a lot of times, I think what strikes me is that um, I mean, we, are, we are not talking about friendship here. Like, it's, this is a conference on friendship, but, but these are para-friendships. These are different kinds of relationships that in some ways mimic friendship, friendship um, and use friendship in, in a way to carry out another kind of work. Um, and so that's sort of famously what happens in, in a relationship between a therapist and a patient um, is that the relationship there is, is used to, the goal is to, to use that relationship to complete other work, and that's to, release, to relieve suffering. Um, the amazing part of it, though, is all of the kind of um, sort of amazing transformations that occurs in one when one, um, with the therapist, um, sort of reproduces, um, reproduces relationships that one has in one's life. And you know, in saying this to the audience, you know, I'm aware that probably we have a range of people here. You know, I wouldn't be surprised um, if we have psychoanalysts here, you know, who are far more familiar with this than I am, you know, know very well um, the principles of transference, but also a number of students for whom, you know, maybe your only exposure to this concept is through therapy yourself, but um, a very central principle to a lot of different kinds of therapists is that the relationship that develops in the office is one that reproduces, um, recapitulates relationships that a person has in the outside world. Um, so it's important that something intense develops and that awareness and the intensity then becomes central to the relationship. But at the same time, and again, it's possible that there are therapists in the room, because the other thing I should probably add to students is that as many therapists, there are as many therapists as there are theories of therapy. This presents a certain kind in which of kind of blank th slate therapy, um, which I find, um, I would say, one of the more powerful and intellectually interesting, sort of br broadly branches, broadly speaking. But in that kind of therapy that, um, that ult ultimately, um, the true nature of the person sort of on the other side who's um, sitting in the chair is not, is not really revealed. So I want to read you a quote. Um, it's Daniel's previous novel to Northwoods, which is out now and I commend to you uh, strongly, was The Winter Soldier, in which your protagonist, written in the third person, is a 19th century cre creation of yours who is sort of a, a proto-psychiatrist. Uh, it precedes that. And so, you say, I, 
couldn't write honestly about psychiatry for the reasons that we're talking about now because I would risk betraying confidences. What's interesting for a novel is all the complex feelings that a doctor has, the mistakes he makes, the bad medicine he practices, the guilt he feels, and I felt an additional anxiety I would flow, that would flow back into my life, which is taking care of people who would then be reading this novel in which there's this proto-psychiatrist who feels he's doing a bad job and who needs to make mistakes to move the book forward. Um, I thought that was an incredibly revealing sort of answer, and I, I was really marveling at, at uh, what must have been the questions that could have been asked that would have produced such an answer. Yeah, this being a quote that you pulled from the interview you did of me for a profile, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. This is the profile I wrote of Daniel. <laughs> I buried the lead, as it seems, yes. The secret to be imparted is that Daniel and I met as human beings by a profile that I wrote of him, occasioned by the Winter Soldier, um, uh, of some 5,000 words, yes? Um, and in the interim, Daniel and I have become very good friends. And the, you know, I, I keep cordial relations with almost everybody I've profiled. Um, some of them have become friends, a number of them, in fact. Um, and I wonder, from your standpoint, since I haven't been, you know, in an in intake where you have been my doctor. No, that's, uh, yeah. that's one of the relationships we're not exploring. Exactly, here, right? we haven't yeah. actually done that. That's next conference. There's, there's time. Yes, yeah. right. But um, can you talk a little bit about the, the experience of being on the other side of the, of the, of the border? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I'm happy to admit I've been on the other side of the border in therapy also. It's, it's, I think it's an essential part of any therapist or psychiatrist or psychologist training. Um, and, you know, I think when you came um, and, you know, so like you mentioned, of course, it's funny to listen to your process. I think, thank God, we didn't do seven days of interviews um, and record 80 hours of conversation. I'm not so sure we'd be friends if that happened. Um, but, you know, when you, when you first proposed this, of course, um, I, was, I was flattered that you were interested in my writing. Um, and, you know, of course, there's the, you know, the possibility to be profiled in the Times is, you know, you know to speak, speak of careerism, of course, like a very useful thing and very flattering thing but also kind of terrifying thing. And so, you know, in, in response to the inquiry about whether I do it, you know, my, you know, my first response was to one question in your motives, um, whether the intent would be to write. Malign. <laughs> right. Um, wh whether the intent would be a, a, a good one or, um, I have a friend who was a journalist, um, cover, you know, covered politics mostly, and he, and um, this is in some 20, probably no, 10 years before I met you, um, and this was when I'd written my first book, and I was asking if he had any advice for me about dealing with journalists. And he said, I don't think that you're going to be dealing with journalists like me. My intent mostly is to humiliate people. Um, but it's just always stuck in the back of my mind, <laughs> as I've had over the years with each book, like a series of very benign um, interviews of people, for the most part, whose interest is in the work, thankfully, and, and are quite professional in, um, in doing so. But at the same time, the Times being a level of exposure that I hadn't been accustomed to, I was, you know. So there's the fear that's involved frankly, with being seen. Seen and being exposed and being misrepresented, which I think is a common theme in the short story that, that I read, you know, the sense that a person is gonna get something right. Um, and, and, and that even, I remember um, the title of the, the piece that you wrote was, I think, very much in, indicative of that. Um, you, know, you shake your head, I think it's because you don't choose titles, I don't choose titles. Yeah. They called it Headmaster. Even the, yeah, so I mean, there's, there was that one. But then, then like the print one and the online one are different. The, print, the online ones are the one that kind of remains in perpetuity as one becomes aware with the Google um, is something to, you know, I can sort of paraphrase this. Um, if I'm not, if this novel doesn't contain anything, um, well, then what am I doing in, with my life? And I remember my first response when I saw that, I, I thought to myself, you know, and this is sort of emblematic, I think, of the whole interview, which is why, why I choose it. I, th I thought to myself, you know, first of all, my God, how could he choose that? Um, it, what does that make me sound like? I mean, it makes me sound so, that's so dramatic. Um, and then I thought, well, I did say it. And then I thought, well, um, but don't you have a responsibility for, like, saying something that's not so extreme? And then as time has passed, I thought, but I really did feel that, like I really did feel that about the book, even if I didn't want to admit that that was the book. Um, and that was something that I, th I think I probably said on the third day um, of our interview, um, you know, sort of where 
you know, not, I, I don't think I was foolish enough to sort of have a beer at dinner, but, but at the same time, I'm so sort of exhausted um, by the experience of, of, of talking, you know, have, have let my guard down um, to sort of a similar extent. You fell into my trap. Into, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah, the trap of candor, which yeah. is, right, I mean, to, to, to know enough, yeah? To, right. Can't know all, but right. need to know enough. On the subject of enough, I realized that we should take a, a few minutes of questions. Sure. And uh, so I opened it up to the floor and wonder if there's some students or, well, I see Niall B. Way, who's already gesturing with, with yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So why don't we start with Niobe because uh, first out of the gate. Hang on. Wait for the mic, please. I think it's super interesting. So I'm interested in the ambivalence in your story on the scooter, um, to touch or not to touch, uh, and the ambivalence to be known or not known. And I'm, I'm interested in what lies underneath those two ambivalences, which to me is the same kind of ambivalence of to touch or not touch in, in um, Wyatt's case in your story in terms of being known, do I want to be, do I want to read this or not? And I'm curious about, for me, in understanding listening to people for so long, that it feels like the ambivalence is around the disappointment, that what will happen if I love this person or I'm connected to this person, you didn't love the person on the on the scooter necessarily, but you felt connected. And then they would come, give back to you something that doesn't resonate with how you see yourself. And I'm curious about whether that resonates with either of you, that how much does disappointment play into the ambivalence? Or the, work, the fear of disappointment, the fear of disappointment. Daniel, why don't you start? Um, that's a wonderful thought. So I think that, I mean, in some ways, this, one of the structures of therapy, and I think, um, is there is supposed to be a kind of um, a kind of safety, and that's why, in part, there's a contract, um, and 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 also um, why why some kind of payment is felt to be very important, um, in that it kind of guarantees a sort of, at least, sort of practical safety, um, so that when you're in. The, the fear that this man in the story feels that he'll be somehow abandoned or won't rise to the occasion or he's revealed too much, so forth, um, that, that can become so in, intense um, that, it, that it could you know, sort of prevent, I think, effective therapy. So there's supposed to be at least some kind of containment. But we think, and we're, we're drawing the contrast between this and friendship, you know, that's something which is not present in, in friendship. Um, and one of the places where I think that um, this kind of, like a therapeutic relation both kind of captures features of friendship but doesn't totally um, reproduce them uh, in that and that friendship there's always a kind of danger in friendship in that um, in that the friendship can be lost and of course the more you put into it the more that would be lost if that if that occurred No, we need the mic now. Sorry. When you think someone knows you and they say something that reveals that they don't know you mm. as well as you would hope they would know you. Sure. And to me, that, that is an unspoken conversation, mm -hmm. that, that profound disappointment. And I'm thinking with Wyatt, too. I'm going to say I, it's the same thing to you about what did you fear in that touch, right? Mm. Um, the same, first of all, the, I mean, you spoke yesterday about the idea of, of these boys who are vulnerable and open. And then they, re in tender, uh, they use touch with, with other boys and caress and gentleness. Um, and then at a certain point, the culture acculturates you to the idea that's unmanly. And the, the words that you quoted is the, well, I'm not gay, is what the older boy then begins to say. And so I can be very frank and say that I was afraid that Carrere would think I was making a pass at him. It was very much a sexualized thought and a fear that was restricting me in that idea. Um, and also I did think professionally it would be just weird and inappropriate for me to, to hold him in that manner, even though there might be great personal cost in not holding him, which would be I fall off the damn bike, okay? It's like, I really did have the thought, I am going to die, um, which, I, which I sublimated into the way that I wrote that scene. But what I can tell you now, and which I think is the most revealing of my practice, is that even as we discuss it, I feel the distance, I feel the presence of the absent um, embrace. And honestly, I long for it. 
I long to be able to express that um, and to feel that. And I think that, that that speaks again to my practice and to something which I tried to sketch autobiographically and to say that I longed for an intimacy with my friends that did not was not realized. And I find that I do things in my work which put me in a position of vulnerability, ideally, as much as my subject, so that I can, you know, see something that is true. And one thing that journalists get is like, when I was writing this piece about career, I told my wife who traveled with, uh, with me and our four month old daughter at the time to Paris. And you know, after two days with career, she said, how's it going? I said, I got nothing. I got nothing. This guy is just, he's just reciting pages from his books that he has in his mind. And it's just like, I already have all that. I've got nothing. And it, that I, the idea of the journalist who's trying to get stuff is part of, inevitably what I'm doing, but I'm also trying not to do that ever. Does that make sense? Let's uh, move on. Who else do we have who might like to ask a question? Uh, I see a hand over here. I ha see a hand in back. Any student hands will be greatly appreciated. Uh, not to say that, you know, we're all students of life, but yeah. Hi. Anne. Hi, Anne. It is me, Anne. Yes, yeah, okay. thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about what seemed to me to be uh, sort of present lurking impossibilities here. And for Wyatt, it seemed to me that he asked you to get on his scooter. I mean, you don't ride a scooter holding on to the back because you will fall off and die and he would be very unhappy. And I think when you, I think he was reaching or I think that is a possibility because that's, that's a lovely thought, yeah. That's how one rides a scooter. It's not, it's not sexualized, it's just, it's just I feel comfortable enough with you to have you have my back. And, um, and Daniel, when I was, when I was listening to, to this story, I kept thinking, why, why isn't it a possibility for the man just to say, well, I'm not gonna read it. I mean, quite frankly, I do that fairly often because I suppose in some ways, like Hannah Arendt, um, there are only a few people, sorry, uh, whose opinion I really care about. So people will often say, I wrote a bad review of you. And I say, I'm sorry, I haven't read it. Because why should I? I mean, I, I don't troll for my own reviews. And, and if, I, if I, why would I do that? It just seems strange. And I thought it was odd that for your patient, he never had before him the possibility of just saying, no. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, why, why I mentioned earlier sort of this, this quote about the poem and the poet, and, and, and my hope with this character would be that, that, that he exists in a kind of mystery beyond, beyond which I can understand. Like, that, that's my goal in the story. Um, in order to try to interpret his behavior, like so, as 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 a writer, I'm trying to create someone who who seems real and mysterious, mysterious, and and someone who you want to ask questions of, um, but but who doesn't provide certain kinds of answers. If I'm to think of him with a different kind of hat on, which try to think of him as say a therapist would think of him and try to try to understand him, then I have interpretations. Um, none of which I'm totally certain are right or will, will ever know that they're right. Um, but since I think that's what you're asking, I would, I would offer that I, I see him um, as someone for whom um, understanding um, and understanding depths and interiors, I mean, he's become a surgeon, um, really is the way in which life, which presents itself as a distressing mystery, can be confronted and, and resolved or at least, at least tolerated. Um, but that ultimately we can't know ourselves to any kind of completion, and he's a, and at some level he's aware of this, um, and so what he's he knows what he's going to find is is never going to reproduce that thing which he's looking for, um, and he knows that and he can't quite bear the pain that's going to be revealed when he finds that to be the case. He'd rather live with the idea that perhaps there exists out some, out there something that will offer a, a kind of final understanding. Yeah, perhaps one might be known. Perhaps someone might be right. known, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, when Crazy Jane says, my friends are gone, no, there's a truth, nor grave, nor bed denied, you know, there is this fear that, that there's this fleeting knownness which has disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, Cicero also says, 
hey, minute your friends die, make new ones. Doesn't matter if you're an old person, you don't want to die alone. You need your friends in order to be known to yourself in some fractious way. And ideally, they actually know you, as opposed to say one day, you know, something as someone said that, you know, as, as Naomi said, is just totally not knowing you. Do we have time for another question? Okay, last, no, yes, no. Quick, it has to be a quick question, ideally from a student, fantastic, we've won the lottery, right in the middle. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, when you're, oh, sorry. Um, when you're journalist, uh, when you're doing your profiles on uh, like any number of people that you would profile on, when you said your goal is not to like get something, because after the first two days, uh, the f the French writer was sort of just reciting his his books. Is I mean, you have to fill five thousand words, which is sort of a significant chunk of text. Is your goal just to interact with the person in their environment, or do you like how do you, what is the process of getting the bulk of the content from the person that you're profiling. Yeah, I'll try to make the, because we have to move on, it's a question that I could unfortunately dilate on for several hours in a journalism uh, seminar, okay. but what I would say is just be present to listen, you know, and to try to create spaces in which one can hear. And ideally the training through time is to say how do these things collect into something coherent so that the case study that one puts together is um, true enough. Daniel read my piece. You know, David Mitchell, who I also profiled, um, didn't. He says, I don't read them. You know, and there's a, I used to think that I wrote these for the subject. It's like I want them to approve. Now I don't care, uh, which is different from saying I hope they're unhappy. You know, I'm, I'm trying to leave that out and I'm trying to burrow in with the hope that I manage it. I do recall you sent me a text message the day before it was published saying to me that you hoped that I was happy with it, um, but you didn't know that I would, which is a terrifying message to receive. <laughs> Let's leave it on that. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. So, um... Thank you all much. Uh, I, just a quick announcement. We have a bunch of people who've been waiting outside are gonna come in and to the extent people could squeeze to the middle or let them through, um, that will be really helpful and um, allow us to seat as many people as possible. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to call up to the stage now our next two speakers. Um, uh, Marissa Franco and Esther Perel, if they want to come up and, and have a seat. Um. chance while these other people come in, but so much of it I know. Yeah. I like that. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, I didn't miss a word in either of them. It's really great. Um, yeah, 
I know we, we used to have like buses and these power stations all over the world. I've avoided that recently because I'd rather have people who really want to be here. people to take seats so that we can get going because we want to make sure we have time for this next panel. Welcome everybody and welcome to the, uh, the folks from Hudson who just arrived. Our next panel is um, a talk called The Power of Friendship by Marissa Franco. Um, and she will then be in conversation with Esther Perel. Um, Marissa is a psychologist and a professor at the University of Maryland. She's a TED speaker who gives talks on belonging and co at cooperations, nonprofits, and universities. She's the New York Times bestselling author of Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. And I can tell you that, um, first of all, uh, as someone who's at that age where friends are moving around and also moving on, um, in, in my life, uh, keeping and making new friends as an adult is hard. I talked about that a little bit yesterday in the introductory remarks about how it's hard to make friends as you get later in life. Um, and Marissa's book uh, has been really enlightening and, 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 and very um, uh, helpful, but just thought provoking to me and I'm really glad that she's here. Um, Esther Perel is a psychotherapist from Belgium who is well known for her work on human relationships. She's also a New York Times best-selling author of two books, The State of Affairs and Mating in Captivity, translated into 24 languages. She's the host of the well-known podcast, Where Should We Begin?, which I believe is now also a card game. Is that correct? Yes. And also of many, celebrate, many TED Talks, including two celebrated TED Talks, The Secret to Desire in a Long-Term Relationship, and Rethinking Infidelity, a talk for anyone who has ever loved. Please welcome Marissa Franco. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I am so happy to be here. Um, just wanted to acknowledge that not too long ago, we all went through the friendship shit show that was the pandemic. And um, sorry in advance for bringing you back to that place. So in my pandemic experience, I was living with an ex and I just found myself feeling this malaise, almost like this dysphoria. And it was like really hard for me to understand what exactly am I feeling. But at the same time, I'm writing this book, Platonic, on how to make friends and just thinking so critically about how we've been taught to love. You know, I'm thinking about how I've been told that one person should complete me and make my life meaningful and reading all this research that says well, that's crap, and that's not true. And I began to recognize my feelings as a form of loneliness, kind of like a unique form of loneliness, because here I was around a person, but I was still feeling this loneliness. And I feel like it's a kind of loneliness when you're around one person but lack larger community that is hard to identify, specifically in this culture that says that Friendship is a nice to have, larger community is a nice to have, but you really need to have this kind of nuclear family and this nuclear connection. And so as I started to look into history, I realized how, you know, this has not always been true, that we assume that we just need this kind of nuclear unit. And Marsilio Ficino, Italian scholar, who created the term platonic based on the teachings of Plato. And his definition of platonic love was a friendship that was so beautiful that it transcended the physical. And so it's so different than how we view platonic love today. Like, 
this form of love with the screws of sex and the screws of romance missing. And so as I began to get into the empirical research on this, it kind of further proved my point that we can't sacrifice platonic connection and community because the research identified three different types of loneliness that we could experience. There is intimate loneliness, which is this desire for a close, intimate connection with other people, such as what you might get through a spouse or a best friend. But there was also relational loneliness, which is the desire for someone as close to you as a friend, and collective loneliness, which is a desire to be part of a group working toward a common goal. So what does that mean? That even if you found your soulmate, you found someone that makes you so, so, so happy, you're still vulnerable to loneliness, just like I was. So we need friendship, we need connection, we need larger community. And part of the reason we need that is to fully self-actualize ourselves. And I feel like they touched a little bit on this in the last conversation. You know, during the pandemic, my ex, he loved World War II documentaries. I do not love World War II documentaries. Um, but I do really love learning languages. That's something me and Esther share in common. And um, he doesn't really like learning languages. So it was kind of like these different parts of ourselves began to wither, you know? Our, our personalities began to collapse and accordion inward because there were all of these different interests that we had that we couldn't share with each other. And so we st I started to feel like a less actualized version of myself. And it was so dramatic when I would be around friends and feel like, my gosh, I am fanning outward like a peacock. So now that we know hopefully a little bit about just how important friendship is. I wanted to give you a few tips on to how to build friendships. I would actually like to move around a little bit, so I'm gonna switch mics. So in March of 2020, I um, bought an apartment in Washington, D.C. And I'm like, I bought this apartment, I want to invest in community here, I wanna become friends with my neighbors. And this is, you know, while I'm writing my book on friends, I see my neighbor in my hallway, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I should talk to her. But then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so nervous, I'm gonna run inside. So I ran inside, I scurried into my apartment, and I think something that I was battling at the time is what I like to call the paradox of people, which is this conundrum we all face, that no one will hurt us, harm us, abandon us, reject us, devastate us like other people. But on the other hand, we need people. We need people to feel fulfilled. We need people to flourish. We need people to feel like our very selves. You know, we love people. People love us. People approve of us. And I think how we handle this paradox says a lot about our ability to make friends, right? And so when I ran back into my apartment, I was kind of warring with this, this split here. And I was acknowledging the side that's like, she might not like me, this might be awkward, this might be really uncomfortable. But what I've learned about making friends is that the people that are best at making friends, they lean on the side of the paradox where they assume that people might love them, people might approve of them, they might deeply connect. In other words, they do something that I suggest, which is to try to assume that people are going to like you. Why does this help us make friends? Well, there's a study on this phenomenon called the acceptance prophecy. So these researchers told people, hey, based on your personality profile, you are going to go into this room and everyone's gonna like you. You know, we ran the analyses here. Of course, this was deception on the parts of the researchers. It wasn't true at all. But they found that because the participants thought this way, they went into that room and they became friendlier more open, warmer. It's the acceptance prophecy. When we expect to be accepted, we behave in ways that make this more likely to be true. In contrast, who are the people that are most likely to reject you? They are the people that fear rejection the most themselves. When we fear rejection, we become closed off. We become withdrawn toward other people subdued, we're on our phones, right? And fundamentally, we are rejecting other people, and so then they reject us right back. 
And so as I thought about this, you know, I have all this swirling in my head, and my ex, he sees me scurrying back into the apartment, and he throws me back into the hallway, and he's like, Marissa, what would you tell all those people you're writing that book for? And I'm like, oh, gosh, yeah, I guess I would tell them I need to assume that she's going to like me. I need to assume that this is going to go well. And so I approach my neighbor, and I say, you know, hi, I'm Marissa. I just moved into 103. It's so good to meet you. And she is so friendly, y'all. It just kind of reminded me of this study that came out of London that found that when people predict how open strangers will be to talking to them, they think about 40% of the time the person will be open to talking to them. But when they actually talk to strangers, it's actually about 90% of the time the person is open to talking to them. And so I was chatting with her name was Zaria, my neighbor. And um, at some point, I'm like, hey, you know, is there any way that we in this apartment like to kind of keep in touch, any way that we socialize? And she says, um, well, we do have this WhatsApp group for cat sitting. And I think to myself, well, I guess I got to take connection in whatever form it comes in. So I had to cat sit for a lot of cats to get into that friend group. <laughs> but you know what? That group of neighbors was my saving grace. Because every Friday of the pandemic, we hung out socially distanced in the garden behind our apartment. It just made me feel better with the loneliness that I was struggling with. And I think sometimes we think that some small act, some tiny act like just saying hello, can't have colossal consequences on our lives. But it absolutely can, because one year later, that same neighbor formally asked me to be her best friend. So, as we transition into this discussion, I just wanted to share a quote from my 22-year-old niece who read my book, Platonic, and what she said about it was, for friendship to happen, someone has to be brave. So be brave. Stay up and do this. So, yesterday, as we were preparing for this uh, conversation, we were asking each other some questions about friendship in order to have a little bit of a, a sense of where each one was coming from. And we were seated with a few other people and students in particular, and we basically started to ask them all these questions. And they were quite... Uh, bold and uh, to respond to us. So we thought we should ask you some of those very same questions um, so that we make this conversation as concrete, visceral, and in the gut um, rather than... Um, so, do you want to do the first? Yeah, I'll do the first one. This was a really good question Esther had. Did you grow up with friends that you played outside with freely on the streets? Raise if your yes, hand. raise your hand. Okay. Wow. So most of you grew up playing on the street freely with other people. And how many of you would say, no, that's not the case for you? Ooh. Okay. The difference, or why this question matters, is that this is one of the biggest changes that we notice in terms of young kids from little on playing freely, experimenting, in unscripted, unchoreographed, unmonitored social interactions and social negotiations. You play, you make friends, you make f enemies, you make peace, you make rules, you break the rules, you compete, you are jealous, you get yourself in, then you kick the other out, and then you bring them <laughs> back in. And when this entire script of social interactions is reduced to shreds, there is an enormous set of social skills that are rapidly diminishing for many of us. Mm -hmm. Question number one. Question number two. Question number two. Do you ever expect friends to reach out to you but barely reach out to them? Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> you can remain anonymous. <laughs> so... I think that that relates also to what you were talking about, right? The paradox of 
um, people. of people. people. They, the same very people that I desperately want to be connected to are also the ones that have the power to reject me. But the interesting thing is that when we are mired into the how will they relate to me, we forget that we have the exact same relationship to them. Mm -hmm. We too can be the ones to accept them or to reject them. So the vulnerability is actually shared. But when you are in the place of vulnerability around social connection, you tend to think that it's yours only and the others don't struggle with any of this. Mm. I love that, so real. Um, when it comes to trust, do you need trust to be able to connect with people or do you connect with people to build trust? So we need to choose one. Yeah, you need to there. choose one and I so, will. Go yep. Ahead. Okay. So raise your hand if you need trust before you are able to connect with people. Which is an interesting thing, because what is it that you need to trust them for that you can know in advance when you don't know anything yet? <laughs> By definition, trust is an active engagement with the unknown. It is a leap of faith. This active engagement with the unknown is a Rachel Butzman idea, but by, you know, the, the, the constant research on trust is, that, is, is debated between do you need to trust in order to take risks, or is it the act of taking risks that actually helps to build trust? Yeah. And nobody has been able to answer that question. But when you say, I need to trust first, you may be the one who needs to know that a little bit of risk will help you build trust. And when you are on the side of, I take all the risks and I don't even look at the trust, you may need to be the one who takes it a little bit slow, slower so that you can check at, at various steps how the connection is actually building itself. Meaning, most of us need to strengthen the side that we actually overlook. Because the reality is that we need both. It's not, do you need this versus that? It's that we actually straddle these two um, needs simultaneously. Yeah, I would say it's like you need to calibrate the need to the context, right? Like if you yeah. are distrusting in a situation that is distrusting, you know, that's the goal. And then if you are more accepting and welcoming in a situation where that's more appropriate and it'll benefit you. Um, would yeah, you, you please you raise your hands if you owe a friend an apology? Ooh. And take a moment to keep your hand up because it's a bunch of you, it's good. <laughs> and then take a moment just to think to yourself, who, what for, and what would be my first sentence, because what stands in the way of this? What's the obstacle? Because I'm gonna ask you the reverse question, and you'll see how they connect. How many of you would say that you are still waiting for one person's apology, or many people's apology for that <laughs> matter? Okay. So you know the experience on both sides. And it is one of the most important phases in a relationship, in a friendship, right? It's continuously a cycle of connection, disconnection, and repair. If there is no repair, there is no trust, there is no risk, there is disconnection, and off it goes in the opposite direction. Yeah, absolutely. I love this question. Esther, by the way, if you can't tell, Esther made up these questions because of the ways that she asked questions. Um, and this brilliant and evocative question, do you ever feel like you have so many so-called connections but no one to come over and feed your cat? Can I, can I rephrase it? Yes, please. Because I think that this question, for me, is the question that most um, illustrates what I think is modern loneliness, which I think we should talk about in a moment. But modern loneliness, one of its key characteristics is that it masks itself as hyperconnectivity. You can have a thousand virtual friends and nobody to feed your cat. You can post, you know, so many likes and get so many likes and get so many people and then have nobody to ask to go and pick up your prescription on your hangover. You know what I'm saying. So how many of you realize that you have a lot of friends and not enough friendships? Ooh, love that phrasing. Yeah, okay. All right, how many of you have been through a friendship breakup? Oh, oh my God. Okay. We should have a session just on that. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why this is an important question 
goes exactly to what you've been talking about. Um, you know, there's usually the word breakup applies to romantic ruptures, um, partly because we really have kind of put romantic love on a pedestal to the point where we are calling our partner a soulmate, which, by the way, for most of history was God, you know. <laughs> and uh, this one and only has taken on the epic proportions from whom we expect ecstasy, wholeness, meaning, transcendence, just about anything we used to look for in the realm of the divine. So the more religion is weakening, the more social structures are weakening, and the more romantic love is being put on a pedestal at the expense of many other relationships. My own field of couples therapy has contributed to that. When we use the, the word love or intimacy, we tend to think primarily about romantic love. We don't think about it as friendships. Actually, we call them single, which is a terrible denomination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted um, to just add to that. I think because of that, there's this term um, disenfranchised grief that people tend to experience when they lose a friend. And it's, you know, this idea that when we grieve, we usually grieve in community and we need other people to validate it and say, oh, that's hard, you know? You're going through that divorce, you're going through that breakup, that's really rough. And that we don't necessarily get that to the same degree when it comes to friends. And so we can have this internal experience of invalidating our own grief. Like, I should feel ashamed that I care this much about a friend. And it creates a much more complex grieving process, similar to my, what might happen to, you know, people undergoing a miscarriage or people that lose a pet where they don't get that, um, that same level of validation. Should we do technology? Or do oh, sure. And we also have that? romantic love. Oh, Two questions. Romantic. Okay. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think heterosexual men and women can be deep friends. I ask the same question in reverse. How many of you would say it's not possible? Oh, nice. Okay. So it's very nice. You ro this room does not reflect Google. <laughs> when you put that question into Google, the first hundred articles basically all say impossible. Great. Um, yeah. Raise your hand if you think you can be friends with an ex. How many of you have friendships with an ex? Nice. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask you one other uh, question. Um, have you ever found yourself, and you can keep your hand up each time, spending a lot of day a lot of the day, basically, at your computer, working at the screen. Raise your hand. And then you wait till you go home, because you kind of would love to close the laptop, and you find that you're so tired, and only energy you have left is to watch TV. Keep your hand up. And then, while you're watching TV, you're also scrolling on your phone. <laughs> Keep your hands up. And then, as you're scrolling on your phone watching TV and you lift your head, you notice that there's somebody else or others in the room doing the exact same thing. And we wonder why we're having less sex. <laughs> you know. So, but I can ask the same one even in, a, in another take, because what this one says, I'm actually going to uh, say this one first. One of the, what does this little story illustrate a lot of different things, but one thing is this. Modern loneliness is often the experience of being with somebody who is there but not present. You have all experienced on both sides of this. Someone at that very moment that I described then telling somebody else something that's quite important, quite personal. And the answer that you get on the other side is, uh-huh. Uh-huh. And you know that they are kind of there, but not present. And the metaphor you can use for that is a term borrowed, and this is why the grief metaphor is so useful, from Pauline Boss's work, the psychologist who wrote about ambiguous loss. Ambiguous loss is either when somebody is still physically present, but they are emotionally or psychologically gone, like in Alzheimer, or when they are 
emotionally or psychologically very present, but they are physically gone, like in deployment or abduction, as we are seeing at this moment. Do you mourn that person? Is that person death or alive? Can you actually resolve the conundrum? When you are talking with somebody who is somewhat there but not present, we end up experiencing ambiguous loss. I should be feeling connected next to you, but I don't. I should feel the warmth, the trust, but I'm not feeling it. And yet there is a kind of a person there, and I can be doing the exact same thing myself. So would you tell me, please, if the last thing that you stroke before going to bed is your phone? <laughs> raise your hand. And would you please raise your hand if the first thing that you hold and embrace when you wake up in the morning is your phone? And if, and if you're doing this while well, there's actually someone lying to you next in bed. <laughs> you see, we have been talking a lot. We were discussing this yesterday too. We talk a lot about artificial intelligence and we don't talk enough about the rise of the other AI, which is artificial intimacy. So, I had so many thoughts when, uh, when you were talking, but the first one I would like to go to is this allusion that you make to basically the unprecedented expectations that we bring, in this case, to romantic love at the expense of where we pretty much at this moment are asking one person to give us what an entire community should provide. And that's in part what happened to you in the pandemic. You are with this person, you should be feeling like you, get, you have it all, and you don't, but, and, you, and you're surprised. The, the, the interesting thing is that you're surprised by the fact that you're missing something because you think you shouldn't be missing something, and so you kind of have bought into the paradigm. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think you know the whole reason that I wrote this book was because I regretted buying into the paradigm um, you know, I wrote Platonic because I um, went through a breakup, felt really, really bad. I started this wellness group with my friends where um, we met up each week to practice wellness. We meditated, we cooked, we did yoga. And it felt really life-changing. And it, it wasn't the wellness. It was just being in community with people that I loved who loved me every week. And it just made me question, like, the idea that I'm only worthy with a romantic partner, the idea that the most primary form of love is romantic love, that the idea that, you know, to me it was like, how could platonic love not matter? Like every week I'm just seeing how much this love matters, how much it matters to me. And I felt like that just made my grief process so much worse because it, I, I felt, it, so, it felt so black and white. It's almost like splitting, like psychological splitting, how we view romantic partnerships and, and love. Like, you know, all, we have all the love if we have a romantic partnership. We have none of the love if we don't have that romantic partnership. And so I felt like a lot of us were probably in pain in this way. Um, and when I think about loneliness, it's a subjective feeling, right? It's a subjective sense that I don't have the connection that I want. And so when we're fed this narrative around romantic love is the connection you should want, then even if we have a beautiful community, we're going to think to ourselves, oh, I'm still lonely because I don't have this, this, you know, primary relationship that I should really want. And then also people in romantic partnerships being lonely as well because just like me, they feel like, oh, like this should be it, but it's somehow not it. So I felt like, you know, as a culture, we've just been setting ourselves up for failure. And so I think, you know, I wrote platonic because I didn't want us all to fail anymore. You know, I wanted, I wanted to, us to be able to collectively admit that, hey, community friendship is important community and friendship is vital and it's so vital and it always has been throughout the history of our species so let's stop having this short-term amnesia where we all of a sudden think of it as trivial we all of a sudden think of it as just a nice to have and there's this way that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy too right because if i think this is a lesser relationship 
I invest less time. I invest less effort. I'm less vulnerable. I'm not going to fly across the country to see you, right? And so it's like my mindset affects my behaviors in a way that then makes that an inferior relationship. Not because it is inherently, which is I think a lot of the ways we think about friendship, it's inherently inferior, but because our thoughts about it are shaping our behaviors in ways that make that more true. So I think that what's interesting to highlight that we began to talk about is that the diminishment of the importance of friendship goes hand in hand with the diminishment of the importance of community and collective living. Where you find individualism rise, you find romantic love rise, and the romantic love is meant to help you transcend your existential aloneness. Whereas when you are part of a more communal structure, friendship is more central. I think that one of the things um, that we resonate with is um, I think there were three stages in the context of romantic love, or we can call it the institution of marriage. At first, it was an economic system. Companionship, economic support, family life, etc. Then it became a service economy. A service economy brought in affection and a feeling of belonging and intimacy. And intimacy was no longer just working the lands together and dealing with the everyday life. Intimacy became into me see. That means it's an experience of discourse in which I share to you my internal life, my feelings, wishes, aspirations, anxieties, and you reflect back and validate me and help me feel that I matter because I only have one. And then from the service economy, romantic love has become an identity project. Now we try to find somebody who's going to help me become the best version of myself. And the more you get that ascension of needs, and the less friendships are recognized as crucial, actually, not just crucial in your personal life, but crucial to the relationship as well. Yeah. A, a dyad lives better in an ecosystem of many other meaningful connections. Exactly. You know, I, I love that. You're putting it that way, that there is synergy between having a successful romantic relationship and having a successful um, group of friends, right? That... You know, the research on this is that if you are in a romantic partnership and you develop more friendship, not only are you, do you become less depressed, but your spouse becomes less depressed too. Um, or if you get into a fight with your romantic partner, it disrupts your release of the stress hormone cortisol. Um, so you're kind of more stressed out unless you have quality connection outside of that relationship. And so I think of, you know, larger community because I think sometimes people think that of these two relationships as so antithetical. Like, you're hanging out with your friends, so you're not hanging out with me. But they are just so symbiotic because, yeah, like I you're I have saying. a question for them. Oh, yeah. How many of you experienced that when you began dating? This is also to the people who still remember dating. Um, <laughs> but when you start dating someone, you find yourself kind of c cutting off or uh, disconnected from your friends. See, that's what she's talking about. Yeah. This is weird. <laughs> this is weird. And it's completely counterintuitive. Because if you're actually starting to get to know someone, why would you want to know them outside of the context of your life? Why would you want to know them in a dark, noisy place where you can barely have a conversation <laughs> that actually usually looks like a job interview? You know, rather than bringing them into your circle, into the village, so that you can see them in connection with the people that matter to you, who are more likely to stay there when that one is gone, anyway. Yeah. You know, there is an interesting study that um, women's close friends could better predict how long their relationship lasts than they could. <laughs> so at least you need to, like, bring your friends in to give you some feedback on the person. Um, but yeah, I, you know. Is that Ariely's research? Uh, no, I think it's someone else. I could look it up for you later <laughs> if you want me to send you the citation. Um, and the other thing, that, the other point I wanted to make to add off of that is, you know, I think we get so caught up in this, these romantic feelings, right? Where we feel so excited about and enthralled by someone and thrilled by them. It's almost, you know, like a drug, the sense of euphoria that they give us romantically. But throughout history, romance has been a part of friendship. That often we think of romantic and sexual love as, as the same and conflated, and so it doesn't allow us to admit that we experience romantic attraction to our friends, that there are friends we feel thrilled by, 
There are friends we feel enthralled by. There are friends that we yearn for, even if we're not sexually interested in them. And throughout history, actually, you know, the genders were considered so distinct that the idea was you can't have this deep, intimate love with someone of a different gender than you. And so that's to, to experience this deep, romantic love, you actually turn towards your friends. And so friends would cuddle, friends would share beds, friends would carve their names into trees, friends would join each other in their honeymoons. The letters that friends wrote to each other in the 1800s. I mean, they're so deeply, deeply intimate. And so you know, I think we need to also broaden our understanding of, of love in a way, even romantic love, because the idea that romantic love is part of friendship isn't radical. It's actually quite traditional. And I would say there's, we have a modern anomaly in seeing romantic love as not a part of friendship as well. You make me think of another question we didn't ask, which is about help. Helping friends and asking friends for help. So I just am very curious, do you, do you, when you think of a friend, does the concept of help, the transaction, the interaction of help, not just of shared interest and activities, and, but really being able to rely on someone. And I think that the question differs in different cultural contexts. If you, live, if you grew up in a context that says relationships are central, and they focus on loyalty and interdependence, you have a different definition of friends and of helping and of relying upon than if you grow up in a context that emphasizes autonomy and self-reliance, where you're told that nobody can tell you what to do as best as you can tell yourself, and you have your own legs to stand on. I, and I think yeah. that bringing in the cultural context about the importance of relationships or less thereof also defines how we look at friendship. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think culture is like so, so important for us to consider because it, it guides what we expect. It guides what we think is appropriate. It guides what we think is unacceptable. It guides what we're willing to do. It guides like what is a boundary, right? Like I think we just perceive boundaries as so different across, um, across different cultures. And What is a boundary? Is what do we share or what we don't share? Oh, I was thinking of it as like what I'm willing to do for you, uh, right? And so I might feel as an American, like I'm being put out and my boundaries are being caught, crossed by someone asking me to, to do something in a way that someone from a more collectivistic culture might not. Um, we should read the list of the friends we got yesterday. The friends. The oh, the Arabic pyramid. <laughs> are you here? <laughs> Would you please share it with us? Because it came from you. I'm going to, can somebody bring you a mic, please? So these are basically all the different words that, in Arabic, for different levels of friendship. Because English has very few words for friendship, yeah, <laughs> even so compared uh, to French. <laughs> yesterday we have an interesting conversation about how sometimes the English language fails to uh, have a specific definition of what a friend is. And coming from an Arabic Middle Eastern background, I shared this pyramid that is basically, uh, it describes the depth of the relationship. There's a problem um, with your mic. <laughs> you can? Okay. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Um, so from bottom to the top, we have definitions for a fellow of the same age, a colleague, a person with whom you sit around, a companion in nightly conversations, there is definition for that, um, a boon and drinking companion, a companion, um, a close companion uh, in travel, as in a comrade, a friend, a very close intimate friend, a friend whose presence brings calm and happiness, a confidant, a bosom friend with whom you commune, a best friend, the chosen one over other friends, and in the top of the pyramid comes a spiritual double uh, soulmate. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I was thinking about what you just said about culture clearly indicating how we view friends and really impacting how we view friends. And I also see um, class as really impacting 
how far we're willing to go or how much communalism and instrumental support where we're helping each other out really impacts, you know, how far we're willing to go for friends because now I feel like as people get more affluent, like I was actually struck by Esther was telling me about her experience visiting friends and how you stay at your friends' places, right, when you travel. And I'm, you know, I'm in my 30s and my friends have more disposable income and they come and they stay in hotels. And we, we didn't used to be able to stay in hotels. And so my friends would stay with me because we didn't have as much money, right? Or like, I don't know, we wouldn't go out to restaurants, we would cook together and there would be this kind of intimacy. And I feel like sometimes like, there's this assumption of what should come with affluence that is like anti-connection. Like I should order this Uber instead of asking you to pick me up in the airport, even though it's not about being picked up in the airport, it's about me feeling loved in this moment when I come home. And so, you know, I think... It's about the difference between a driver with a sign or the lines of Uber you can't find and someone who's waiting there for you and you just leap into their arms. Exactly. That's the visceral difference. That's what it is. And so it's like, I feel like we use affluence to pay our way out of connection. And I feel like it's really, um, it's really sad and it's really upsetting. And I, I just challenge myself and other people to like... Be critical. Is this something that you want to give up? Like, this is an assumption of affluence that you're going to start living alone, that you're not going to stay with your friends, that you're going to order the Uber instead of asking people to pick each other up. But, like, is that something that you actually want to give up, you know? We don't have to, like, live by this cultural prescription of what it means as, as we become more class mobile. So what happens when you tell your friends, stay with me? Or rather, oh, stay with me. Yes, or I, I, you know, what happens when you break the norms? Because yeah. we can establish the norms, we can recognize them, and then there is how we just decide that these norms basically isolate us, they atomize us. Well, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, but when you have a counter norm and no one else does, it also feels isolating. So, like, for me, I'm like, yeah, like. I think you need to tell about Mexico. So yeah, this is my, my counter norm. Um, Platonic did well, and I decided that because of that, I would rent out a villa in Mexico um, and invite all my friends to roll through. So I had nine friends that came through. I called it my platonic getaway, that whatever we do romantically, we can do platonically. And um, we spent the month together, and it was really, really beautiful. And I think in a larger way, I try to think about, you know, I had this moment, Esther, where I had this friend I wanted to get close to, and she was coming home from Mexico at 12 a.m., and I sleep at 10 p.m., and I was like, should I go out of my way to pick her up or not? And I literally had to ask myself, would I do this for a romantic partner? Because that is, has monopolized my view of a love that I will go out of my way for. This is coming from me as someone who's written this book on friendship. And my answer to that question was yes. Like, I would go out of my way for a romantic partner to pick them up at 12 a.m. And so when I answered that, it became clear to me, you know, I, I need to pick her up because I'm really invested in this relationship and I want to be close. But I think, Esther, like, what you're saying, you know, how these norms really isolate us, but it is isolating to feel like you are antithetical to those norms, but no one else around you is, right? So I think we should all be able to have platonic life partners. Like instead of choosing someone you have sex with to be your life partner, you can choose someone you're deeply compatible with in terms of like a friendship, right? Or, you know, I believe in like, you know, traveling with my friends instead of just traveling with a romantic partner. But if you have other people who haven't been able to re recognize that as a norm, sometimes it just can feel like unrequited love for me. And so it's hard like being a culture changer before other people have caught up. But I will say like queer communities, are already doing a lot of these things. And in queer communities, it's just so much more normal to have this deep investment in friendship and not to give up all of your you know, relationships once you find a romantic partner. So there's also like, I guess, specific communities wherein this is more of a norm and I feel like they can inspire us all. Because anytime you are part of a dominant discourse or supposedly even the privileged group, you are privileged and much more constricted. You, you, it's the margin allows you to be more creative. Exactly. More, less normative, more creative, sometimes less accepted, but more free. Because you, you know, as being queer, you have to question, well, there's this one way that society told me to do all these things that don't fit for me. What are all the other ways, you know? And the fact that you got to that point of asking that question 
to me feels like there's this opportunity or offering for this vehicle of like deep self-actualization that can come with that. I have a ton of other things, but I think we should take a few and maybe then come back to us again. So, yes. Um, one, two, three. We're going to take a few at the same time and see what are some of the themes. Yes, and we can go down all the way down that line. Yeah. Do you mind standing up, please? Yeah, sure. And what's your name? Uh, my name is Arjun. Uh, Hi, Arjun. I'm a junior in high school. Um, my question was that throughout the talk, you mentioned both platonic and um, romantic relationships. And I think, like, for me personally, the line between them, like, throughout the presentation has been blurred. Uh, so could you give, like, a definition of what it means to have, like, a romantic relationship, like, with a friend, not necessarily, um, like, a romantic partner, but, uh, and, like, how is that different than just a platonic friendship? Yeah. It's great. It's um, just pass the mic to, 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 no, no, to the other side. You have other people on your same, uh, yeah. Yep, go ahead. Uh, my name is Wessel, and you mentioned cultural barriers when two people of different backgrounds are trying to become friends. And it made me think about how I've noticed in America, um, people have no problem splitting the bill, for example, but from an Arab family, like my mom would rather stay in a restaurant and fight for three hours and let someone else pay the bill. <laughs> it's just like a cultural thing. So I was wondering, how do you approach those barriers when you try to make friends? Very nice. Yes, it's next to you. Hi, I'm Pippa, and I was really fascinated what you had said originally about platonic love. Um, and I was just curious to what extent or in what ways you think that like social media can actually enable platonic love and like connections of true like platonic love and in what ways like it can cultivate it but then also like the limitations of social media um yeah great should we do one more yeah yeah, yeah. yep there's somebody all the way in the back uh, um can some can you bring the mic to the person and then in the meantime we go here yeah no no you, it's coming but she's gonna okay go go in the red sweater, go. Yeah, um, red dress. You mentioned like earlier. Your you name? Were, um, oh, sorry. My name's Sophie. Sophie. Um, okay. All right. Um, I was curious. You mentioned how you were nervous to talk to your neighbor, and it was a big deal. And I get that completely. What if you don't want to talk to your neighbor? <laughs> I mean, I get home and I'm just like, I have my headphones on, I'm in my own space, I'm relaxing. What do you do if you don't feel this need to connect to the people within your environment and your space? And how do you make that not awkward? Because it is. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Joshua Kasabi. I'm a dean of students at Bard Early College High School. Do you mind making your mic a little closer to you, please? Just, Can I better yeah, now? wonderful. There we go. Again, my name is Joshua Spivey. I'm the Dean of Students at Bard Elliott College in D.C. My question is, when it comes to platonic and also um, romantic friendships as well, is it transactional or is it transformational? Or is it a um, both? Or also, could it be a... Um, thank you. I appreciate it. But also, <laughs> could it be a, um, a spectrum as well? Thank you. Great All question. Right. Can we take a few? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take the one on um, what does a friendship look like that's romantic versus one that's not. It's a feeling. Um, you know, I think of like a friendship that's, that's based in purely platonic love is almost like, I don't know if you've heard the term like, is it hygge, hygge, hygge? The Swedish, where, where people in, uh, in the cold kind of band together with hot cocoa and they keep each other warm in the winter and there's just like deep comfort and a deep sense of safety and a deep sense of security. Um, you know, that to me is like this, this sort of platonic love where this, there's this companionship, there's this comfort, there's this safety, there's this warmth. Whereas our romantic friendship, and this is really coming from the asexual community, so I credit the book Ace with um, helping me evolve my understanding here. But the romantic friendships are the, the passionate ones, the fiery hot ones, the, the friends that we feel thrilled by, the friends that we are just excited to be around them, the friends that we could spend all our time with, 
You know, the friends that, you know, I guess feel romantic in nature, the friends that we yearn for, the friends that we just are so effusively, you know, talk lovingly about, the friends that feel, um, it's a hard word to, for me to say this is anything but, like, romantic, but it's almost like, you know, people ask me on my Instagram, like, could you be platonically in love with someone? And that's kind of how it feels. But I also think it does occur on the spectrum, right? That, you know, there's some friendships where it, it, it's a more mild form of that, where I'm thrilled by you, you know, I'm so excited to be around you, but it's not like I want to completely merge with you, for example. Um, so I think those are some of the differences in terms of how we, we personally experience a friendship that is purely platonic versus platonic and romantic in nature. And they can obviously be both, both as well, and I think it's healthy for them to be both. So I would add to that, um, it, first of all, it's a continuum. Um, plenty of couples that start out romantically sexually, passionately, become platonic. Um, and on the other side, there, in this country, it's very common for partners in long-term relationships to describe themselves as their best friends. In most parts of the world, people don't consider their partner their best friends. They have best friends, and their partner is their partner. It's a different category. Um, I think that it's easier if we just call it friendship rather than platonic. Because why do you define it by one criteria that it is not? It's, um, and I think the word that maybe will distinguish for you what is romantic versus friendship is the presence of erotic desire. The word is desire or passion. The, the erotization of the relationship. But even there, it's also somewhat fluid because erotization doesn't just mean sexual. It means alive, vibrant, vital, playful, curious, imaginative. So it's a line. Some people will know that they have had attractions for a friend. And some pe erotic attractions, desire for a friend. But it doesn't get expressed or it gets acknowledged and not consummated, or whatever. It, the lines are not so clear. I think the importance is to understand that um, there is friendship in romantic love, but more importantly, the existence of friendships that are not romantic needs to be elevated so that when we talk today in a society where we are so isolated about connection, we shouldn't just talk about connection as in romantic connection should elevate those relationships on an equal level when we use the words love and intimacy. That, would that be an yeah. accurate... Uh, uh, you know, I think it reminds me of like what you say, Esther, about how like we're looking for safety and we're looking for stability and we're also looking for novelty and we're also looking for adventure and we have like these two very different types of needs that kind of come into play and one feels like this sort of more platonic end on things and one feels like this very romantic end of things but like we need them both dearly <laughs> and I think we just emphasize our need for the, the excitement and the adventure so much more to the extent that people are literally ending up in relationships with people they wouldn't be friends with. I mean, this has happened to me before, where you're in a relationship with someone and you ask yourself, would I be friends with them if we weren't in a romantic relationship? And your answer is no. And now reading the research on this, that the degree to which you are, you feel like you're friends with your romantic partner predicts how long the relationship lasts, even predicts how good your sex is, for example. And, you know, the research on marriage does provide us a slight bump to our overall well-being, though a single person that's more socially connected is actually happier than the average married person. But if you say that you marry someone that you feel really, really close to, that you feel like is your really close friend, then marriage provides you with a larger bump to your well-being. So, you know, I think in general we're like, Really blurring the lines here and also affirming the general... We're need. making a statement that is this, I think. I <laughs> okay, think bring it all together, please. This is to your first <laughs> question. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships. Yes. <laughs> and that's more important than parsing out which is which. Shall we talk about the bill? Yeah, let's talk. I mean, I'm going to let you talk about this one because I feel like you are going to offer us some, something really insightful. <laughs> no, because I went through it. Um, not from an Arab background, but from Belgium originally, um, I went through the same questions. It's not just that they pass the bill, it's that they say, I didn't drink and I didn't have dessert and therefore I should pay less. Or, you know, and I just thought, that is such an interesting, um, just so different. I didn't know how to interpret it at first. Um, 
it's not just that versus the I fight three hours to pay the bill. It's more one time it's me, one time it's you, and we know that we will meet again. But if you don't know that you will meet again and you've been put around the table, I began to understand that it sometimes makes sense. Um, I think the best thing you can do in a situation like that is just say, I have an interesting question to ask to the table and turn it into a very rich conversation. Because most of the time when you observe something that is different, you are with other people who have observed it and don't say it or other people who haven't noticed it. And so in all three lenses, it becomes a rich conversation rather than finding a solution. This is not a problem that needs a solution, but it is a situation that can use exploration. Um, social media, I think we should talk oh, about Oh, social media, yes. How do we use social media to facilitate friendship rather than just harm it? I have, you know, a very researchy answer to this. So. Um, in the research on loneliness, the people that are most lonely and the people that are least lonely are both using social media. Yeah. The difference between these two groups is that one group is using social media to connect with people in person. And the other group is using social media to replace in-person connections. So that the, again. Yes. One group is using social media to facilitate in-person connection, and the other group is using social media to replace in-person connection. That is our very lonely group. So there's a complex relationship where it's not just that social media technology use will make us lonely, it depends on how we use it. And there's, you know, in the research, there's this differentiation between using it actively or passively. Actively is, I'm commenting on your page, I'm DMing you, I'm posting my pictures, I'm responding to your pictures, right? And in doing so, we are mirroring behaviors of friendship on a virtual world, where I'm affirming you, I'm communicating with you, um, but if you use social media passively, which means you're just scrolling, 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 lurking, 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 it's linked to poor mental health, poor well-being, increased loneliness. Now, the issue that I see, because I think of social media as overall a net negative for our connections, not that it is inherently, but overall it tends to be, because by design, how social media is created is to keep you scrolling. It's to keep you on the app. If you leave the app, that harms the social media company, right? And so I think when we, when we um, think about our own social media habits, what's the ratio of time that we actually use to use social media to reach out to people, to comment, to be very active versus passive, a lot of us are guilty of spending most of our social media time scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So, Hipa, where are you? Yes. Um, I want to add to that. Um, I, th this is just an, another addition to what you're saying. Here's the, the thing that is happening. When they ask a question about social media, it's happening in connection with other things. It's happening with the massive virtualization of people's lives. It's happening with people who are telling you that they have a relationship and they're talking to somebody every day, but they've actually never talked to the person in person. It's happening with, to people that are living more and more a type of assisted living. Right? Your calendar tells you where to be, Waze tells you how to get there, Spotify tells you what to listen to, Netflix tells you what to watch, you know, um, and the dating apps tell you who to meet and you are dependent on the algorithmic swipe. And all of them basically are removing friction, obstacles, experimentation and doubt, which are major skills to develop for social relations. That's the major piece. It's not so much that you can use it for good. We both are using social media. We try to be you know, coherent and have integrity and use it as a platform for education. So it's not like we're not part of it. But there is something about relation. You know, an app tries to give you answers with yeses and noes. Social media is the least place where you can find nuance. And the moment the subject is hot, as it is right now in the world, you cannot say a thing without being screamed at, cancelled, made to feel ashamed, because you didn't say the one thing that this person wanted you to hear and say. It's a shouting match. It's a public square for guillotine. 
It's not actually a place for connection. So it varies. It goes back and forth. You can be part of marginalized communities and find support on social like you never have before and feel like there is a warm envelope around you of identification and support. And then you have the other side. But what is clear is that it is taking place in a larger context that is making people more and more socially atrophied. Yeah, I'll just um, add to that, uh, you know, this anecdote. So I teach this class on loneliness. It's so fun, so cool, um, if I do say so myself. And I, um, I assign my students to hang out with each other and not take out their phones. And this freaks some of them out, to be honest. But when they write reflections about it, they talk about how, like, there was this moment of silence, and they would typically take out their phone, but, like, they didn't, and it felt uncomfortable for a moment, and then they thought about something to say. And it's like, wow, I'm seeing these, like, conversational skills materialize before our, my eyes, and, like, there is this inflection point, right? That moment where you're like, am I gonna sit with this discomfort of this connection where I'm trying to think of something to say and I can't think of something to say? And every moment you escape that inflection point, you basically enable yourself to not develop this new skill of connection, right? And so I think that's related to what you're saying about inherent to connection is discomfort. Inherent to connection yes. is risk. Yes. And if you're not willing to be able to sit with and allow that discomfort. In the short term, it's gonna feel better. In the long term, it's gonna feel so much worse because you're not gonna feel as connected to people. I can't agree more. Do you wanna talk about not wanting to talk to anybody? Does oh, that, not that wanting to talk to, me, to anybody. So you need to take that. <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to, to um, answer this question because I don't understand where the not wanting to talk to un someone is coming from. And I think it can come from so many different places, right? It can come from being tired at the end of the day. It can come from being overstimulated. It can come from being introverted, right? Where we do need our solitude and it can come from a completely healthy place. And you know, I think you know, if you don't feel up for connection and you're really tired and you need recharge and you need to spend alone time to recharge, that's okay. Like we don't need to be in a constant state of being around other people, but the other thing that I'll say is loneliness psychologically masks itself as a need for isolation. Because when you are lonely, you ironically want to connect with people, but you also want to withdraw from them. And loneliness isn't just a feeling. It fundamentally changes our way of perceiving the world such that when we are lonely, we perceive other people as more threatening. We perceive them as more likely to reject us. We perceive them as more likely to harm us. You know, when I say try to assume people like you, lonely people in the research tend to assume the opposite. When a situation is ambiguous, they think people will harm them. Um, and then they report wanting to retaliate even more. And so ironically, sometimes our need to withdraw is because we are experiencing a form of loneliness. And, and part of that loneliness is that we are seeing people as more threatening than we would in a state of disconnection. You know, my student reflected on loneliness as this kind of autoimmune disease where it triggers within us a set of beliefs, a set of behaviors that lead us to, that lead our loneliness to be perpetuated. And it doesn't seem like it makes any sense, but there's this, you know, John Cacioppo, he's a psychologist, and he argued, um, the late John Cacioppo, that basically when you are lonely, historically, you were in danger. You were separated from your tribe, right? And you needed to be weary. You needed to be hypervigilant for threats around you. You needed to assume the worst, because if you didn't, you might die. You know, you needed to really be attuned to danger. But the fact that we are no longer in that context anymore and loneliness still drives us in these ways to be kind of paranoid, to think people will harm us, to assume that if I interact with people, it's gonna be uncomfortable and it's gonna feel really, really bad, is why it can be so difficult now to get out of that state of loneliness. I mean, I think when I'm in my, in my context, when I think about one of the main questions people bring as a couples therapist is, am I alone with this? Is this happening just to me? It's not uncommon these days to have your best friend break up and you never saw it coming. When you live in a village and the streets are narrow like this, you don't have much freedom, you don't have much choice, but you are close to people and you can hear every fight and every frolic. We shifted from a model where relationships were organized around duty and obligation and primarily guided by commitments to a model that has a lot of 
freedom and a lot of choice, but also a lot of self-doubt and uncertainty and a lot of loneliness. And, you know, you're doing it in your course, I do it in the podcast. The podcast is basically bringing people into the office and listening in on other people's therapy sessions and relationship questions. And as you listen intensely to the stories of others, you recognize yourself and you realize, I'm not the only one with this. You know, especially when it comes to intimate uh, questions and especially when it comes to sexuality. People are constantly wondering, am I normal? Is this normal? Am I the only one? Do other people experience this? And it's very difficult to bring these very personal, vulnerable questions like that into the public square. Yeah. So I will um, disclose that this is a copy of my book that I was going to give to you, Esther. And in it, I was actually going to write about the ways that you've helped me understand connection more deeply, um, just in our short period of interacting. Um, and, and one of the ways that you've helped me understand connection more deeply is I have written here, the problem is not that we are isolated in our human condition. The problem is we're not communicative about it. Isolation, it seems, is a communication failure. We feel shame as if we are the only ones to ever endure what we have or think like we do, but of course this isn't true. We'd only know if we communicated as you get people to do through your questions. Do you have a friend you need to apologize to? Many connections, but no one to feed your cat. When we communicate, we see what is vulnerable is universal. Speechless. <laughs> do you want to? Actually, I would like to do something different for the five minutes that we have. Tell me if you what you think of that. Rather than take more questions, I just would like to ask you what you just heard. One sentence where it landed for you, and we can just have the mic go if you raise your hand very quickly. Yes, right there. What is most vulnerable is universal. Thank you. Keep going. Yes. Uh, give her the mic. Give her the mic. It's okay. If you're there. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, like, recognizing how media and other, um, other things around us really put romantic love on a pedestal and just don't give other forms of love that might be, like, in more of a blurry area the respect that it needs. Nice. Thank you. And by the way, when you think about where it landed, you may want to say, I need to go call this one. I owe a call. I owe an apology. I, you know, whatever it is, it can be a little action. What did you call it? Course of action? CTA? Yes. Right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed that you pointed out the intimacy um, option of into me see. I think that the, that intimacy of friendship is, is really what it's all about. Into me see. Thank you. Um, yes. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yep, where are you? Uh, right here. Right here. <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, the other AI, artificial intimacy, uh, that really resonated with me. I think that's really saturating so many of our lives and interactions uh, and don't know how to untangle myself from even participating in that type of um, behavior, but I'm thinking about that. If you teach here? I teach here. Yeah, you stopped by the table last I night. I know, I know, yeah. I know. The thing that you want to show for artificial intimacy that is the Edtronic classic two-minute video of developmental psychology called the Still Face Experiment. Mm. And then translate that into what's happening today in the experiences of icing, simmering, ghosting, gaslighting, breadcrumbing, paper clipping, <laughs> you know, the whole spiel. But the still face experiment, two minutes, and it, there is nothing that penetrates as deeply as that. Yes. Um, I, I think it's very interesting to be more aware of how our relationships with our phones have replaced our relationships with other people. And you pointed that out and how we pre-reject the world by hiding in our phones and hiding with our headphones on, and, and to be aware of every time I want to reach for it, and maybe think about it for a moment. 
before I do. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Right there. White. Yep. Keep your hands up so we see you as well for the next one. Yeah. So this weekend I'm hosting about a dozen friends from out of town, and I do this every year. Um, and I don't normally share this, but I actually find it a very vulnerable thing to do because I put so much planning and coordination and love into it, and then last minute people will cancel and not come, or I just get so disappointed and frustrated, yeah. and I now have a new lens of how to interpret why someone might recede or um, what I could say at the dinner table today to, to take the learnings I took from here and share it with the group that I'll be with later today. Thank you. So um, here's one little suggestion. Because it's one thing if people cancel days before, a week before, but when they start to cancel an hour before and they kind of make you feel like you put so much into it and they barely, they kind of had an afterthought, that's one thing about the ones who didn't come. You don't want to scold the ones that are there. So it's really about how much it means that, you know, what it, what it means for you that it means for them that it means for you. But basically, before you think about the food, the drinks, the appetizers, or anything else, you think about the meaning of why we are there. That's food as well, but it's food for the soul. Um, yep. Anyway. Yeah. So I really appreciated the distinction that you made between romance and sexuality, and that it's really okay to romanticize your friendships and to find that romantic love in it. Um, I think it gives a lot of permission to celebrate the friendships in your life and to give that gratitude that you would normally have reserved for a partner. Um, I think that was really refreshing. Thank you. Yeah. You know, there's a word we didn't use that actually connects to what you just said, which is ambiguity. There's, if, you, if you delve into the... the the depths of relationships, you have to be able to straddle these ambiguities. It's not always so clear and clear cut. But you, culturally speaking, this society likes more clean lines than ambiguous fields. Yes. Hi. Two more. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, something that really resonated with me is the point about like how hyper-connectivity. Where is he? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Hi, I'm right here. Ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I do have my glasses, but it doesn't seem to help. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to say, like, the point about how, how hyper-connectivity was a symptom of modern loneliness, like, really resonated with me. Um, and also, I feel like just, like, listening to you guys, I've learned a lot about, like, what, like, an authentic connection, an authentic relationship might look like. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to fit the confines of, like, platonic or, like, you know, romantic sexual. It can kind of be somewhere... Uh, in between, so yeah, thank you. What's your name? My name is Vihan. Vihan, do you yeah. have close friends? Yeah, I, I would <laughs> like to think so. <laughs> I'm glad you do. Yeah. No, I, I feel like this this kind of theme that we're we're getting at, which I think is an important one of blurring the lines, because sometimes we like learn one skill in one relationship and we don't realize it's transferable, right? Like, so to be in a romantic relationship, we needed to learn how to work through conflict, how to bring the issue up without attacking each other, how to hear each other out, right? And we don't realize, oh, that's a transferable skill to friendship, right? That I learned how to work through conflict. I could bring that to my friendships instead of just backing away and never talking to this person again. And so what I like about blurring the lines is it makes you realize your relationship capacities and your relationship skills in such a deeper way. And I, we purposefully or not purposefully did not mention gender and friendships because maybe I would like to believe um, with everything we know on the cultural front of that, that some of the things we talked about here are human and they transcend gender. So this is just to make clear that we are, I'm aware we didn't touch on that one. But we need to, there's one more? Where is, one more. where? Um, yes. Hi, uh, my name's Sarah. Hi, uh, Sarah. Um, so recently I went through a breakup uh, with my partner and it was a very complicated situation because I also had mutual friends, like all of my close friends were to the relationship. Yeah, exactly. So, um, the loss of one person is the loss of the village. Exactly. So everything was very connected, and I want to like 
Okay, that was like off topic, but um, <laughs> um, it's not and off now topic, the quiz. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I like the part where you said if you can't um, see your partner as a friend, then you sh it probably won't last. But I feel like it was also complicated because of that, because of the fact that we were friends at the core, and we also had many mutual friends. So yeah. Who had to choose? Yeah, basically. Ah, that's a bad one. Yeah. Um, yeah, first of all, like, sorry, that's really hard. It's really hard to lose, you know, your partner and to lose all of your connections at the same time. Um, and it might, I'm sure it feels like really, really, really devastating. And I, I hear you in that having a friendship, uh, being a friend is part of your relationship, or even people that have been friends first before they get into a relationship, that it feels like such a loss, because it's like, oh, I'm not just losing this romantic side of you, too. I'm also losing this part of you, this part of us that was friends. And it's interesting, I was actually hearing, listening to this podcast on, like, how queer people don't necessarily do, you know, queer people stereotypically can maintain friends with their exes so well. And they're like, it's like this idea that I can lose the romantic sense of the relationship, but I don't necessarily have to lose the platonic. And I can, um, you know, still access one dimension of the relationship even when I'm not able to access the other. But thank you so much for, for sharing your experience. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, and thank you, Marissa. I just, um, five more minutes, please. Five more minutes, please. We have one student reading a poem, and it would be so lovely if you could stay, and then we go into our lunch break. Uh, we have three breakout sessions, all happening on the second floor. Uh, a talk with the author, Claudia Baracci and Michael Weinman, and then um, we have a talk by Nelly Ben Hayoun and Roger Berkowitz is gonna join her. And we have another breakout with Angel, who you met yesterday. So they're all happening on the second floor. And now I'm thrilled to welcome our last student for a poetry reading. Um, her name is Hannah Park Kaufmann. She is studying math and piano, and she's going to read a German poem to us by Friedrich Hölderlin, Hymne an die Freundschaft. Uh, Friedrich Hölderlin was a poet who inspired Hannah Arendt deeply. She admired him. So please join me in welcoming um, Hannah Parkhoffmann. Thank you. Um, hi. Hymne an die Freundschaft means hymn to friendship. Rings in schwesterlicher Stille lauscht die blühende Natur. Aus des kühnen Herzens Fülle tönt des Bundes Stimme nur. Leise rauscht zum Eichenhaine, nie gefühlte Lüfte wehen, wo in höherem Sternenscheine wir das ernste Fest begehen. Ha, in süßem Wohlgefallen säuselt hier der Väter Schar, abgeschiedene Freunde wallen lächelnd um den Moosaltar. Und der hellen Tünderiden brüderliches Auge lacht, froh wie wir in deinem Frieden, schöne feierliche Nacht. Heiliger und reiner tönte dieser Herzenjubel nie, und der Schwur und Kuss verschönte Freundschaft, deine milde sie. Zürne nicht der Wonne zehren, lass, o oh lass uns huldigen, schönste von Olympus Heeren, Krone der Unsterblichen. Als der Geisterwunsch gelungen, und gereift die Stunde war, da von Ares Arm umschlungen Zytherea dich gebar. Als die Heldin ohne Tadel nun der Erde Sohn so nah, staunend in des Vaters Adel, in der Mutter Gürtel sah, da begann zu Sonnenhöhen nie versuchten Adlerflug, was von Göttern außersehen Kraft und Lieb im Busen trug. Stolzer Hub des Siegesflügel, rosiger der Friede sich, jauchzend um die Blumenhügel, grüßte Gram und Sorge dich. Blutend trug die Siegesfahne, in der Stürme Donner schwamm durch die wilden Ozeane, wer aus deinem Schoße kam. Deiner Riesenwehre klangen bis hinab zur alten Nacht, ha, des Orkus Tore sprangen zitternd deiner Zaubermacht. 
trunken wie von Hebesschale, kosten sie in süßer Rast, am ersehnten Opfermale nach der schwülen Tagelast. Göttern glich der Freunde Rächer, wenn die stolze Zähre sank in den vollen Labebecher, den er deinem Siege trank. Lieben stieg die Muse nieder, als sie in Arcadia dich im göttlichen Gefieder schwebend um die Schäfer sah. Mutter, Herz und Lippe brannten, feierten im Liede dich und am süßen Laute kannten jubelnd deine Söhne sich. In deinem Schoße schwindet jede Sorg und fremde Lust. Nur in deinem Himmel findet Sättigung die wilde Brust. Frommen Kindersinnes wiegen sich im Schoße der Natur. Über Stolz und Lüge siegen deine Auserwählten nur. Dank, o oh milde Segensrechte, für die Wonn und Heiligkeit. Für der hohen Bundesnächte süße, kühne Trunkenheit für des Trostes Melodien, für der Hoffnung Labetrank, für die tausend Liebesmühen, weinenden entflammten Dank. Siehe, Früchte und Äste fallen, Felsen stürzt der Zeitenfluss, freundlich winkt zu Minus Hallen bald der stille Genius. Doch es lebe, was hinieder Schönes, Göttliches verblüht, hier, o oh Brüder, Tünderrieden, wo die reine Flamme glüht. Ha, die frohen Geister ringen zur Unendlichkeit hinan, tiefer, ahndungsvoller dringen wir in diesen Ozean. Hin zu deiner Wonne schweben wir aus Sturm und Dämmerung, du, der Myriaden Leben heilig Ziel, Vereinigung. Wo in seiner Siegesfeier Götterlust der Geist genießt, Süßer, heiliger und freier Seelen, Seele sich ergießt, wo ins Meer die Ströme rinnen, singen bei der Pole klang, wir der Götter, Geisterköniginnen, schönster einst Triumphgesang. Uh, the lunch is outside, and uh, we'll see you back here at 2. Not 2.30 like yesterday, but 2. Thank you.
this and do this. So I, I know people are uh, still finishing up lunch breaks and buzzing from all the conversations and breakout sessions and everything else. So uh, my pleasure. I just want to, um, as we as we sprint towards the end, um, and it's been a, a long marathon, but it's been great. A, a couple quick announcements. Um, one. Uh, after the, there's two panels this afternoon, um, both uh, in some ways talking about Arendt and her friendships and friends. Um, but uh, after the final panel, which will end around 4.30, assuming we stay somewhat on time, which I hope we will, um, there's a reception over at what's called the Hessel Art Museum, which is a bit of a walk. It's probably about a 10 minute walk. There will be a shuttle meeting right outside uh, that if you don't want to walk, it's about a 10 minute walk across campus, it's a beautiful day. And uh, in the Hessel Art Museum, we've, uh, Nick Dunn has, uh, and, and Helene Teeger, the librarian at Bard, have taken uh, about 20 or 30 of the, of books from the Arendt Library uh, and put them on a display. And so as part of the reception over there, uh, along with your wine and your cheese, um, you'll get to learn a little bit about the Hannah Arendt Library and hear some scholars talking about um, Arendt's books and what they meant to her and how she took notes in them and what we can learn from some of that. And so um, we do invite you to join us uh, at uh, walk over there around 4.30 that, and then the discussion of the, uh, of the library will begin around five o'clock uh, at the Hessel Art Museum. Um, I want to again uh, thank uh, Tina Stanton. Um, yes, please. 
Uh, she's, she, she runs this conference, uh, really, uh, really makes it look like clockwork. I mean, when we first started doing this, she and I, and I mean, it was like, it was hell the week or two before, you know, like, how do you put this thing on? And, and now it's, I think it's only hell for her, but for me, it's actually quite calm. Uh, and I, I want to I thank her for that. Um, uh, Yana Mater, who, who's joined us uh, this year, has been great. Um, and Phil Lindsay, who does all the media and, and, and communications for the RN Center. And then Hillary Harvey, uh, who's our OSIN, uh, who runs all our OSIN programs. And we have the OSIN ambassadors here. Are some of the ambassadors here right now? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have the great students. Um, Tobias is here, has been helping out. Former students. I love it when Bard students come back. Charlotte Albert's been coming to this conference for eight or 10 years or something like that. Um, so thank you. Anyway, uh, all the student fellows. And then we have these folks who have been part of the RN Center community for years. Uh, Tomas Wild is our director of research at the RN Center. Um, Tomas, uh, this panel that we're about to have is, 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 uh, is the brainchild of, of, of Tomas and Jana Schmidt. Uh, Jana Schmidt was, was our director of academic programs last year and is now a professor of German studies along with Tomas. Um, and it's called The Risks of Correspondence. I love the title. I love both risks and correspondence. Um, Tomas Wild, who's the first person sitting here, uh, is a professor of German studies at Bard. Uh, he's the general editor of Hannah Arendt Complete Works, which is, if any of you have seen them, those often large, light blue tomes of um, Arendt's works edited in both English and German um, that are coming out, the complete works, and I mean complete works, of Hannah Arendt uh, in critical editions. Um, and there's also a website uh, that will have those editions on it, which is uh, amazing and, and I hope you'll, you'll pay attention to. He's the director of research at uh, the Hannah Arendt Center and a professor of German studies here. Uh, Jana Schmidt, uh, who's, uh, I'll do Ann Lauterbach is next. Uh, Ann Lauterbach uh, is in the written arts program here. She's uh, a multi-award winning poet her most recent book is called Door, and um, she's just a great poet, essayist, and friend, and uh, very excited um, to have her here. Uh, Jana Schmidt, uh, who has been, had more positions at the Anna Rent Center maybe than anyone else has ever had. Um, uh, Postdoctoral fellow, fellow, director of academic programming, and now just senior fellow. Uh, I think you, are you a senior fellow at the center or not? I don't even know. Um, but she's always going to be around, hanging on, and we like that. Um, and Thomas Barcher, who is, uh, has got a very fancy title. I always forget it. Uh, the Peter Sorian. Oh, I love Peter. Peter Sorian, senior lecturer in the humanities at Bard College. He's a senior fellow at the Hannah Arendt Center, and he is the co-editor of a book in the series Hannah Arendt Collective Works, which is about to come out on the life of the mind. Um, my pleasure to welcome them, and please enjoy the risks of correspondence. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, it works. We've been discussing if we stand or sit, and uh, the spontaneous mood says sitting, at least for me. <laughs> uh, welcome. In what follows, uh, Anne Lauterbach, Jana Schmidt, and I will, and Thomas Butcher, and I will present a pair of correspondence uh, to you. Each of us will uh, present uh, a pair of correspondence. A connecting theme of our panel um, is to look at correspondence also as a genre of friendship. It has come up quite a bit over those two days. And alongside with the essay, maybe the genre of correspondence has a particularly ample and nuanced knowledge about friendship. We will each talk for about 12-ish minutes, and after that uh, we would have a brief round of responses uh, to each other here on stage and then open it up uh, to conversation. At some point, 
in our presentations, each of us will share a question or two, which is also meant to be an offering for the discussion later. Now I have to do the clicking thing, let's see if that works. Okay. <laughs> Dear friends here and elsewhere, Jerry, if you're watching, hello. From the moment uh, we considered to discuss on the occasion of this conference and this panel letters between friends, and in particular those that would not merely celebrate friendship, but would confront us with difficult moments where tension and impasse may put a relationship at risk. This mysterious space of chance and possibility, I had thought of this correspondence between Ingeborg Bachmann and Paul Celan. I've been fascinated by their relationship as writers, as thinkers, as lovers, as friends, because it strikes me as an encounter in the profound sense of the word. Neither of them, as a person and as a poet, would be the same without the encounter of the other. Their works today belong to the most significant poetic oeuvres in the German language after 1945, and none of their works would be and would have the shape without encountering this other person. In 1951, which is three years after they met, there was suddenly a moment where their relationship was at risk, where history and politics is explicitly though subtly entered their encounter. A moment where entanglements or thresholds between the private and the public, the personal and the political, between love and friendship emerge and provoke thought about these very issues. I'd like to look with you at these moments, but how did Bachmann and Celan get there and how do we get there? So some context. Some of you might not have heard these names before, so please allow me a brief introduction of those two amazing poets and thinkers. Paul Celan was born in 1920 in Chernovitz, as the center of the multilingual Bukovina region in today's Western Ukraine. People there would speak Romanian, Hungarian, Polish, and like Celan's Jewish family, German. When the Nazis invaded and devastated the area, Paul Celan was abducted to a forced labor camp. He survived. His parents were deported by the Nazis too. They both were killed in an extermination camp. After the end of the war, Celan fled through several stops to Vienna. There he met Bachmann in 1948. That's why you don't want to sit, because it's complicated. Bachmann uh, grew up in Klagenfurt in the south of Austria. Her father joined the Nazi party early in 1932, so even a year before the Nazis came to power in Germany. Bachmann herself was a member of the Bund Deutscher Mädel, a Nazi youth organization for girls. By the end of the war, at the age of 19, she wrote short stories critical about the war and its unprecedented violence. After the end of the war, Bachmann went to Vienna as well to study philosophy. From there, she writes to her parents in May of 1948, I've somewhat set my eyes on the renowned poet Paul Celan. Things, things moved fast. Only three days later, she writes again to her parents that something glorious had happened to her. Paul Celan fell in love with me today, she writes. And given his love for Poppy, her apartment was overflowing with these flowers he kept bringing to her apartment. Yet there is also a challenge. Paul Celan will leave for Paris in less than a month. And as it turns out, he'll go to, on to live there for the rest of his life. The reason why Bachmann would refer to Celan as the renowned poet has to do with a poem that everybody had read at that time, Todesfuge, Death Fugue. Paul Celan wrote it in 1945, first published it two years later, and then again in 1952 in his book called Mon und Gedächtnis, Poppy and Recollection. It is one of the first and lasting responses to the Shoah by a survivor in the German language. And this is how it begins. Schwarze Milch der Frühe, wir trinken sie abends, wir trinken sie mittags und morgens, wir trinken sie nachts, wir trinken und trinken, wir schaufeln ein Grab in den Lüften, da liegt man nicht eng. Black milk of daybreak, we drink it at evening, we drink it at midday and morning, 
we drink at night, we drink and we drink, we shovel a grave in the air where you won't lie too cramped. John Felstener translates, and Michael Hamburger renders the same line as such. We dig a grave in the breezes, there one lies unconfined. Neither black milk nor the grave in the air are metaphors as they might first appear. They articulate in the most poetic and in the most descriptive way an unspeakable reality. Black milk, a so-called absolute metaphor, has no referent. It doesn't stand for anything else. It is what it is, and it speaks in the terms and the language coined in the camps for fetching milk, literally to blacken milk, a Yiddish word, milchschwärzen. The industrialized mass killing in the camps annihilated any handed down notion of death itself, no sight for mourning, millions of those killed, an endless void, we dig a grave in the breezes. My mother too had only this grave, Zelan once noticed in a letter to Bachmann when they corresponded about death fugue. This correspondence between Bachmann and Zelan is one of the most generative manifestations of addressed writing that I've ever seen. In certain phases, poems and poems will emerge from their letters, whole sections in their books, consist of vocabulary, wandering between letter and book and book and, uh, and letter. A most private and a most public speech, agile, mobile, fluidly moving. And at the same time, this correspondence is written by silences, by delays, by misunderstandings, by accusations, by hope, by calls with and without responses, by a desire and by an inability to find ways for being with one another. There's the notion of an undeniable, almost given shared task, and at the same time, the sense of a distance and difference that can't be overcome. How can I, as a reader of this correspondence, be friends with all these contradictions and incongruities without forcing them into an imposed, assumed clarity? Now, in March of 51, Ingeborg Bachmann writes a letter to Paul Celan. Paul, dear, Paul, lieber. And in this letter, she circumvents and addresses this, the trying question of their we. Du erwartest ja nicht, dass ich heute schon etwas zu uns beiden sage. I assume that you don't expect me to say. Dramatic gap. To say anything yet about the two of us. Bachmann and Celan are conventionally reg being regarded as lovers, but it looks if one looks more closely to the letters and their own struggles for words and take that seriously and into account, it's much more ambiguous and complex. In that very letter, at the beginning, Bachmann speaks about sickness and evokes a figure of resurrection, um, and one asks immediately what kind of longer arc or larger history is going on in this letter and charges it. She talks about war and this moment of stillness after the bombings where, she says, one didn't know what to say. And then there is this final paragraph that I try to zoom in on. No, we go back. <laughs> Schreibe mir bitte zuweilen. Schreibe mir nicht zu vag. Erzähle ruhig, dass der Vorhang vor unserem Fenster schon wieder abgebrannt ist und uns die Leute zusehen von der Straße. Please write to me occasionally. Don't write to me too vaguely. Feel free. Tell that the curtain at our window went up in flames again and that people watch us from the street. Picking up two light motifs of their correspondence, Bachmann urges Celan to write to her, not too vaguely. With the words to the painstakingly precise from the painstakingly imprecise, Celan dedicated a poem to Bachmann, which actually features as the first piece of their correspondence. So the first piece of correspondence is a poem, a dedicated poem. It is the deliberate and precise vagueness, this characteristically com composite clarity of poetic speech that Bachmann refers to in the following sentence. Feel free to tell the truth, to, sorry, feel free to tell that the curtain at our window went up in flames again and that people watch us from the street. Here she speaks with the words of Celan's poem, Corona. In this poem, Corona, the line reads, and you see it also on the slide, we stand at the window embracing they watch us from the street. It's time people knew. Note that Bachmann, in recollecting 
this line replaces embrace with a burning curtain. Before we get to the salutation, we encounter a sentence that was first typed and then struck out by hand, yet not erased all the way to the point of illegibility, as Celan will remark in his response. The ambiguously erased sentence reads as follows. Ob wir unsere Geleise zusammenlegen oder nicht, unsere Leben haben doch etwas sehr Exemplarisches, findest du nicht? Whether or not we make our tracks align, our lives bear, in, bear indeed something quite exemplary, don't you think? The visceral shock of these lines hasn't left me since I first read them. Unsere Geleise zusammenlegen, to put our tracks together, to make our tracks align. How can Bachmann write to Celan in these words that have become a cipher for an deportation? and that his parents became victim of. And what does she mean by the sehr exemplarische, the quite exemplary, that our lives, that unsere Leben are supposed to represent? Clearly, politics breaks into the relationship here, but how exactly? Let's see how Celan reads that and responds to it. My dear Inge, were I involved, how fascinating could it be, how sensible too, to pursue this double reaching beyond oneself, to chase this silhouette existence of our reality, dialectically charged, which nevertheless is fed with blood. I jump into German as I read the following section and then I will re-read it in an English translation. Indes, ich bin beteiligt, Inge, und so habe ich kein Auge für das, was du in jener sorgfältig durchgestrichenen aber doch nicht bis zur Unleserlichkeit getilgten Stelle in einem deiner Briefe das Exemplarische unserer Beziehung nennst. Wie auch sollte ich an mir selber Exempel statuieren? Gesichtspunkte dieser Art sind nie meine Sache gewesen. Mein Aug fällt zu, wenn es aufgefordert wird, nicht als ein Auge, nichts als ein Auge, nicht aber mein Auge zu sein. Wäre dies anders, ich schriebe keine Gedichte. Meanwhile, I am involved, Inge, and so I don't have an eye for that which you, in that meticulously crossed out passage, yet not erased all the way to the point of illegibility, call the exemplary of our relationship. How, after all, should I make an example of myself? Considerations of that kind have never been of my concern. My eye closes when it's summoned to be nothing but one eye instead of actually my eye. If this weren't different, I wouldn't be able to write poems. Celan vehemently rejects Bachmann's suggestion that their relationship might have an ex exemplary status. But why? Doesn't she, respectful to their identities and politically aware, hint to the fact that Celan as a Chuan survivor and she as a non-Chuan former Nazi youth member are indeed examples of their time and that the relationship could possibly represent a model also a model track into a promising future? Isn't this also a question for us today? How does identity and positionality matter in our relationships and interactions, personally and politically? And for a writer, as who and for whom do I speak when I write? How does writing make my weave of relationships to the world manifest, readable? Celan is adamant. If he were to be fixed to a predetermined position or identity to a respective exemplary view, this would mean an existential threat to him as a poet, as a writer. I have no eye for the exemplary, he says. He repeats the word I, Auge, or Aug, three more times, thereby introducing a notion of perspective, distance, and difference. My eyes close. My eye closes when it's summoned to be nothing but one eye, he says. And he counters Bachmann's figurations of oneness, the exemplary and the merging tracks being part of that. It is my eye that indeed is needed for writing, Celan says, my eye in its singularity, which yet is also a singularity of being singular plural. Their relationship could have ended here, but it didn't. It went on, they did not fall silent, they continued to respond. In this letter by Celan, which goes on for several pages, in their correspondence in general in the following year, 
years, they listen to one another, they keep the conversation, the Gespräch open and alive. Through their letters, but also, but not the least, through their poems, essays, and speeches. It is from this moment on in 1951 that Celan calls their relationship friendship. I don't mean to insinuate that they have finally arrived at friendship, rather that maybe their relationship opened up, expanded into this other mode, to this particular kind of conversation. Last words. Years later, Paul Celan in a speech reflects on the relationship between the poem and conversation. And if we listen carefully, we can hear how he's, how he's also thinking about politics here. And I like to think of it also as a late response to this moment in 1951. So Celan says in this speech, the poem becomes under what conditions conversation, often a desperate conversation. Only in the space of this conversation does the addressed constitute itself. But the addressed, which through naming has, as it were, become a you, brings its otherness into this present. Even in this here and now, in this immediacy and nearness, the poem lets the most essential aspect of the other speak. It's time. Thomas, are you going to click for me? <laughs> Hi. Um, so when we first thought about doing this panel, we were painfully aware that you cannot stage friendship. Um, we do this in private. Um, we have been meeting for years to read things together, but this is not replicable on a, on a public stage. Um, and part of the reason why it may not be replicable is because friendship isn't just um, peaches and cream. Is that what Americans say? Yeah, peaches and cream, right? Uh, it's not the other of war and violence and aggression, right? Friendship is complicated. So that was the beginning idea for the panel, I think, that to, to highlight the complications of friendships. And that's why every one of the pairs, I think, might debatably qualify as a friendship of sorts, but might also arguably not be a friendship at all. Um, sorry? No, no, that is not true of us. <laughs> um, well, we'll see how this panel goes. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the relationship between the much spoken of Hannah Arendt, who lies in a grave just over there, I think, or I have a bad sense of orientation, somewhere behind us. Um, uh, she's buried here, is what I'm trying to say. And um, her friend, um, the Austrian modernist writer Hermann Broch. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit first about them individually, um, because I'm not assuming that you know um, particularly Hermann Broch. Um, I'm, I, I, I guess I'm not going to introduce Hannah Arendt because you've been bothered with that enough. Um, so, Hermann Brach was a prominent um, Austrian Jewish modernist writer who was forced to flee the Nazis in the late 1930s, both because he was Jewish and because he was caught with, caught, uh, with illegal, uh, or, or uh, he was persecuted for having socialist materials on him. He was arrested. So, he um, escaped uh, to the United States in the late 1930s and found refuge there, but could, could never quite settle um, again. Uh, so like many um, refugees um, uh, in, in general and, and of this generation, um, he couldn't quite make a home here. The, the contrast was just too stark. Uh, he also led a very unhappy long-distance marriage. 
he was being he was completely uprooted from his Viennese circles uh, and habits, from his language, um, and he found it impossible to find stable employment in the U.S. So it made him a kind of permanent exile, and not by volition, I think, uh, which is a little bit different in the case of Arendt, who was also a kind of permanent exile, but in some ways by, affirma by, by the way that she affirmed being um, a stranger in this country. Um, so Brach survived the last years um, of his life on the kindness of strangers uh, and of, of his much more successful friends, friends like Albert Einstein um, in Princeton and New Haven, where he also died in 1951. Um, and you can see them here, uh, well, uh, on the screen. Um, uh, I think that's Brach um, in his final abode uh, and Arendt teaching. Hannah Arendt and Broch met at a party in New York uh, in 1946, when Arendt was in her 40s and Broch in his 60s. We can surmise from the letters that Broch, who was known to be a ladies' man, uh, failed um, and very distinctly failed to woo Arendt, um, who begged him to make an exception just this once. Uh, that, that exception was friendship. So despite their different, very different philosophical convictions, Arendt and Broch did in fact become friends for a brief and, and intense period um, from 1946 to 51. They shared work quite intensely on human rights, on the conditions of democracy, on the problem of rebuilding the war devastated countries and on the United Nations, the formation of a, which was then only an idea, you realize, right? The United Nations, um, and on the legacies of totalitarianism. But Arendt always particularly applauded Broch's work as a novelist, which she considered to be of much greater consequence than his theoretical work. After his sudden death, uh, Arendt also made sure that Broch's papers were categorized uh, accessibly at the Yale University Library, where they are now, and she continued to write about her friend's literary remains, which I think is a kind of um, a significant and ultimate service to a friend to make sure that their legacy um, is, is taken care of, so to speak. In 1951, Arendt, writing about her friend in her thought notebook, on the occasion of, of his sudden passing, tried to sum up the ambivalent feelings stirred by this friendship. Her entry asks how to live with the dead friend, how not to feel a sense of betrayal in having survived. She speaks of the umgedrehtes Fühlen, um, uh, the, the umgedrehtes fühlen, appended, inverted, or twisted feeling the friend's death causes. And I think she speaks of this kind of twisted feeling because she's so painfully aware of the ambivalent and negative emotions that came up, uh, that, uh, sorry, that come up when an address is no longer possible or, or falls on deaf ears. So the entry is a letter that never arrives that cannot arrive anymore. It describes the condition of survival which Arendt also tries to capture in the poem that she addresses to, Bo to Broch after his death. And I'm gonna read the poem first in English and then in the original German for the benefit of the fet fetishists. <laughs> survival, this is from June 1951. Yet, how do you live with the dead? Say, where is the sound that settles their roaming? What the gesture when we, in being judged by them, wished that closeness itself should fail? Who knows the lament that moves them further and draws a veil over hollow gazing? Of what help is sending ourselves into their absence and twist, twists the feeling learned by survival? This is my extremely, extremely inadequate translation of this impossible to translate poem. Um, Arendt was not a poet. Um, 
but I think this, this is a poem that expresses the complexity of her feelings quite well. Um, Überleben. Wie aber lebt man mit den Toten? Sag, wo ist der Laut, der ihren Umgang schwichtet? Wie die Gebärde, wenn durch sie gerichtet, wir wünschen, dass die Nähe selbst sich uns versag. Wer weiß die Klage, die sie uns entfernt und zieht den Schleier vor das leere Blicken? Was hilft, dass wir, wir uns in ihr Fortsein schicken und dreht das Fühlen um, das Überleben lernt? So there are many things to note about this poem, um, but just two things. First, the prominence of bad feelings. Um, this could be attributed merely to the fact of death, um, to what death does to feelings after a friend dies. But I think the poem and the entry also reveals um, that death magnifies ambivalent feelings that were already present in the friendship. This is highlighted by the question the poem, the questions the poem seeks, seems to raise. Questions like, how does the friend's death twist her feelings? How does it turn remorse into anger, tenderness into bitterness, and love into a kind of sadness? Secondly, the word umgang and the word schicken. Um, Umgang is German for, uh, I translated it as roaming, but more literally it means commerce or interaction. And I think it carries here the senses of interaction, friendship, handling, haunting, but also of correspondence. Schicken, which means sending, to send, uh, underlines this dimension of correspondence, of, of, of literally sending a letter. So Arendt's epigram, which originally means an inscription on a gravestone, um, is dedicated to the problematic feelings that arise from exceptional, from the exceptional relation of friendship, the exceptional and very common relation, I should say. So I'm interested in these negative emotions, uh, both during friendship and after. What do we do with them? Um, I think we tend to repress them as adults, right, when we speak of friendship as a safe haven, as a warm, fuzzy feeling. But I think friendship, uh, if, particularly if you remember your early friendships, your girl friendships, let's say, is full of, of jealousy and projection and anger and identification and ambivalence and fe feelings of disappointment. Um, yeah, so what do we do with negative feelings in friendship? How is it um, that the very feelings which distance us from ourselves, inferiority, remo remorse, guilt, en envy, and anger in this case, uh, in a friendship may also be the ones that incline us towards the world, in a sense. And is that true? Are difficult feelings in our intimate relationships perhaps precisely the ones that can incline us towards the world in a larger sense? The question of disappointment that came up um, in the first panel is interesting in this regard because we seek to avoid disappointment and thereby avoid relationships, essentially. But we can also see that disappointment is built into our relationships and that it may also be something that compels us towards greater community, towards caring for the world. The other question that this phenomenon of bad feelings, um, which are so prevalent in friendships, raises is, what happens to the world relationship that a friendship models when a friend dies. I think I'm interested in what happens to the particular address, the quality of which is so different in every friendship. This to me has a specificity unlike any other relation. It seems like only the friend can truly read the friend. Arendt's entry finally raises the difficult problem of carrying Brach, Brach's work forward in its singularity. So the question of legacy. 
And she uses the literary figure um, of Chiasmus, chi um, chi chiasm? Chiasmus, friend, um, Chiasmus, which is carried through her entire entry, um, so her diary entry, um, and in some ways the poem um, uh, to register what the French philosoph philosopher Jacques Derrida says. Um, he, he calls it the dissymmetry that can be interiorized only by exceeding, fracturing, wounding, injuring, traumatizing the interiority that it inhabits or that welcomes it through hospitality, love, or friendship. I'm going to read that again. So um, he speaks of the dissymmetry, a dissymmetry, um, that can be interiorized only by exceeding, fracturing, wounding, injuring, traumatizing the interiority that it inhabits, or that welcomes it through hospitality, love, or friendship. This is how he describes the task of mourning a friend. Derrida defines the failure of mourning, and it's already having started before the friend dies as constitutive of friendship. The temporality of letter writing acknowledges this in a unique way because, for one, you never know whether a letter will reach its destination. Letter writing is anticipatory in this sense. It's acting in advance of knowing. And with and in spite of bad feeling. So my larger question for us to look at, um, to bring this question of correspondence to the question of the world and having a world is how can we cultivate forms of hope that exist precisely in relation to bad feelings now? Thank you. What we have here is a failure to communicate. Those who are uh, fans of Hollywood might recognize that from a 1967 film, Cool Hand Luke, which I only saw very recently, actually, but it's been on my mind uh, as I've prepared for this panel. And um, it, act, I, it, but I didn't know it long before that. As a child, it was it was in the air somehow. It was a, a meme. Uh, removed from its original context that um, took on various meanings uh, throughout my life. It was somehow set around the house a lot and then uh, by friends. And uh, preparing for this panel, I realized that it took on another uh, kind of meaning. What the pair of, the pair of authors I'm going to be talking about, those guys, um, I think one of the things that they suggest or uh, invite us to think about is, or maybe I'll put it this way, I think one of the central things in their correspondence is the question of the failure, of the failure to communicate. And one way of thinking about it might be whether their relationship represents a failure to communicate or whether it's a failure of communication as an ideal. So that's what I'll be talking about. Before I get to that, I wanted to thank everyone at the Arendt Center for making this possible, to the, my fellow panelists who are a constant source of pleasure and inspiration, and um, to the global ambassadors that I've had the great, they're in the audience today, um, Roger mentioned them, and I've had the great pleasure of working with them over the past couple of weeks. I'm very glad you're here. And everything else I'll, I'll have to say with your indulgence is uh, I have to turn to my script from now on. The letter exchange between two 20th century German philosophers, am I audible? Back there, okay. Karl Jaspers and Martin Heidegger was not the first thing to come to my mind when I began to think about the conjunction of friendship, politics, and correspondence in preparation for this panel. 
I thought first of letters written by political founders, the letters of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, the letters between John Adams and Abigail Adams, or the letters that Václav Havel, the Czech playwright, political dissident, and later the first communist president of, uh, post-communist president of Czechoslovakia, wrote while imprisoned in the 1980s to his fellow dissident and wife, Olga Havlova, or also the collection of extraordinary letters that Nelson Mandela wrote during his long imprisonment in South Africa. But as uh, Jana suggested, the, in the conversations we had, in fact, in the first conversation about this panel, before we had even come up with the title, our consideration turned toward the question of friendships in distress, friendships that uh, have come to an end. And so I began to think about examples of correspondences that track the frictions and failures of friendship. And it was this that brought me to Jaspers and Heidegger. As I read the correspondence, a twofold question began forming for me. And this is my question. The first, um, and I, actually I should say uh, that um, it occurred to me this morning, I was surprised, um, although perhaps I shouldn't have been, by how often the speakers at this conference have referred to or even focused on correspondence. Roger opened with a reference to Arendt's correspondence with Sholem. Marie Louisa talked about the letters to Ellison, uh, to Al the letter from Ellison, uh, to Ellison from Arendt, and in that conversation, the Baldwin letter came up as well. This morning, Leon Botstein spoke about uh, David Kettler's book on first letters after exile. So it seems like we weren't uh, the only ones who were thinking about letters, uh, correspondence in relation to friendship and politics. So again, uh, my question, as I began to read the correspondence between Jaspers and Heidegger, a twofold question began to form for me. First, in a general sense, that's relevant for all of these examples of correspondence, not just the ones I'm speaking about. What do letters that are exchanged between friends reveal or disclose about friendship that might be difficult to see otherwise? that might otherwise be invisible or obscure or illegible? What do we see or learn about friendship when we attend to the letters that friends exchange with one another? And the second part of the question is whether the loss of friendship, its breaking apart, might in some way be particularly illuminating. I think that's sort of an implicit assumption in what we've been doing. What might we learn about friendship by attending to the failures of friendship. And in the case of Jaspers and Heidegger, um, the, the case of Jaspers and Heidegger were, was particularly interesting because it played out against the backdrop of political events of such great pitch and moment. So my intention now is to say something about the relationship between Jaspers and Heidegger to provide some orientation. This, I realize, will be very familiar to some in the room and probably entirely unfamiliar to others. So I'm sure I'm going to be saying both uh, much too much and not at all enough. I hope I'll disappoint almost everyone. Uh, the heart of my contribution, however, is to read in its entirety a short letter written in 1959. It's the last but one of the letters that Jaspers sent to Heidegger. And then I'll close with a couple of thoughts from Aristotle. Karl Jaspers lived from 1883 to 1969, Martin Heidegger from 1889 to 1976. So Jaspers was six years older than Heidegger. Both mi uh, migrated to philosophy from other disciplines, Jaspers from medicine and psychology, Heidegger from theology. In the years prior to the Second World War, both had achieved great prominence as teachers and as authors. They met in 1923, uh, 1920, also at a party, and almost immediately uh, they were allies of one another. They were united in their opposition to the reigning school of philosophy, the reigning schools of philosophy at the time, neo-Kantianism being a particularly significant example. To both Jaspers and Heidegger, philosophy was to be understood not as a matter of doctrine and system, but as an activity and as a way of life. 
They were, even from the begin there were, even from the beginning, serious disagreements between them, which grew greater and clearer as time went on. But there was still a deep kinship. Reading their correspondence, one senses that for Jaspers, at least, Heidegger represented the, the rare possibility of a genuine friendship, what Aristotle would call a complete or perfect friendship. I'm not sure, though, if Heidegger ever regarded Jaspers in the same way. And I want to acknowledge now that uh, I'm very far from an authority on, these, on this correspondence. Uh, there are probably people in the room who know it much better than I do, and I'd uh, welcome the, your, your input. It's a substantial correspondence. There are about 150 letters. It's, com it, it's a complex, intricate weave of history, both public and private, and philosophy. Most of it is deeply intriguing, at least to me, and some of it is deeply obscure to me. And I'm, rel I'm relatively new to the material, so caveat emptor. That said, my impression is that what Jaspers saw as the promise or possibility of genuine friendship, of philosophical friendship, was not seen the same way by Heidegger. Jaspers and Heidegger, however, I'll say more about that as I, as I proceed. Jaspers and Heidegger, however, remained correspondents and allies throughout the 1920s and the early 1930s. And Heidegger was, in fact, a regular guest at the home of Jaspers and his wife. Jaspers' wife, I should mention, was Jewish. In 1933, of course, things changed. In April, Heidegger was elected rector of Freiburg University, so that's, in effect, the chief administrative officer, and 10 days later, he joined the Nazi party. According to Jasper's subsequent account, written many years later, a turning point came when Heidegger visited Heidelberg, where Jasper's was teaching, in June of 1933. Heidegger was there, Jasper's wrote, as a national socialist, quote unquote. While he was in Heidelberg, Heidegger stayed with Jasper's and his wife, and Jaspers recounts in his memoir that he had said to Heidegger on that 1933 visit, and this is a quote, today is just like 1914. Jaspers meant by that th that the country was once again gripped by the same mass psychosis that preceded World War I. Heidegger, however, understood the remark dis differently according to Jaspers. Jaspers implies that Heidegger, Heidegger saw this not as an ominous, but as an auspicious moment. Jaspers proceeds to write, quote, then it struck me, I did not trust him, and I became silent. This would be the last time that the two men would see one another. I don't have time now to go into um, to go into the details of Heidegger's involvement with the Nazi movement, which in any case is a matter of a great deal of scholarship and debate. For, the purposes, for our purposes, I may simply summarize what Jaspers said in a letter that he wrote to the Freiburg University Denazification Committee in 1945. Heidegger was, seeking to Heidegger was seeking to retain his position at the university and had asked Jaspers to be consulted as a character witness. Jaspers responded with a, with a letter to the commission in which he recounted his knowledge of Heidegger having, in 1933, written a letter that criticized a colleague for insufficient loyalty to the Nazi party and for associating with Jewish professors. Jaspers also wrote that Heidegger was, this is a quote, not an anti-Semite in 1920, but by 1933 he had become an anti-Semite, at least Jaspers adds, in certain connections. He also writes that Heidegger must be held accountable for contributing to the Nazification of the universities. At the same time, however, Jaspers wrote in admiration, in the same report, in admiration of Heidegger's philosophical work. I quote, his extraordinary intellectual achievement can be, justifi can be a justifiable reason for making it possible for him to carry on with his work, but not for the continuation of his office and teaching activities. And in this letter, Jaspers expressed, and in this letter, 
Jasper gives the committee express permission to share key portions of, of the letter with Heidegger. So the letter that's sent privately to the committee on, public, uh, on official record, the committee is welcome to send on to Heidegger. After the war, Jaspers and Heidegger have no correspondence until February of 1949, when Jaspers finally breaks the silence. In his first letter to Heidegger, he writes, quote, there was once between us something that bound us together. I cannot believe that it has been extinguished without remainder. Jaspers refers directly to the letter he wrote to the Denazification Committee back in 1945 and says that he assumes Heidegger has seen this letter. Jaspers goes on to say, we strive for something very different in philosophy. We, you and I, Jaspers and Heidegger, we strive for something very different in philosophy and have a philosophical self-consciousness of character that is alien to one another. But he also expresses a guarded hope that they may still, quote, exchange a few words in philosophizing. The story that unfolds in the correspondence over the next 10 years is fascinating, and it defies, it defies a brief summary. I have a relatively brief summary here, which I'm going to skip, because it's not even brief enough. But I'll emphasize that in that conversation between the two of them in that correspondence after the war, a central theme from Heidegger is solitude, and a central theme from Jaspers is communication and the attempt for communication. And this comes up again and again, and um, the, the term communication comes up in both letters. Jaspers always expressing hope for it, Heidegger always expressing skepticism about it. This brings me to the letter that I'd like to read. And I apologize for the not great uh, slide. Dear Heidegger, this is September 22nd, 1959. I send you my greetings and best wishes for your 70th birthday. Both are sincere for the remembrance at this moment of a distant, noble past makes my personal feeling for you, which now had to remain silent for a long time, speak more strongly. This is, uh, I should emphasize, the second to last letter, it's the last substantial letter that Jaspers writes to Heidegger. Since 1933, a desert has lain between us, which seemed to become ever more unpassable with what happened and what was said later. After this, which has become well known, a private meeting without preceding clarity could, as I perceive, help but little. Philosophy itself would have to speak. We are getting old, and I am not inconsiderably older than you. Perhaps what is appropriate remains unsaid. I stand before you with empty hands and can today only wish that you are granted an evening of life that is more fulfilling, more thoughtful, more and more productive. I'll skip the last bit of that letter to say simply, um, in book eight of, this is my closing remark, in book eight of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, as many of you will recall, Aristotle distinguishes between three types of friendship, those based on utility, those based on shared pleasure, and those based on virtue. Only the last, he argues, may be considered complete or perfect friendship. And for philosophers, at least, the constitutive activity of complete friendship is the activity of philosophizing together. When Aristotle later comes to reflect on how friendships dissolve, he writes, quote, most differences arrive among friends when the sort of friends they suppose themselves to be is not the same as the sort of friends they actually are. One way to read the post-war correspondence between Jaspers and Heidegger is to see it as an attempt to figure out what sort of friends they had been, and as the gradual and poignant realization that the sort of friends they supposed themselves to be was not the same as the sort of friends they actually were. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? So happy to be here and um, to share this stage with my dear friends and with all of you. Um, I came to the decision of talking about uh, Hannah Arendt and Mary McCarthy quite late uh, in our conversations. I was going to talk about another correspondence between Paul Salon uh, and one of his lovers, and then I decided that on a small panel, maybe Paul Salon didn't really deserve two outings. Um, and then there was another reason, which is that out of the four of us, I'm the only person who doesn't speak German and thought maybe it would be good for me to uh, speak to you about at least one person who had uh, English as a first language. And then finally, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, presence uh, of men in these conversations. And I thought, well, uh, there was one extraordinary correspondence and friendship uh, that Hannah Arendt had with a woman, uh, Mary McCarthy. So with all of that as preamble, um, it was, uh, <laughs> This slide shows you on one side the cover of the book of um, the, the collected letters, and on the other, that's my copy of it with all these blue little things in them. That's because I was trying to decide what in the world I could possibly draw out of this amazing, amazing correspondence. Um, there's something about two women, maybe even, I want to say, writing to each other over a long period of time, both of whom are, are terrific writers. Uh, every single page is filled with a kind of um, vitality and alertness that um, is really quite remarkable. The friendship between Hannah Arendt and Mary McCarthy was not a given. They came from radically different backgrounds and were temperamentally unlike. McCarthy was emotionally restless, volatile, and often sharply critical. Arendt was even keeled, happily married, and more circumspect in her judgment of others. McCarthy, novelist and memoirist, was drawn to descriptions of persons and places as revelation of character. Arendt, cultural and political theorist, was interested in, well, the human condition. One might say that Arendt is the generalist and McCarthy the particularist, and yet we might also say that they shared a disposition, a strong interest in how writing captures and relays political and social ideas across cultures and times. They were ultimately both interested in the nature of knowledge in relation to truth and to the possibilities for justice in a time not unlike our own when such questions were under constant and often frightening pressure. Above all, they each liked to think about thinking and writing as the work of the intellect, but also as a way of contending with the passional eruptions and turmoils of life, love, betrayal, disappointment, loss, hope, and despair. Their correspondence began in 1949 and continued until November 12, 1975, when McCarthy, ill in Paris, dictated a letter to Arendt in New York. Less than a month later, on 4th December, Arendt died of a heart attack. I need the water. I need the water. This is just pretend drama on my part. I don't care. It was extremely difficult to decide what to share with you today. 
Their correspondence offers many different tones and subjects and changes over the years as their, as their friendship deepens and their work receives increasing, and their work incre receives increasing public attention, not all of it positive. At last, I decided on an early exchange, as I think it lay a foundation for what followed. McCarthy, writing from Wellfleet, Massachusetts, on August 10th, 1954, asks Arendt about the philosophical history of doubt as an aspect of moral decision-making. I think doubt and risk are related to each other. She is working on her novel, this is Mary McCarthy, is working on her novel, A Charmed Life, in which a character is constantly asking, how do you know that? McCarthy then elaborates, quote, this pseudo questing, question, questing or stupid thoughtfulness is getting more and more general in modern society, I think. The average man, mistrustful and cunning, is an intellectual of sorts. He doubts like a burlesque of a philosopher and has a craving for information that's like the craving for sugar. I see this and I'm trying to describe it, but what I don't know and would like to talk to you about is how and when it happened historically. She then concludes, aren't all modern philosophies, logical positivism, existentialism, neo-Thomism, philosophical relativism, whatever that is, exactly evasions or attempts to circumscribe the epistemological question, like the return to religion, which is depressing, chiefly because nobody really believes in it. It is just another form of doubt. In this sense, she concludes, Marxism surely is an anachronism as a, phil as a political philosophy. It has nothing to do with modernism, at least that I can see. So, um, it's pretty heady, right? Arendt begins her reply, written from the house that she and her husband, Heinrich Blücher, who taught here at Bard, as you probably know, shared in, Palin, in Palinville, New York. Dearest Mary, your letter was a real joy. <laughs> Only when I got it did I notice I had been expecting it. Let me go into the midst of it and leave the ends and odds for later. So the ends and odds are the personal stuff. <laughs> she then writes an extraordinary reply, not only to the question of doubt, but to the fundamental question with which McCarthy had begun the letter. Why should I not kill my grandmother if I want to? Such and similar questions, Arendt writes, were answered in the past by religion on one side and common sense on the other. She then elaborates these, ending with the French brand of modernity, Cartesian doubt. She continues, what both the French and the English tradition have in common is what I like, is what I think is the root of modernity. What the, both the French and the English tradition have in common and what I think is the root of modernity is the distrust in the senses, which probably was the immediate result of the great discoveries of the natural sciences, which demonstrate demonstrated that human senses do not reveal the world as it is, but on the contrary, lead men only into error. From this followed the perversion of common sense, or rather the misgivings about it in its sensual quality, which is that common sense, the bon sens, is a kind of sixth sense through which all particular sense data given by the five senses are fitted into a common world, a world which we can share with others, have in common with them. Common sense, in other words, was the control instance for the possible errors of the five other senses. 
the average life is led in a world where given by senses and controlled and guided by common sense. If this common sense is lost, there is no common world any longer. In her response to this long letter, McCarthy writes, your letter was a joy and an act of munificence. Her husband, B Bowden, she tells Arendt, went to the library in Newport where they were staying and returned with stacks of Kant and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. The idea of common sense giving rise to a common world in which the five senses are all engaged lay the groundwork for their friendship allowing it to evolve into one of care and concern for each other's well-being. They see each other whenever they can and speak on the phone, and between these visits, they write. Their bond, I think, was made more intense by the fact that they were women of rare intelligence and ambition in a world dominated by men, many of whom they thought to be fools. And there's this wonderful, ongoing, constant, condemnation of many of these very, very well-known intellectual characters that were part of their milieu. McCarthy traveled often and had a series of love affairs. When she, met, when she met Arendt, she was married to her third husband and would leave him when she fell in love with her fourth, James West, who was married with children, an episode she shares with Arendt in candid detail. These, she worries, are both boring and tedious for Arendt. This happens over and over again. She has a long, long description about her affective life and then says, I hope I'm not boring you or I'm afraid I'm boring you. Um, I have a sense that Arendt was glad to be so entrusted, but that she was also a little bewildered at the American habit of assuming int intimacy before the fact. At one point, McCarthy tells Arendt that she has altered a prurient sex scene in one of her books out of consideration for Arendt's feelings. Each of them was able, often in a single letter, to speak about and share their progress or lack thereof of her own writing, encounters with and concerns about mutual friends, the weather, responses to books and articles, as well as to public political events in the news. They often critique each other's work without fear of wounding or offending. At one point, McCarthy spends an entire paragraph instructing Arendt on the difference between that and which in English grammar. Wish I could ever figure that out myself. As events in the world became more turbulent in the 60s and 70s, assassinations, Watergate, student protests, the Vietnam War, their public writing lives become more vulnerable and their need for each other's care and support more evident. February 9th, 1968. Dearest Mary, each time I receive a letter from you, I realize how much I miss you. Times are lousy and we should be closer to each other. I guess I have been depressed all winter. The daily news are like being hit over the head. And later in the same letter, I have a feeling of futility in everything I do. Compared to what is at stake, everything looks frivolous. I know this feeling disappears when I let myself fall into that gap between past and future, which is the proper temporal locus of thought. Letters are a form of conversation by other means. Between friends separated by time and space, they relied on tacit understandings and prior knowledge. The sound of a person's voice, the color of eyes and hair, demeanor and gesture, habits of being. The sensuous tactility of letter writing, choice of paper, pen, etc., gave a sense of physical nearness and contributed, I think, to what Arendt meant when she speaks of an overriding common sense. My first question is obvious. Has technology inhibited the quality of exchanges between friends? 
and so the creation of Arendt's idea of a shared common world. Secondly, has the immediacy of the internet enhanced or jeopardized our ability to develop self-knowledge through the slow unfolding of respect, trust, love, and care for others? Thank you. We started 15 minutes uh, later than we had planned. I let the higher powers uh, think for a moment how much uh, more time we have for the discussion that uh, I think we would like to open up right away to comments and questions from the audience. So this is a question for any of you. Um, I'm also extremely interested in friendship manifesting itself in writing. And here we've seen examples of writing that takes the form of philosophical exploration. And earlier in the morning, we spoke about this attempt at touching each other with words. Um, and this all makes me wonder about what you think the role of eloquence in writing is in friendship. And I'm interested in part because it obviously has repercussions as to who can be friends, or at least who can be friends of this particular kind, because we know that linguistic precision in writing, it's, it's contingent on class, it's contingent on, on education. Um, and we have spoken about mental health slash relational crises uh, in this conference. But another crisis that people speak about is the one in ability of precise um, written expression. Um, so I'm also, I would be interested to hear you speculate, and I think it relates to what um, the last panelist rose about, um, how digital media takes us away from the long form um, and doesn't force us in the same way to, um, or allow us the same amount of time that it takes to be precise and to attempt to touch the other um, with words. Um, but yeah, I would be interested to hear what, you, what you're thinking about the role of, of written language and eloquence. Um, thank you. Uh, it's interesting you use that word eloquence um, because it's so particular to a certain idea about language, isn't it? Um, and I think um, I think for for writing or correspondence to be effective between friends, it doesn't have to be eloquent. It does need to have uh, something like what I think they uh, Arendt and McCarthy had, which is a kind of candor and a will to say and a fearlessness. So that place of trust in writing seems more important to me than eloquence per se. Um, and I think that uh, something we haven't really, that's indicated maybe in all of our conversations and has been one of the themes of the, of the conference has to do with the difference between private and public, right? So there's one of the characteristics of a letter is that it is ex extremely private. So you can trust what you say when you write a letter that it's going to go to that person if it arrives. That one person will read it and somebody else won't. And I think that one of the reasons where, where our ability to be candid and truthful and open with our friends now is that that's not so assured, right? That you can send an email that's not very, it's not clear that that email is not going to be sent on to somebody else and so on. So there's something about the the privacy of a letter, uh, as well as um, the other part, which which I'm really interested in, which is this expansiveness. In other words, that the, 
It's not, a, letters were very, very rarely about expedience, like, uh, you know, this one thing is going, we're talking about this one thing. This kind of wonderful ability for uh, a letter to um, not so much digress, but actually to include, so to move around a whole, a whole sense of a world rather than just one particular, like, what are you doing Wednesday? That, that thing. I'll, I'll just add one thing to that. The, you, know, you use the word and candor, and I think also care uh, comes to mind because it's, it, someone might have been at the beginning, Roger might have said this, that one way of thinking about friendship is creating a common world, and a lot of that is created through language, and the care that one takes in writing is that's the world you're building to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's really important. I think the technology, technological shift bears on that in interesting ways. We again want to encourage uh, students to ask if they feel like it. I, I'm a senior written arts student, and I just want to thank you for um, the focus on correspondence and get your um, take on what will happen to the record of friendship in the literary and the academic and the philosophical community with the advent of the digital um, space that we communicate in now, how will we get books like this? What, you know, do, what do we have as a responsibility as writers to continue to correspond to create this record of how friendships happen and how how will we have a record of how friendships happened in the 21st century one technical <laughs> remark the uh, literary archive in marbach in germany for example uh, the biggest literary archive in europe they have made attempts to um, encourage or convince writers to blind copy their email correspondence to a, um, to a protected server. And uh, um, unfortunately so far, apparently this encouragement has mostly failed. So your question I think is, very, is a very urgent one uh, when it comes to the your question, what, where is the archive of knowledge, of knowledge about friendship that we have in the traditional letter now? Um, I'll just uh, say also that there's, there are multiple sides to this too. I think a lot of things that used to happen orally happen in text now. So there's, on the other side, there's a lot more writing and some of that can be preserved. So it's, it's a really interesting question. I think it's not only a question of things being lost, but also other things being gained and also uh, the way that drafts are maybe lost or maybe preserved um, electronically is, uh, that's I think really at play. There's also, I think, the, maybe the fundamental question. Um, I mean, I know of archives like at the Beinecke where they're going to collect all the digital, digital correspondence as well as the written, but the quality of the, when I said before, the kinds of things that are said in most exchanges between friends even are so much more limited than this other thing. And that has to do, I think, with this thing I tried to get get at, which is the kind of physical um, a relation of the hand to the pen or to the typewriter, to the paper, to the, to the licking of the stamp, to the writing of the address, all of that is involved with a kind of nearness that simply just cannot be transferred into a machine. Um, so even though they're going to have these vast collections back and forth among writers, they're not going to have the same kind of um, uh, that the, the strange way in which the tactility of, of, the, of maybe it's a fetishism actually, our desire for, for the handwriting and so on. We're, we're fascinated by that. So maybe that will just go away. But I think it's really about this, this, this limit, limit space of correspondence where you just simply never th sit and and wander around in the whole world that you're in with, with when you're writing 
to somebody on a, on a machine. Maybe that will also change. Maybe that will evolve. Young people in the room, as you go on, write long, boring letters to your friends and 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 expand and and digress and 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 say, oh, that reminds me of something else and something else and see whether what happens. I think it's a good idea. It's maybe also an interesting way to consider the question of common sense, right? This this problem of the digital age and organization, because like you said, we have much more in writing in a way, and it's already written. We don't have to transcribe it. We don't have to decipher it, you know. But um, but this idea of a sense of a sense, right? Like what gives us a sense of the sense rather than just senses right. is, is the right. question. Right. So, um, yeah, I have a question. I'm glad you talked about letters as being a, a private correspondence because these are public intellectuals and, and these are public letters. I mean, they're preserved and then they were published. So does the fact that these, these you know, and, and in many cases their friendship was carried on in publication, in poems that were for the public but also meant as private correspondences, is there a tension between public friendship and, and private friendship, or, or does the publicness of this relationship complicate the account of, of their friendships? That would be my question. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, because I was going to say something in response to this question about what's going to be lost, and uh, I feel very keenly, and and even towards one of the people on the stage here, that I do not want to write letters or long emails to that person because I don't want them to go to the Beinecke Library. So I only write texts because I don't want that to become something public. And I feel that even the risk um, of it becoming public uh, changes the relationship of what I'm going to write, and I'm very aware of that. So it's it's interesting that you talk about the the privacy. Uh, I, I, I think about that all the time. Uh, I think in the case of Arendt and and McCarthy, that one of the things that's so surprising about this exchange is that they they were both entirely aware of their public face and they were entirely capable of not letting that intrude on their response to each other. And also, they, they shared their each work, and they also responded to the public response to their work. So they would share their despair if there was a bad review, or they would say they disagreed with it. So there was this sort of wonderful way in which they managed that public-private space. And they, and at no point do I ever have the feeling in, in, in reading this correspondence that they had one eye to the, to the future, to, oh, this will be read by many. And I think that if you guard against that idea as a writer, it's, you, don't, you don't write with a sense that you're writing into a future public. I think that's very important to think about anyway, that, that that you you don't write with a sort of half a half a thought that oh this letter is going to land up, you know, in the in the public domain. I think you can't do that. You mustn't do that. In a way, it relates to the question of uh, being aware while you're still alive of the friend's passing, right? Um, because they were obviously published afterwards. Um, so the knowledge of the eventual publicity of the letters is also the knowledge of one of the friends inevitably passing earlier, right? Um, which is a precondition to friendship according to Derrida, but it's also something that, um, yeah, I, that you cannot build you can't build a house on it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm Thomas. Um, I think um, just a couple of things on this. One, the relationship, the, the spectrum of public to private 
um, also could be mapped on in interesting ways to the question of what kind of friendship it is. What's the, what's the basis of it? And that's, as I imagine you might know this, Max, as we were talking about it, in, in the correspondence between Heidegger and, um, and Jaspers, they are talking about maybe making their conversation public. There's a whole exchange about will they make this public? Should they make it public? Would that be a different thing? And you can see that there's an unclarity about the kind of relationship they have that's reflected in the unclarity about whether this is public or private. And I think it's not just them. You can, you know, the, you're, the question of how much you trust the friend you're writing to, what that trust consists in, whether you're thinking about it as, and that, you know, f whether you're a well-known writer or whether you're someone who's sending an email inside of a community, uh, I think that question of public and private maps on in interesting ways to the question of what kind of friendship it is. If I may add one uh, dimension to this interesting uh, question is that, yes, we have writers who correspond here, all of, all of them, and uh, to look at it from the perspective of possibility, uh, what one can see in this bachmann Zelan correspondence, which one can also see in many other correspondences of writers, is the way in which the friend, the addressee, makes a particular kind of writing possible. And which also uh, makes us think maybe about the way in which writing can be regarded as a way of addressing just in general. Uh, so there's also those aspects. So I was told there was time for one more question um, and I leave it to the uh, student fellow to choose a person. Hi, it's not really a question, I'm sorry about this, but I wanted to just outline the role of friendship in getting these letters into publication because um, as someone close to Mary McCarthy after her death, long after her death, I tried to get a, another collection of her letters into print and nobody was interested and everybody said letters don't sell. So there you are. Uh, this Carol Brightman, a woman who Mary had, um, had consulted before she went to Vietnam because Carol had been there as an activist um, and who also had gone to Vassar, got a contract from Harcourt Brace to do, do this volume of the letters between Hannah Arndt and Mary McCarthy after Hannah Arndt died. And Mary had promised to work on them especially there are many, many, many uh, names and, and occurrences in there that needed to be footnoted. And she um, promised to work with Carol. They liked each other very much. And then Mary died. So Carol was left with the task with practically no money. And she worked in a little house up in Maine. I helped her a bit with some of the notations because I was in the city. And she put her life into it. And the book got published. Uh, and it got published because Mary McCarthy had a very close friend at Harcourt Brace, William Jovanovich, who had been foreign born and understood a lot about Hannah Arndt and Mary McCarthy. And he saw the book into publication. He gave it the proper publicity. And they were, without those two friends, you would not have this book. And you're acknowledged wonderfully in it, by the way. Was that it? <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for your um, welcoming way of, uh, of focused um, attention and for your questions. And um, what is the next step? Yes, we have another panel coming up. Please stay.
All right, hello everybody. Um, we're gonna start. We're gonna we're gonna get going with our last panel. Uh, certainly not least, and it's a, it's an appropriate panel to end with um, because we're going to be talking about three of Hannah Arendt's friendships. Uh, and before I start, let me just make one or two quick announcements. Um, uh, one is that um, we will announce the raffle winner at the end of the panel. Uh, there is artwork in Olin, uh, in the in Olin Atrium, and also in the Campus Center Atrium. And I want to thank Amy Trumpeter, who, um, if you've seen some of those puppets that are out there, uh, she's a puppeteer uh, who, who lives nearby and has done some great puppetry work about Hannah Arendt. And um, really excited that she brought her puppets by for this for this occasion, so thanks to Amy. I'm sorry? And she's with Red Wing Blackbird Theater, yes. So, um, and uh, her studio is, is wonderful. So, um, let me uh, get us going. Uh, this, in this last panel, as I said, we're going to be talking about three particular friends of, or, or yeah. Um, first of all, uh, we're going to hear from Alex Kane. Um, Alex uh, teaches ethics, political theory, and history of philosophy at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And so I want to thank her for flying 27 hours to be here with us today. She received her PhD from Monash University last this year, and I had the pleasure of being one of her PhD readers, and it was a wonderful dissertation on Hannah Arendt and friendship, on the ethical implications of notion of friendship and Hannah Arendt's work. So she's gonna to talk to us about some of her work on Hannah Arendt and friendship. Uh, then um, Barbara von Bechtelsheim is a scholar, author, and literary translator, teaches over at Yale, uh, much closer than Australia. Um, we'll be speaking about her new book, and which is a a biography of a pair, of a love pair, uh, Hannah Arendt and Heinrich Blucher. Uh, and then Marianne Detjan, who is uh, here for the year as a OSIN Mobility, is it OSIN Mobility? Uh, OSIN Scholar. Um, she teaches normally at Bard College Berlin, so we're colleagues. Um, she leads, um, and works for the scholarship program for displaced students, the refugees and displaced students at Barge Collin Berlin. She teaches migration history and global history. But she's actually gonna not be speaking about global history or migration history, except in the fact that she's gonna be talking about some migrants, uh, Hannah Arendt and her friendship with two of her friends from Germany who ended up here, uh, Helen Wolf and um, Lotte Kohler. So, um, Alex, you're up first. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Roger, for the introduction and for having me here. Um, it's, it's a complete pleasure to fly so far to be at a conference like this. Um, and I'm going to be speaking today, kind of elaborating a little bit on what Roger said um, in his introductory speech about a micro world um, in reference to uh, what Arendt says about Carl Jaspers and how he kind of um, created a micro world with his wife, Gertrude. Um, so, Hannah Arendt did ask her audience to consider uh, friendship as a little world or a micro world or a small world. She used various language, uh, language to explain this at least three times in her, over, across her lifetime. Uh, and today I want to show how thinking about a world, in, uh, about friendship in this way, can be productive for thinking uh, about how friendship can nourish both our private lives and how it can be kind of, um, uh, it, can, it can be indirectly helpful for our public lives. So it can really help us uh, practice on a smaller scale uh, public discourse. I also want to show how uh, this understanding of friendship can, depending on how you look at it, either violate or um, bridge the distinction that Hannah Arendt herself makes uh, between public and private life. 
So as Roger said yesterday, Arendt first discusses uh, friendship as a, a little world in uh, a, a lecture series that she gave in 1954. She also wrote a letter to Heidegger um, after her husband Heinrich died and uh, there she explains friendship again as a micro world. The third instance, and this is the one I really want to focus on because we can really dig a bit more deeply into this idea um, via this, this uh, instance of her discussion of a, a small world, um, occurs in a talk that she gave in honour of her uh, mentor, teacher and very, very close friend, Carl Jaspers. Uh, she says, and I quote, if two people do not succumb to the illusion that the ties binding them have made them one, they can create a world anew between them. Certainly for Jaspers, this mar his marriage has never been merely a private thing. It has proved that two people of different origins, Jasper's wife is Jewish, could create between them a world of their own. And from this world in miniature, he has learned as if from a model, so he kind of modelled his idea of, of public discourse on his, on his private relationship and very open communication with his wife. He, he, he learned what is essential for the whole realm of human affairs. Within this small world, he unfolded and practised his incomparable faculty for dialogue. The splendid precision of his way of listening, the constant readiness to give a candid account of himself, the patience to linger, and I really like this turn of phrase, the patience to linger, and that's something we haven't really talked so much about at this conference, just in terms of how friends linger over topics, uh, maybe come back to topics across their lifetime, um, and really spend time, make time to talk about uh, whatever it is that they find important and whatever it is that they like to talk about. Um, the patience to linger over a matter under discussion and above all the ability to lure, and again I, like, I really like this word as well, to lure um, what is otherwise passed over in silence into the area of discourse. So to really lure it, to really kind of pull it um, into uh, public to make it worth talking about. Thus, in speaking and listening, he succeeds in changing, widening, sharpening, or as Jaspers himself would beautifully put it, in illuminating, end quote. Those of us who are familiar with Arendt's uh, work, The Human Condition, will be aware that she usually used the term world uh, in association with public life. In the human condition, she writes that, quote, to live together in the world means essentially that a world of things is between those who have it in common. As a table is located between those who sit around it, the world, like every in-between, relates and separates men at the same time, end quote. So to think of friendship as a world, as a, a, as a small world, uh, is to acknowledge that friendship is a kind of public space. It is an in-between in which we appear, which we share in common, and which makes our appearance and dialogue with the other possible. In friendship, we speak and show who we are, and Arendt was very concerned with showing who we are, um, also in action. Uh, we put our names to our opinions. Friendship uh, as a public space is spacious. It allows for a distance between the friends such that they can appear to, uh, to one another and let themselves be seen and heard uh, by the friend. This is why Arendt thinks, contra uh, Montagna, that two people should not succumb, and this was in the quote, should not succumb to the illusion that they are one. They shouldn't, be, they shouldn't think that they're bound together and, and that there's no space and no distance there between them. They must instead maintain the world as a space, 
between them, and it is the ability to be both related and separated at the same time uh, that allows for disagreement in the friendship, and, and that's something that's come up, I think, over and over during this, con during this conference. We don't uh, really, uh, I don't know that we want to always agree with our friends. We really value that disagreement that comes with friendship. So, if friendship is a little world or a small world or a micro world, uh, then, you know, it's little, so it's, it's limited. Um, it's kind of a private public. Friendship, indeed, must be limited if it is to exist at all. We value friendships precisely because they're rare, because they deal with a particular person. You know, we, we value a particular person as our friend. Friendship, in other words, is necessarily exclusive. Friendship's based on trust, on loyalty, and it, it grows up over time. And this is something that Roger said as well in his introduction yesterday, that, um, that Arendt makes it very clear that there's no such thing as a two-week-long friendship. You really need time, again, to linger um, together uh, to build a friendship. Friendship needs promise, and this might be an explicit promise, but it also might be a tacit promise. It might be sort of a, an unspoken agreement between the friends uh, that you'll be there for your friend, that you'll be there with your friend rather than against your friend, even if you are actually having a disagreement or having an argument. Um, and friendship must also hold open the possibility for forgiveness because, of course, there is always the possibility that one of the friends will trespass on the other. Um, and this is something that Arendt also thinks is, is very common in, in action in the public world, more properly speaking. In other words, Arendt's understanding of friendship has both private and public elements. Now, depending on how you look at this, you could say that this violates the very strict dis distinction she makes in the human condition between public and private life. However, you could also say that actually when she talks about friendship, she's, she's offering kind of a bridge across that, across that divide. However, she does suggest that friendship, as, as a personal relationship, does, does not enter or, or I guess should not enter or can be dangerous in the public realm. She says that, quote, the directly personal relationship where one can speak of love exists, of course, to a certain extent in friendship. There, a person is addressed directly, independent of his relation to the world. Thus, people of the most div divergent organisations can still be personal friends. But if you confuse these things, if you bring love to the negotiating table, to put it bluntly, I find that fatal to politics. End quote. And I would remind you also of the quote that is on the uh, tote bags uh, for the conference, I love only my friends. Love promotes the kind of loyalty that discourages um, impartiality or, you know, maybe we can't be fully impartial, I think Arendt would think, um, but discourages uh, uh, the level of impartiality that we can at least aim towards. Friendship is, by definition, biased. While Arendt does not think that friendship in this, in this personal way is helpful in politics, she does think that friendship can indirectly, uh, that, that friendship indirectly readies the ground for, uh, for politics. In friendship, we first develop our abilities for respectful dialogue. If there is something that we can learn in friendship and carry into public life, it is the practice of respectful and meaningful and careful and slow um, and inconclusive dialogue. There is, there's so much more that I could say about, about friendship as a little world, um, and I think that this can be, as I said, I think this can be a very productive way for thinking um, through the issue of friendship. Um, and I, I, would, I guess I would also note that even though we've been here for two quite long days of talking about friendship, it's quite possible that lots of us will walk away still wondering, like, what is friendship? I'm, I'm still not really sure. Um, and we've seen lots of very diverse, um, very diverse uh, explanations or, or definitions of friendship 
uh, over, across the last two days. But there's a quote that I want to finish on, um, and it suggests kind of another line of inquiry that, that I don't really have time to go into, um, but that I think is very interesting. Um, and it's a quote from Mary McCarthy. So a little bit more Mary McCarthy today. Um, and Mary McCarthy wrote to Arendt uh, after having read Men in Dark Times, and Men in Dark Times is actually the uh, book that the, that, the Carl, that the quote in relation to Carl Jaspers comes from. Um, and after reading that book, Mary McCarthy wrote to uh, Hannah that, quote, this book is very maternal, Hannah. You have made me think a lot about the Germans and how you, they, are different from us. It's the only work of yours that I would call German, and this may have something to do with the role friendship plays in it. Workmanly friendship of, a, of apprentices starting out with their bundle on a pole and doing a piece of the road together. All this gave me much pleasure as well as surprise. I think it's just very interesting if we think about friendship as a world um, and in, in Arendt's work, friendship, uh, a world, more properly speaking, would be something that we work out to build. Um, if, we, if we take this notion of uh, workmanly friendship, it, it becomes very interesting to think about the little world of friendship that we make and create and work at. And I think friendship does have to be worked at. Thank you. My, my greatest pleasure to be here at the end of a fantastic conference. Closer, closer, okay. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank Roger uh, and Thomas Wild, Roger Berkowitz. You have been so extremely supportive and kind from early on when I, I embarked on this journey to explore the friendship, the love relationship, and the philosophical workshop between Hannah Arendt and Heinrich Blücher. Um, we've learned a lot about friendships. I think the two of them um, lived all aspects of a friendship. And since we want to be in dialogue, I'll take you briefly through the more than 30 years of a love relationship and a marriage. Um, here you see the two of them before they met, they met. Um, you see Hannah Arendt is very, she looks quite shy, big eyes, very looking out into the world, somewhat elegant. And he is a little more sloppy, sitting in a chair, thinking to himself, maybe he was reading a book or maybe not. They grew up in very different worlds, so they bring the differences into the relationship. She was born, as you know, into a Jewish family, grew up in a intellectually, culturally, very vibrant and stimulating environment. Whereas he grew up in Berlin, Kreuzberg, um, working class, her single mother. Um, he was drafted into World War I, couldn't even finish high school properly, even though he was at a boarding school, got an emergency high school diploma. Uh, he had to serve in World War II as a kind of journalist, broad, broadcaster. Uh, after the war, he kept working as a journalist and worked other odd jobs. But he um, tried to learn in particular. He went to the university in Berlin, today's Humboldt University, and attended lectures um, with Hans Delbrück. Um, so history, military history was one of his interests. Whereas um, Hannah, as you know, went to Heidelberg, uh, to, uh, to Marburg, to Heidelberg, got her PhD very early, um, uh, was a, an accomplished young philosopher, had written her a dissertation. Um, she was married to Günther Stern, who was also a, a young, accomplished philosopher, uh, Jewish, um, whereas uh, Blücher was 
very involved with the Communist Party, uh, an activist, and um, so you can tell there were very different times changed, 1933, um, she, uh, she decides immediately to get, become active, do something against the Nazis. She, she does research for the Zionist Federation of Germany, uh, the documentation, the papers uh, that she collects in her apartment were discovered by the Nazis. Uh, she is arrested after a week, released, and decides immediately she has to leave the country. Um, she and her mother go to Prague, from Prague to Geneva. Um, Martha Arendt stays in Geneva, and Hannah Arendt goes to Paris, where her husband has already arrived earlier. Heinrich Blücher um, notices that since he is married to a Jewish wife, Na Natasha Yefroykin is a Jewish woman who is also involved with the communists. Um, plus, he has a close friendship with uh, a Jewish artist, Robert Gilbert. So he decides to go to, uh, to Prague, from Prague to Paris, and this is where they meet. 1936. Uh, in the circle of Walter Benjamin, who was, as you know, also had to leave Berlin. And um, the, this is where the refugees meet and um, they fall in love. Uh, because there are not only the differences that I mentioned, they have quite a bit in common. Both of them grew up fatherless. Both of them are very interested in social matters. Uh, rather than individual psychological questions. Uh, they, both of them, more or less encourage, uh, later on encourage each other to appear in the public sphere. Both of them are refugees. They will be refugees for a second time very soon. They go through hell in, during the war times, internment camps, and they are both great in finding new friends and cultivating friendships. So they get married very soon after in January of 1940. So in here you see what love does to the two of them. They look quite different, don't you think? She looks very happy, she looks more adult, looking out into the world, quite elegant in Paris. And this is what she writes. I, it still seems hard to believe that I could get both true love in a sense of identity with myself. Finally, I understand what true happiness is. And he also looks pretty happy and more together, in my opinion. He's um, smiling a bit and looking in your eyes and um, wearing suit and tie. She calls him Monsieur, by the way. And after a while, he writes to her, endless are the possibilities of the understanding heart. And I like this quote because it defines what the glue in this relationship is. It's the heart and the mind. Understanding, understanding the world. Uh, I could elaborate but um, why this understanding heart is so important, but it implies risk taking on responsibility. So they both are, the, the Germans invade, France, uh, there are internment camps, the, the Germans are um, étranger indésirable, both Hannah and Heinrich are, are in an internment camp, they don't even know about each other, um, but very soon they finally, very soon, not so soon, but in May of 1941, they get out of France into Spain with the help of Varian Fry, this amazing young American who saved so many refugees, lives, and families. So Hannah Arendt, um, soon after they arrive, sends a telegram to her ex-husband, Günther Anders, at the time, Günther Anders, Günther Stern, and says, sind gerettet, saved. It, is, it sounds really euphemistic. They don't speak the language. They don't have a home, they don't have relatives where they could stay, they don't have money, they have $25 that they got uh, 
in Ellis Island, uh, they, she organized a little stipend, a monthly stipend, so they could pay the rent for a room or two rooms. They don't have a passport, they don't have a work permit. So think of that. They go through this situation together in very different ways, but they master the situation. And one of the ways in which they are able to do that is friendships. And um, um, we have talked about a lot of their friends, and uh, Hannah Arendt is uh, famous for hosting, hosting friends, hosting parties, in particular, famously, her New Year's party. In one of her letters, she writes, we had 60 people, in our, 60 guests in our, um, in our apartment. That was 370 Riverside Drive, so it, that was a larger apartment, finally. Um, and I'm quite exhausted. So she was really, she was cooking and making tea. And um, whenever, there's a lot of quotes in her uh, correspondences where she describes um, friends coming over. So here you see um, uh, upper left, Charlotte Berat, who was a friend, but also very, very conflictual friendship. Um, Helen Kurt Wolf, we'll hear about Helen Wolf uh, a little bit more. Mary McCarthy, you've already heard about her here at her typewriter, and she typed a lot for Hannah Arendt. She helped a lot. Um, here's uh, Randall Jarrell, who uh, was also a, a friend with whom Hannah Arendt worked quite a bit. Um, Karl Jaspers in the middle, we've heard about him quite a bit. What we haven't heard, as far as I know, that Karl Jaspers was a close, became a close friend to Blücher. And what Jaspers was more theoretically exploring what the university should be is what Heinrich Blücher put into practice at the New School and here at Bard College. And I've talked to a number of former students of his and here at Bard, and um, they think, think of Heinrich Blücher as a friend, a teacher who is also a friend. So that was very touching. And here on the uh, lower left, you see that friendship was not only talking, uh, friendship was also recharging batteries, enjoying their lives. Um, both Blücher and uh, Arendt love to go on vacations here in upstate New York, but also to the beach. Here you see Alfred Kazin with uh, his wife Anne and Hannah. Uh, Alfred Kazin has wonderful stories about how, they, how, how he enjoyed being with Heinrich Blücher and Hannah Arendt and how they were so eager to be in conversation. And when they were really getting into a conversation about poetry or philosophy, they would switch into speaking German. And the rest of most of their friends could only look at them. Um, so, I will very briefly, like, my observation is that despite the, the close friendship and him being her Socrates, they were quite different in the way in which they thought. She was the analytic mind, very systematic, where, while he was intuitive in his, you can read the transcripts uh, of his lectures and they are like, working by association. Uh, he was an activist. He was still a political activist in his mind. Uh, she was the political thinker. She became more and more political under the, with the inspiration of her husband. And he learned from her. Uh, there's in the correspondence, there's off and on, she explains to him in a friendly uh, way that things are a little more complicated than he thinks. So she was the author, she said, she said um, that teaching distracted her from writing, and yet as time went on, she gave lectures more and more and was teaching. Um, but they had sep separate turfs. She, was, she came to visit a Bard off and on, but he was a professor of philosophy here, and he must have loved his teaching, um, and he was also teaching regularly at the New School. Um, she was, in my opinion, very innovative, and all of her concepts are based on the experience of exile, nativity, appearance, freedom, all these terms. 
in the, in the background is the new beginning, creating, reinventing herself and standing up for herself. While he was eclectic and he learned a lot from Jaspers and from the great philosophers. And um, I'll move on. Well, origins of totalitarianism finds an equivalent in the terminology, and I think it just proves that despite the differences, they off and on got very close. His lecture series at the New School was Sources of Creative Power with the subtitle Origins of Human Principles. Um, and here you see the two of them in a very similar gesture. Uh, this is uh, Hannah at the New School and Heinrich in the Library of Bard College. And there they share the topics of freedom of thought, appearance in the public sphere, new beginnings, and language. Language was a big thing, but um, for her, speaking and writing in two languages opened more of the world to her. While he was not so good in learning a new language, and he kind of compensated in being a performance artist. Um, at least that's what I understand from what her, his former students told me, how he would conduct a class. Um, and here is, we've mentioned, that has been mentioned before that both of them are buried here at Bard College. Um, and you see on the left is his gravestone. He was an atheist, and yet he is buried in the Jewish tradition. Um, and she erected this bench next to the grave, and I, I hear that she would sit there off and on to continue the conversation with him. And uh, on the right, then, five years later, she was buried right next to him. And this quote has been uh, already mentioned before. Uh, it's quite moving and also somewhat disturbing that she uh, shares with Heidegger in particular that the micro world breaks away now for her. And um, it's, it's also quite moving that her uh, thought journal kind of breaks away. She kept a journal, a thinking journal, and it seems like after um, 1970, she, hard, she has only very banal entries where she's staying on a trip. Um, and that was after Heinrich's death, as if the, her inner community, her, her inner dialogue somewhat breaks away or changes after her partner in dialogue is no longer there. And one last item I'd like, I'd like to share with you. There is a brand new medallion at 370 Riverside Drive, Manhattan. And look at this, I mean, it saddens me. Look at this brand new beautiful uh, plaque for Hannah Arendt uh, where we don't find Heinrich Brücher. There will be a celebration tomorrow for Hannah Arendt for her birthday. Um, but Heinrich Brücher lived there. They shared a life in that apartment. Um, at least I could remind you. Thank you for, it, for your attention. Oops. That's a good point about Heinrich. Yeah, I have actually at Bard College Berlin um, been um, advocating for renaming it um, to Heinrich Blücher College with not much success. <laughs> So thank you so much, um, um, uh, Roger, for inviting me um, and including me in this conference. And thank you for everyone else who made possible um, this wonderful conference. It's an honor for me to, to, to be here. So while I speak, um, you can look at this picture. I found it um, in Helen Wolf's papers. It's been taken probably in the beginning of the 1970s, somewhere at a fancy place in New York, and you see Hannah Arendt at the left side, um, or cut in half, um, and Helen Wolf in the center back. Mm, two elderly ladies, Hannah more flamboyant, 
Helen more in, in conspicuous, in a group of merry male writers and literary critics, middle-aged white men, all of them. The only one that I can recognize in this group is um, W.H. Auden, and if anyone here in the audience could help me out identifying some of the other guys, um, I'd be very grateful, and also where this photo has been taken. Um, so the two ladies in there, Hannah and um, Helen, are friends, by that time good friends. Auden was also, to a certain degree, um, a, a friend to both of them. And there are probably other friendships going on. But the picture maybe illustrates the point that I want to make today, that there's not just friendship, there's always also society. And um, the society um, supports friendship, but also burdens it and um, loadens it. And, and it's always a specific, historically situated society that sets the conditions not for um, for thinking, not for Hannah Arendt's thoughts, so thoughts always go their own ways, but for how her thoughts and her judgments were able to enter the world materially, um, and at the, at, at the time in form of books and of articles. So it's a, about publishing in the broadest sense, and, and indeed um, what was said before, um, um, that how uh, that these correspondences of these people that they have been published it's by no sense self understood um, so but let me start with another woman who's not in this picture and she would probably not have been invited to this illustrious um, round Lotte Köhler Lotte Köhler as most of you know was one of the closest friends of Hannah Arendt and together with Ma uh, Mary McCarthy executor of her will and she had responsibility um, to decide what of Hannah Arendt's private correspondences would be published and when and how. And, um, and she also influenced, to a certain degree, our image of the micro-worlds and micro-world that, um, that Hannah Arendt um, fostered in interviews she gave and in, um, in the introductions to correspondences that she wrote. And there's one image of that micro-world um, that, that is famous as a tribe, um, a family, a close-knit circle with Hannah Arendt at the center, and then other friends who uh, were outside, uh, well, and then the tribe, and then other friends who were outside of the tribe or sometimes only um, um, momentarily part of it or for a time. Um, among the friends that Lotte Köhler explicitly considered not part of the tribe was um, the publisher Helen Wolf. Lotte Köhler coined for the relationship between Helen Wolf and Hannah Arendt the term respectful distance. And that term was taken up later by Ursula Lutz when she edited their correspondence. So who was Helen Wolf? She had a reputation on both sides of the Atlantic as a publisher of mainly European translated books in the US. She was born the same year as Arendt in 1906 in a German-Austrian family on the Balkans. In the years before the Nazi takeover, she was a secretary, a translator, the lover, and then the second wife of Kurt Wolf. For four years, she also had been a babysitter, um, but that was kept secret later. Um, and Kurt Wolf had been a famous publisher in the 1910s and 1920s. Together, they left Nazi Germany in 1933 and went to France, like Hannah Arendt. But very much unlike Hannah Arendt, they were not Jewish, and their experience of exile was fundamentally, uh, a fundamentally different one. Um, the recently published um, biography of Hannah Arendt by Thomas Meyer um, uh, yeah, tells that, that story very beautifully. So um, in Europe, the Wolves and Arendt therefore never met. They only met after they all arrived in New York in spring 1941. And in New York, the Wolves founded the publishing house Pantheon Books as a shoestring operation that soon became a fine address for European literature. In 1960, they resigned from Pantheon and then joined a much larger publishing house, Harcourt Brace, um, where they got their own imprint, a Helen and Kurt Wolf book, under Harcourt's dynamic and powerful president, William Jovanovich, Bill Jovanovich. Arendt, in the 1940s, had worked as an editor for Salman Schocken, and she wrote literary reviews. Almost all of them were on Pantheon books. 
Now the wolves and Arendt were now the wolves and Arendt were connected through an entire network of relations. And by 1948, um, they referred to each other as friends. In the 1950s, they collaborated on publishing projects. Publishing books of authors, so Hannah Arendt didn't only um, write, she wasn't only an author, she also was an editor. Um, on books that she cared deeply for by Benjamin, Jaspers and Heidegger. When Kurt Wolf died in 1963, Helen continued on her own in partnership with Bill Jovanovic and Arendt changed her publisher, so she left um, uh, Denver Lindley at Viking and um, went to, to, um, to Hogwarts Brace. Helen and Hannah were friends. They saw each other often and wrote each other many letters. Still in their published letters, there's this respectful distance. And only in 1972, 1973, they changed from the more formal Z to the intimate do. There are several reasons for the distance. One very interesting reason war, was her, um, Helen's um, ambiguous position as a non-Jewish and non-political emigrant. And it seems that only around 1970, Helen was able to clear up misunderstandings or uncertainties that Hannah might have had about her um, until then. What connected them on a personal level, especially, was that they recognized themselves in each other's devoted love for their often unfaithful husbands. Hannah wrote in a letter to Jaspers after Kurt Wolf's death, Kurt Wolf's death, I like her a lot. It is difficult for her to go on living. She loved the man very much and without any illusions. I have given her high credit. I have always given her high credit for that. So they sh th that's a very fundamental thing. Yeah? Love without illusion in a um, clearly gendered dedication to a common world that they both deeply and in a motherly way cared for. So, but I want now to focus on something else, um, on how this distance between them was co-determined by their acting at the interface between the private and the, publish, uh, the public in this publishing, by bringing into the world that the ideas and um, language that they cared for. And so we have to look at the constraints and the conditions and the constellations of their publishing at specific, specific historical moments. And this now is connected to a methodological problem because these constraints and conditions were of a kind that also shaped the primary sources. They affected the materials on which we um, now today base our nar narrations and interpretations. When Elizabeth Young Brühl published her first, uh, the first biography on Hannah Arendt in 1982, only six years after Hannah Arendt's death, it only mentioned Helen Wolf in half a sentence as the wife of Kurt Wolf, although she did say that they were part of the tribe. Lotte Köhler in that biography was also just mentioned briefly, and another friend of all three of them, of Lotte, Hannah, and Helen, was not mentioned at all, um, the young German writer Uwe Jonsson. Jonsson wrote a letter to Lotte Köhler um, that I found in Helen's papers that made a connection between an apparently self-chosen invisibility due to the discretion of Helen and uh, Lotte um, um, and historical truth. So, um, so, and discretion is really the key word here. Can we go to the, the quote in the... Yeah, I, I translated it um, into English and I don't have the German original, even though it would be much nicer. <laughs> One can overdo it with the understatement, I think, because Hannah will not have marked many people like you, um, you being Lotte Kühler, Sonder fiel noch tadel, which is an old-fashioned expression, without fault, without blemish. Such trust, I feel, is worth mentioning, both because of the person who gave it and the one to whom it applied. The same goes for Helen. Between Hannah and Helen, there was an interchange of words a kind of a kind unique in this century, such as will never occur again in the next. Discretion is nice, as good manners have it, only through the fault of this virtue, something is missing in this history of persons, something is missing. Uh, in so what is discretion? It's the art of making a specific distinction, a judgment, what is for the public eye and what um, should be kept private. Discretion is necessary for trusting each other, especially on vulnerable positions. 
but how the line between the spheres of the private and the public is being drawn is historically contingent, and the constraints and conditions change. So it's not modesty, but judgment, good judgment, um, that made Lotte and Helen want to stay in the background. And that judgment also affected which letters of their own correspondences became accessible to the public and which didn't. And interestingly, several letters of Helen Wolf to Hannah Arendt cannot be found in the Hannah Arendt papers. Um, they are in Helen Wolf's papers. The 1970s, when this gathering took place, can we go to the, to that, uh, to the picture again back? Yeah, thank you. Um, so these 1970s um, were not an easy time, both for Helen and for Hannah. Helen could share the difficulties that she had in the 1970s at Harcourt Brace as an elderly emigrant woman past the retirement age with only very, very few people. A lot of her experiences, convictions, and beliefs seemed at the time outdated. Hannah Arendt was the same age, also a widow, and she shared some of Helen's seemingly outdated experiences and convictions. And she knew the publishing world firsthand, not, as, not only as an author, but also as an editor, and as someone deeply invested in the fate of book, books. The publishing environment in the 1970s was shaped by two developments, um, very briefly, the, the commercialization of the book market and the so-called women's lib, um, the second wave of feminism, that at Harcourt Brace had very uh, paradox effects. Helen and Hannah together in the mid-1970s felt too old to take onto themselves a new edition of Heidegger's works that Hannah Arendt had wished for. But they, um, that they felt old doesn't mean that they didn't trust their own and each other's judgment. Hannah Arendt was, before she died, able to mediate between Bill Jovanovich and Helen Wolf. And it's to a large part, thanks to Hannah Arendt, that Helen Wolf was able to survive the 1970s at Harcourt Brace as a publisher and to continue her imprint for another 20 very successful uh, years until she died in 1994. So you see, they could rely on each other and what they told each other and wrote to each other, of course, had to be, had to be kept strictly confidential. And we can only understand the quality of their friendship um, through history, historicization and critical examination of the primary sources. Thank you. Thank you all three very much. It's really beautiful to bring the conference to a close on these, these reflections on Arendt and her friendship, which has sort of inspired the whole conference. I have some questions, but we don't have a lot of time, but if there are some questions in the audience, I'd also prioritize those over mine if people have them. Hello, thank you very much. I just, um, something I've always wondered about and partly came to this conference to find out uh, is that I happen to know Lotte Kohler for, you know, for uh, since about the year 2000 until her death. and. And she was such an interesting woman. Um, and she was intensely interested herself in uh, many things, including psychoanalysis. And uh, when I asked her uh, what was Hannah Arendt's relationship to the inner world, because the Upper West Side was just a very old, you know, you know <laughs> teeming, teeming with every kind of therapy and exploration. And then I wondered about Hannah Arendt's relationship to the Michelish work, the Unfähigkeit zu trauen, the the whole the whole not 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 just creep. Well, is there anything that you could speak to about that aspect of Hannah's thought? Well, as far as I know, that uh, she was deeply suspicious of psychoanalysis. She didn't like it at all, um, and she was also very suspicious of German memory culture. Um, and I think she was right. <laughs> Um, so this this guilt um, thing of the Germans um, um, that prevented them from taking responsibility. Um, there's a, a very very nice letter by Blücher to Arendt, if I rem remember correctly, where he rages <laughs> about that. Um, I, I 
I don't know of any, um, yeah, of any quote or so where she where she comments Mitchellich's work, um, but um, yeah, she she wanted she wanted responsibility. Yeah, she wants she and she wanted political judgment. She didn't want um, the Germans, yeah, um, cent uh, centering around their own guild and reconstructing their Volksgemeinschaft in this common guild. I'm so glad that Barbara von Bechtelsheim brought up Hannah Arendt's notion of natality. Uh, the ability of something new to enter the world. Um, and I wonder whether it's related to her, if any of you think this was related to her notion of eternity and Jasper's notion of immortality. Um, and I was struck recently uh, reading um, Jasper's The Atomic Bomb and the Future of Mankind, um, in which he talks and ends the final chapter, Fear and Confidence, uh, with this notion of the seriousness of immortality. And I saw a lot of influence, obviously, on Hannah Arendt's thinking on eternity, on thinking and action. Um, but I was struck with his words, um, let us not slander its beauty. And these notions seem perhaps connected. I'm interested in hearing whether you think they're connected. Natality or nativity, um, immortality, eternity, and love. Um, and it seems to me an interesting way to think about friendship in a kind of different way. I'm also thinking here of Giorgio Agamben's gorgeous essay, The Friend, and a little tiny book of three essays, What is the Contemporary, uh, in which uh, he tries to talk about the friend in terms of sensing and thinking together, which constitutes the very notion of consent. Great, thank you. Do any of you want to talk about natality, love, and immortality? Um, no? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Arendt also, of course, wrote quite a bit on immortality. Um, and for her, immortality is different from eternity. It's, uh, it's a worldly immortality, and it's the remembrance of things that deserve to be remembered. Um, and, uh, and, and so there is a kind of need for action and newness in order to make things that aren't going to be remembered. But, um, but yes, I think, I mean, one of the interesting things about Arendt and her friends is, I mean, as when you run the Hannah Arendt Center, you get emails every week from people said, I've just written the new thing that proves that Hannah Arendt was a Machiavellian. Or I, I've, you know, Hannah Arendt was a Jasper, Jaspers. Yeah, he, you know, everything came from Jaspers. Everything came from Heidegger. Every came, everything came from Kant. Um, and, and people are always trying to prove these things. Um, and you know, one of the things that's unique about Hannah Arendt is she was unique, and um, she, one of the, it's rare to be unique. Uh, it's, uh, she was um, someone who thought for herself and took from lots of people, but really was, was unique in the world, and that's a wonderful thing. I think I'll end with one, okay, go ahead. One, one brief remark as to natality. For her, that was not thinking about uh, the human human life or humanity in terms of against against mortality it was like turning things around. And I mean, her her notion definitely has to do with leaving everything behind. Western tradition had broken broken down her home home country everything. And to think of a, an individual human being in the world to be something new, to be someone new, and to create something unique. 
that that to her was, in in my opinion, the the very different from previous discu philosophical discussions. Thank you. Um, so maybe just one last question that I'll let all three of you comment on briefly because we're out of time. But all we've been talking about Hannah Arendt and her friendships, and Alex rightly talked about it as a micro world, and. A lot of what she writes about friendship, she says at one point, friendship is between two people. But especially at the panel this morning with um, Marissa and Esther, and there was this idea of a group. And you guys talked about a community and a tribe. And that's tribe is a, it's funny, I don't think tribe came up before to this, this panel. And the idea that Hannah Arendt was sort of the leader of this tribe is actually a very part of, and it wasn't, it hasn't been talked about. So. I guess I'd like to have you just each think a little bit about the relationship between friendship and tribe. And um, just briefly, if you can, um, and say like, what's their relation and how did they, what was the relation between tribe, what's the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the place of a tribe in Hannah Arendt's idea of friendship? Is this on? Yes. Um. Yeah, I would I would probably have to think about it a little bit more, but um, it does seem to get closer to a community, and it does seem to get um, she she does usually think uh, she does usually talk about friendship as if it's just between two people, as you say. Um, it, it it gets a little bit more complicated when you add quite a few people to that and. Um, you know, we we did see that she held together a, a large group of people and and kept them coming back time after time and and entertained them and had um, uh, New Year's Eve parties and and all of these sorts of things. Um, so she was very good at holding people together like that. Um, but it 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 starts to constitute something a bit closer to a community, perhaps. And it I would say while both um, there can be a lot of joy in being in a group like that um, at the same time um, it too you know it, the more people that are in in a group I suppose the more likely it is that some kind of trans trans um, trespassing on the friend could occur um, yeah and and I, I I think it would be it's actually interesting to think about um, the tribe as well as also constituting lots of other little friendships so um, there would have been people within that group who had closer friendships with some in the group than with others. Um, so it, I think it just becomes quite complex. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah, I wonder whether Hannah Arendt herself ever used the term, um, did she? Um, so I think she did, yeah. yeah? I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think at least the way that Lotte Köhler used it when I interviewed her in 2011, it also also had some notions of like the negative feelings that Jana mentioned, you know, um, um, envy or, or disappointment or that she maybe was not as close to Hannah Arendt anymore at, in the last years or maybe not, I don't know, yeah, but um, it wasn't only positive. And then the second very interesting um, thing is that tribe. So she she didn't really have a family, um, or she had relatives in Israel, but she didn't have the f a family in the sense that Helen Wolf had a family. Helen Wolf had a large family that um, um, across the Atlantic and across the abyss um, of what happened between 1933 and 44, 45, um, hold together. Hannah Arendt didn't have that, but then she they used this fam family term tribe, and also they called called it family, um, to and not to compensate, but to maybe ironic ironically refer to it. Um, yeah, but what to make out of it, I don't know. To me, this. To me, this term, tribe or family, implies that they created a space. I think this concept of space um, was important for both of them. Lucia Arendt 
create a space for exploration. And also I would say that the tribe, family, whatever you want to call it, was selective. Either you belonged or you didn't belong. And the common denominator was intellectuals who didn't stop thinking and asking questions. I would also just add that it was it was a very unique um, time for them. So not all, but many of the members of the tribe were um, people who'd been displaced. And, you know, so this was a real home for them, um, which might have been what kept them coming back. And she also was friends with her cleaning lady. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't remember her name, but she had a personal, strong, emotional relationship to her. And when she was sick, she would ask Lotte to um, to also forward news to to that lady. Yeah. Well, thank you three very much, uh, Alex, Marianne, and Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we're 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 the uh, we're going to have a reception. Before we do, uh, we have. Uh, a few, we, some people joined the raffle for this. I actually want, love this, this piece of art. Um, I'll just read it, because it's, it's, it's two quotes, or three quotes from Hannah Arendt, but I think they're quotes that we all enjoy hearing. The first on the red is, the most striking difference between ancient and modern sophists is that the ancients were satisfied with a passing victory of their argument at the expense of truth whereas the moderns want a more lasting victory at the, expense of, at the expense of reality. And then here in the gold, I think, racism may indeed carry out the doom of Western world, and for that matter, of the whole of civilization. And then in the green, before mass leaders seize the power to fit reality to their lies, their propaganda is marked by its extreme contempt for facts as such, for in their opinion, fact depends entirely on the power of a man who can fabricate it and by Julia Chesko. So, um, do you want to pick? Why don't you pick? You pick. Yeah. Yeah. Where the winner of this piece of art, who is it? Oh, one of my students, Mia Tan Tanizaki. Is she here? Is Mia here? No? Did she leave? Okay, well, Mia gets it, so congratulations to Mia. That's great. Um, so there's, just so you know, there's a couple ways. Uh, those of you who are new to the center, there's a couple ways to continue the conversation. Uh, the vir virtual reading group meets every Friday, usually, at 1 o'clock, and we'd love you to join us. Uh, there's also a new podcast, Reading Hannah Arendt, and uh, we'd love you to subscribe to that and, uh, and listen. And then there's dialogue groups where you can talk about Hannah Arendt in smaller groups. All of that is available on our website, uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. The shuttle leaves to go to Hessel at 4.30, which is past now, so it'll leave very soon. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next year. <laughs> Lastly, you're going to be getting a survey in your email box, and we really would appreciate it if you fill it out. So thanks very much.